Hello, hello, London. <laughs> so, big welcome to Visionaries Unplugged. Uh, while Sebastian's mic is loading, uh, thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much for making all the way from European hubs like Berlin, Stockholm, Helsinki, and even from the US, from California, from New York, from India, to be with us here today. So it, it really means a lot to us. And we are incredibly excited that we have a great group of One, two, digital three. pioneers, family entrepreneurs, friends, VCs, who are sharing some very personal moments of their entrepreneurial journeys today. And doesn't, the beauty is doesn't work? all of them, <laughs> hey, there we go. All of them have <laughs> been uh, a part of visionaries. So basically, um, they are either portfolio company founders, or they are investors of ours, or they are friends. So hopefully, it also gives you a little more insight into how we work at Visionaries. So gratefully, your mic is now working, but I took it your is. part. So <laughs> I'm just going to continue. Yeah, just so imagine I said what Rob already said. <laughs> <laughs> so why London? For us, it's a very clear commitment to this great tech ecosystem. We have half of our team based in London. We have many of our portfolio founders here. We are, uh, I went to university close by, so it just felt right to do it in London this year. And, and thanks for joining us here. So we wanted to give it the theme, disrupting to endure this, this year. Why do we think enduring is so important? If we look back into the last four years, we felt that the market has been too fast, too momentum driven, too short term focused. VC funds got bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's just our ecosystem perspective. I'm not speaking about society, a war that is close by, people discussing changing world orders. And we have seen quite a healthy correction in our tech markets during the last 12 months. And we're seeing a much more healthy regime uh, in our market. And we could, of course, continue this whole afternoon discussing recession, discussing rising interest rates, energy prices. But why do we think all those discussions do not really bring us forward? Because Great entrepreneurs build great companies totally independent of cycles. If we look at Mark, he has founded Salesforce in 1999, just before the new economy bubble. And he's built the globally leading enterprise software company now with more than 200 billion in market cap. And we're excited to listen to his story later with our good friend, Harry. So Michael Moritz has been investing in some of the most game-changing companies of our time that went through many ups and downs like Google, Yahoo, PayPal, LinkedIn, and many more. And he's also built some of the most enduring and successful venture capital firms of our time since the late 1980s, uh, since he has been leading it. We have Sunil Mittal, who started in the late 1970s with only $150 to build a business, which is today the largest telco in India called Bharti Airtel, with more than 60 billion market cap. And we're going to listen to the story speaking with his son today. We have Daniel who started UiPath in 2005, right before the big financial crisis. UiPath is today the biggest automation company globally. It had a massively successful IPO in 2021 with a 30 billion cap. Nate, I'm super looking forward to speaking to him later today because Airbnb is such a great example. It was started in 2008 during the recession, during the financial crisis. And if that wasn't enough, it had to go through the biggest pandemic of our time through COVID, where basically the travel market went to zero. But here we are today. Airbnb is the leading global travel company with a 100 billion market cap and an incredible story. We have Ilkay with us today, who founded Supercell in 2010 and built the leading global mobile gaming company. It was Europe's first decacorn, so we didn't know that this kind of word was existing until then. And the company has since then year over year thriving. His very good friend, Miki, who founded Vault, one of the most difficult industries to build a profitable company, but he was able to do it. And we have Andre, who started in the small city of Perm that many of us didn't know before we heard about the story of uh, Andre and Miro, and has built it into the leading global visualization platform. And I could now continue for ages, but there are so many companies that have been built during the biggest recessions. And it's just great entrepreneurs build great companies independent of cycles. If you look at the Fortune 500 companies, half of them were actually built during a crisis. 
And what does all this teach us? That entrepreneurs, those entrepreneurs have really built to endure. And we want to make the whole theme today about going back to first principles, going back to building to endure, and going back to investing to endure. Cool, the mic works. So uh, obviously that wasn't a crisis, um, since we're talking about crises today. Um, actually, a crisis that can also be great news for founders. Um, you know, Churchill supposedly said, never miss a good crisis. And I think that's very true for one very particular kind of human being, whereas you know, regular human, whenever there's a fire, they actually run away from it. Then there are these particular human beings, founders, who actually run towards it. And the more heat, the more opportunity. So with that spirit, when we take a look at today's news, you know, on the, on the left side, where it's bright red, lots of adversity, lots of bad news, there are wars raging, um, high inflation rates, there's a climate crisis, there was a pandemic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But actually, you could really flip this upside down. You could look at this completely differently and actually turn adversity into advantage. And when we, for example, take a look at Torsten's company over there, um, you know, Torsten built, is in the process of building Helsing. Just one week ago, exactly seven days ago, announced that uh, they raised another round of financing, now turning Unicorn, for a defense company. So something that when you started the company in, in 21, nobody was really interested in. But now, with a Ukraine war, obviously that has gained so much more importance. And there are countless examples like that, not just the ones that Rob mentioned, but a Niels who uh, built a unicorn, which is now a unicorn, uh, in the green hydrogen space, but he got started 13 years ago. We'll also have him with us today. So this is one of those overnight successes that actually took 13 years to build. And that is also true for somebody like David, who's also going to be here today. He originally, 20 years ago, built a gaming engine company, um, which is now well a massively successful company, but then he transitioned into climate. And to us, what that means is the first principle approach that Rob mentioned, really diving deep into what's actually meaningful, what actually solves a big problem, that endures over the course of time. That doesn't matter if there's a short-term crisis, um, but those businesses will probably endure or they could actually benefit from it. And um, if we switch actually from the founder point of view to the geopolitical point of view, when we think about Europe, and you know, unfortunately, Europe, in many cases, there's the US, there's China, and then Europe is a little side note in many conversations. But we actually think that's not true um, because actually we are right here, right now, today. This is one of those generational opportunities to actually build a new business model for Europe. And the answer actually lies right in entrepreneurship, rise lies right in our, in, in our ability to actually use a crisis and, and turn it around. And why is that? Why is Europe so special? What do we have that others don't have? So one, we do believe that this is the big era of B2B. You know, B2C innovation will probably hold true, but everything that can be digitized will be digitized. Um, and especially here in Europe, where we have those amazing family businesses, where we have such a great and long-lasting industrial heritage, this is where we can build businesses that go right into that opportunity. And secondly, we also have amazing research. You know, when you take a look at the UK, anywhere in Europe, there are amazing research universities, amazing research institutions. We're probably not amazing yet at commercializing those ideas and those innovations. But if we can do that, then that really, uh, that's a new paradigm for Europe. And we're also very happy that today, with Nicholas being here, who's one of the big supporters of the European tech ecosystem, every year uh, with Atomico, they're publishing the, the State of European Tech Report. So very happy that we'll talk about that with Nicholas today. And 
yeah, find out how we, as Europe and as founders, how we can actually turn adversity into advantage. Perfect. And before we start in it, uh, what is Visionaries Club? I mean, most of you guys know us, but uh, for those of you who don't know us, so we're um, around 600 million under management, but we're really trying to stay small. So we love to stay as small as possible uh, as a venture capital fund, and we're investing out of a seed fund. That's our nature. We are all former entrepreneurs, so we just love you know, the, the hustling at the early stages and being co-entrepreneurs to the founders that we back. We have this, what we call early growth micro fund, where we just want to be supporting founders together in a setup with a great lead fund to basically bring our entrepreneurial DNA into those companies. And we have the Tomorrow Fund that Sebastian just spoke about, backing frontier technologies, but more as a trigger point in the very beginnings, pulling our network of very strong family entrepreneurs who are in deep tech uh, into those companies. We think overall the importance of money actually, we think it has decreased in venture capital and being former entrepreneurs, you know, any touch point you have with an investor beyond the money should be a 10 out of 10 experience. And we think that net network and access that you can provide is the most important currency that you can really bring into a new company with a founder. And what makes us a little different compared to other VCs is that we only took on board very successful entrepreneurs as our investors. So on the one hand side, we have 30 unicorn founders like the founders of Miro, UiPath, Flixbus, HelloFresh. So people who've built amazing digital companies and gone through the whole journey from seed, series A, B, back up successes, IPOs, some of them. So that's the one part. The other part is that we have 25 family entrepreneurs as our investors, and it's always the private people behind those companies that back us, like Marcus Swarovski in the consumer space, or we're speaking with Shravin uh, Mita later, who together with his father is a great supporter of visionaries. And you can see a few more of our entrepreneur investors on this slide. So the whole idea when building visionaries was to unite the smartest and the most diverse entrepreneurs as investors in our fund, because we think this very authentic experience is what really brings the best support into the companies that we back. And we think it needs the old economy as well. We can't be just in our digital bubble, starting companies with digital scale-up customers. We have to sell to the old economy. We need to digitize that as well, and that's the ingredient that we bring in. And we're very happy and grateful that we have been able to team with an amazing uh, batch of companies already. Many of them have also turned now investors back in visionaries, but that's, I guess, the circle of life. And very much looking forward to hearing from many of them later on today. And yeah, so for us as a team, um, it's an honor that you're here. And this is not the entire team. <laughs> picture was taken a long time ago. Um, so from the 18 of us, a big, big welcome to Unplugged. We know that you know, your time is also valuable. We will try to, um, to, to, to use your time very wisely. Obviously, we're not event organizers. So judging from mic issues, etc., there will probably be other occasions like that. So please bear with us. We are only a venture capital fund, so we actually don't really know how to do these things. Um, so from all of us, a big welcome. Um, we also wanted to say a big thank you to um, two partners of ours. Westbury is our beloved portfolio reporting tool, and Taylor Wessing is our uh, lawyer of choice, actually, for any transaction that we do. So um, we yeah, are very grateful for their support. And now, before we get into that, Let's try to make this, uh, this sentence, calling a dream crazy is not an insult, it's a compliment. We'll try to uh, give that meaning today and try to show you what Visionaries is all about. So without further ado, and a big round of applause, Michael Moritz in conversation with Rob. <laughs> Thanks so much. Have fun. Hello, Michael. <laughs> Great to see you. You want to have the big one? or the? <laughs> I think that's more convenient. I can have a snooze here. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. You've been uh, one of the biggest shapers of global tech for almost four decades, having been an early investor in some of the most enduring companies that we have, such as Google, um, LinkedIn, PayPal, Stripe, so many that changed our daily lives. But you've also been a great entrepreneur. Yeah. Being, uh, right having led Sequoia Capital since the late 1980s uh, and building one of the most enduring and best performing venture capital firms globally. I think you're also a great artist. So when we had the last call, you were doing some painting in the background. Uh, 
And uh, we thought there's no better person to discuss about the craft and art of enduring than you. So thank you so much again for joining us. Well, it's nice of you to have me here. I'm delighted to. I'm not great at anything, so let me just <laughs> correct that. <laughs> so let's uh, look a little bit into the time, you know, <laughs> before you have been knighted by the Queen. Um, and, um, you know, when you were a boy in Wales, when you were 19 years old, what kind of guy would I have met? What, what drove you? What was your avocation back then? Well, it's a long, long time ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> many decades. Um, before the automobile. Uh, well, I think 17, 18, 19 year old boys really only have one thing on their mind. Uh, um, but other than that, um, I, I, I wasn't a particularly good student. I mean, I was okay, but I wasn't a distinguished student. I, uh, I, I wasn't very good at and I always wanted to play cricket. I always wanted to play uh, football, but um, I was never very good at any of that stuff. So uh, I was interested in uh, uh, writing and, uh, uh, um, you know, a devourer of newspapers and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, Probably, you know, just like a lot of other kids growing up in, uh, in Cardiff in South Wales. Uh, you know, when, when speaking about what drives some of your most successful founders, you, you once said, the germ of a breakthrough idea does not come from a business school. It comes from an avocation you have as a teenager. How, how do you start studying history in Oxford, then becoming a journalist, and then turning into VC, there, there must have been an avocation or something in you that, that led you to take this very unusual journey. Uh, I've never planned anything. I think uh, a lot of the founders, and you mentioned some of the companies that we have been fortunate enough to be investors in over the years. They, uh, the, the people who started those businesses, you mentioned Airbnb and Nate is, is here. I mean. Um, they had the germ of the idea, I think, while they were at Rhode Island School of Design, mm -hmm. and that propelled them into business. I didn't have an idea about much about, uh, of anything. I mean, Cardiff in the 1960s, early 1970s, wasn't exactly a hotbed of, uh, of technology, and I've never planned my life. I really have never planned my life. It's just I've followed my instincts, Mm -hmm. And one thing has led to another. I, I uh, um, you know, growing up in Cardiff, I, uh, I probably wouldn't have been able to say where California was on the map. And when I eventually moved to the United States, um, if somebody had talked about Silicon Valley, it was sort of premature to talk about Silicon Valley anyway. But I wouldn't have been able to pinpoint that on the map. It's mm. just been following the breadcrumbs of life that get strewn on the road along the way. Mm -hmm. Speaking a little bit about passion, when, when you get asked about your most favorite investment, you often say Sequoia. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that and which foundational step has been most critical in building such an enduring VC firm? Well, it, it's not just uh, venture, it's also... Uh, and importantly for me these days, it's Sequoia Heritage, uh, which is something that uh, we develop um, from the ground up as well. Um, and I think when most, most people look at a, uh, and ask the question about um, what's your favorite investment, which is a good and obvious question to ask, the most important uh, um, um, thing is, the entity from which you make the investments, because that is what allows you to be able to invest in whatever it is, Airbnb or Instacart or mm -hmm. Stripe, and without that, you don't have anything. So that's the real thing to focus on. Mm -hmm. And I understand it. If you're an entrepreneur and you've started a company and all investors are alike, you never think, quite understandably, about what is the business that the people who are investing in my company have built? Some haven't built businesses. They may be by themselves or just a two-man or three or two-person or three-person outfit. Um, others will have been more deliberate and developed something that, uh, that endures. But um, 
you know, for example, you know, the Sequoia Heritage Fund, which is um, you, you know about, and we started it in 2008, or came up with the idea in 2007. Well, we underwent an entrepreneur's journey there. Today, it looks large and it's successful and it invests around the world in, in mm -hmm. a variety of different things. But we started with a blank sheet of paper. Um, there were, well, at the beginning, it was one or two, three people. Uh, we didn't have any money. We had a reputation for other sorts of businesses. We went out and uh, talk to, we must have had a hundred fundraising meetings where everybody said no <laughs> around the world. We went all over the world. And that was 2008. I mean, when you had all the track records, Google, kind of everything from the... It didn't interest. matter. It was a people totally said, different business. People, people said, said, you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. You're straying too far. You don't have a track record, they, which was understandable. So we put our own money up yeah. to get it off the ground, but we couldn't raise a penny. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't raise a penny for, I mean, we had a few small investors at the beginning who were friends of ours, but nothing significant. And it took, oh, I, I would imagine four to five years before people began to understand what we're building. In the meantime, you go through the team building exercise and early mistakes and all the rest of it. Uh, um, and today, you know, obviously, it looks, uh, it, it's, it's very successful, you know, Airbnb started in about 2008, 2009 as well. Yeah. They went through all their travails. Mm -hmm. And in this particular business, which is one of several that, you know, we've developed, mm -hmm. um, it's a very similar story. It, it, and it's something that if you're an entrepreneur and you look at an investor, you never think about. Yeah. It's great to look at your entrepreneurial journey because if we look at venture capital in general since the 17th, even though... VCs invest in disruption. I think it has been maybe the least disruptive industry itself. And you have basically, out of Sequoia, you've built Sequoia Heritage, which is massively successful today. Global equities, the internationalization. How did you, did you make sure to reinvent yourself so often and stay on top of the ecosystem for, for such a long time where often well, we VC funds we, we, follow we the... We used to have, a, uh, in the days when people had business cards, um, on the back of it, um, uh, I got a, I persuaded everybody to write, we're only as good as our next investment. <laughs> and I've always felt that. I've always felt whatever I'm doing, we're only a day away, <laughs> day away from going out of business. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter. It's why I have never had those little IPO trinkets that you used to get or all those other um, bits of booty about uh, the successes of the past. I have never had them in the days when we had walls, never had them on the walls, never mm -hmm. had them on my desk. That's about yesterday. I remember Steve Jobs um, uh, telling me once he'd been to Hewlett Packard, uh, you know, it was a long time ago, and he'd gone into the lobby of Hewlett Packard and it had uh, all their old devices from the 1930s, the 40s, the 50s, mm -hmm. the 60s. And he said it was like walking into a museum. And he said he was never going to have that at that. <laughs> and I think you, you've got to look to the future. You've got to worry about what um, is going to disrupt you. Uh, you've got to carve your own path, but also be mindful of what others are going to do. Yeah. And you have to have a sense of where you want to be 20 years from now. Yeah. Speaking a little bit about company building, which is all about the people that you bring on board. You wrote a great book that you co-authored about, co -authored about Sir Alex Ferguson building Manchester United and about leading. When you were building your organizations, what did you look for when you hired new people? If we look at Roloff, Alfred, all those partners you brought on board who are today leading it, what, what were you looking for back then? Well, uh, the book that I wrote with Sir Alex um, when I showed the draft copy to the person who ran uh, communications for Sequoia, uh, the fellow said to me, well, I can't tell what you wrote and what Sir Alex wrote. And I said, you got the point. Because, um, first of all, it's very easy to be a ghostwriter, let me tell you. Because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Was that your own biography, actually, uh, that you put that into Alex Ferguson, kind of? So, that's how you uh, built yeah, so, that, so that was the issue. You know, people have been <laughs> after me to write a book about Silicon Valley or Sequoia. I didn't want to write another book about <laughs> Silicon Valley or 
Sequoia. I had no interest in doing that. But I was really interested in what were the distinctive characteristics of organizations that had won through, had been winners, consistent winners through all sorts of ups and downs and over multiple decades. And I looked mm -hmm. around in Silicon Valley thinking about, oh, what company can I look at in Silicon Valley? This is now, we wrote the book some eight, nine years ago. So maybe, maybe Intel, <laughs> maybe Apple, but you know, Apple had had a near death experience, but you went back 30 years, you couldn't find any. That's the sad and sorry truth of it. Um, and then I got interested, and then I'd always been interested in football. Mm -hmm. And so Alex, Sir Alex had, you know, coached this club for 26 years. And I want Which is and massive for soccer. Which like is the lifetime in Germany is on average is, one year. Which is extraordinary, where the lifetime of some of these coaches and the managers in the Premier League is measured in weeks. And um, so I was really interested in how this came about. And so to me, when people said, what's this book about leading and football and, and Manchester United are all about? I said, it's about Sequoia. Yeah. What is so special about it? So what is the key message that, that made Manchester United so successful? And what is kind of the actual key message that made Sequoia so successful in, in leading? I don't think it's very complicated. I think it's grit, persistence, tenacity, determination, mm -hmm. never refusing to give up, not tolerating low performers, insistence on team, very simple goals, mm -hmm. uh, and showing up for work every day, which in the venture business gives you a competitive advantage. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything we can also learn from Liverpool or Benchmark? A, a profound <laughs> competitive advantage. Uh. Well, th switching a little bit from uh, building Sequoia and so much more to backing some of the most epic founders of our generation. In your email signature, it says anything is possible. I think it's even trademarked. So uh, maybe you have a monopoly on this. But what, what does it mean? And you know, when you look into new founders, new entrepreneurs, what are you trying to look for, or what are things that, that get you excited about entrepreneurs on a people level? I, I think there are two things. One of which is, and it's hard for investors to do because investors aren't built this way congenitally, is for someone to open your eyes to something you didn't really understand mm -hmm. and give you an education. Number one. Number two, it's suspending disbelief for a little bit and saying to yourself, can I imagine if everything goes right? And right now, you, you know, in the moment, you're talking perhaps to two people who are still in their teens or in their very early 20s, and that's it. Can I imagine if everything goes right that together, somehow or other, we'll be in business 15 to 20 years from now. Those two things, that's it. People have a habit of complicating the venture business. Uh, for me, it's those two things. And you've worked with many of those very rare founders who've managed to build companies that sustain for 20, 25, 30 years, like Steve Jobs, Larry Page, Elon Musk, John and Patrick Collison, and Nate from Airbnb, who we also have later today. It's almost funny to read through this list because uh, it's such impressive people. Which personality that you've worked with, and I know it's not an easy question to answer, has impressed you the most and, and why? I'm, I'm not going to do that. I, as soon as I do that, <laughs> I irritate too many people. <laughs> okay, then... Uh, I'll try to ask it in another way. Um, You'll get the same answer. I'll, uh, <laughs> let, let me try one or two times. You can come from the left, uh, you can come from the right. <laughs> what does obsession mean to you, and do you have an example of obsession? <laughs> um, I think Nate is not I here yet. The, so the, the thing I always think about when uh, 
um, talking about uh, obsession. You know, you, uh, many decades ago, I was a journalist and I, I worked at Time magazine and I, I was working at Time in the very late 1970s and early 1980s. And um, this was at a time where, you know, major companies of today, Genentech was still private. And there was this little company in Seattle called Microsoft that was still private. You know, it was 1980 or so. I think the company was doing maybe, oh, maybe, $600,000, a million dollars a year in business, those numbers being bigger then than they obviously, uh, than they are today. And I went up there to do a story about uh, Bill Gates and Microsoft. And we were, we were driving, he drove me to, we were going back to the airport, he drove me to the airport, we were in his car, this was back before he had retinues of um, a phalanx of security and helicopters flying overhead and all the rest of this stuff. But he was driving this, um, this Mercedes and um, there was a hole in the dashboard. And I said, Bill, so, so what happened? Did, you get, did your radio get ripped off? He said, no, no, I took it out. <laughs> I said, why did you take it out? Um, he said, well, it stopped me concentrating. What do you mean it stopped you concentrating? Well, whenever I was in the car, if I'm driving to the airport, or if I'm driving home, or if I'm driving to the office in the morning, and the radio's on, I'm not thinking about Microsoft. <laughs> I thought, that's obsession. Man, that's a pretty amazing example about obsession. I don't know how many people got an airport lift by Bill Gates or one of those category-defining people. Um, and, you know, the other real obsessive, I think, well, there are lots of obsessives. I think you've got to be an obsessive if you start and run a company uh, and caring about everything, caring about the details. I mean, obviously, one of the great aesthetic obsessives of all time was Steve Jobs. Yeah. Steve Jobs is a good example because he did this Stanford commencement speech where he said, follow what you love, follow your passion, follow what you love doing. What do you think separates passion from obsession, or why is obsession so Well, I think they're probably closely connected. But I think most yeah. people in life, unless you're an entrepreneur who's got a particular idea about building something, obsessives tend to be people who discover something very early on. Maybe they're very good at math. Maybe they have a gift with a crayon when they're in the... Maybe they pluck some strings and... That's led them to a lifelong mm -hmm. evocation behind a, com uh, a canvas or, yeah. or playing a musical instrument. I think most of the rest of us struggle to find that early identity. Uh, what does storytelling mean to you and why do you think it's so important with founders? Keith, actually, uh, the CEO of Sequoia Heritage, mentioned to me that when you interviewed him, you were just looking for kind of how good he is at selling. It's something that stuck with him, that he's trying to be good at storytelling, at, at selling, and trying to invest in people and find people who are able to communicate the mission and the vision that they have. Why do you think it's so important? I, uh, I, look, if I was uh, a dean of a, a business school, the most important class would be a storytelling class. Uh, it wouldn't be accountancy 101 or all of this other stuff. And... Um, I think it's, it's vital uh, if you're um, building a business because think about what you have to do. You have to convince the world. Well, first of all, you've got to tell the story to yourself to make sure that you want to go to the end of the story and it's not a frigging nightmare. And, but more importantly, you've got to convince the rest of the world to come and believe your story. Mm. You've got to convince a co-founder or co-founders. You've got to convince the early employees or engineers that you want to bring on to your team to believe that the story that you're telling them is actually possible. And then when you're in front of customers or investors, it's a similar thing. And being able to do that in a convincing manner that is genuine, mm -hmm. that you believe in, will gradually uh, bring people along. But I don't think there's any great company that doesn't have that sort of, um, um, you know, scaffolding 
um, in its overall evolution. I just mm. don't think so. Yeah. I think great insights on obsession, on storytelling things. I think that that if, if we look at founders, uh, there's a difference if you have a 25-year horizon, if you have a passion since childhood, if you have this dedication to detail to just make something happen that, that excites you versus just being at business school, thinking about the next idea and trying to, to execute on it. Thank you so much for these learnings. If we look a little bit at global tech, since you were a journalist, you are a journalist, maybe now even more again, if, if you had to write a headline about the state of global tech, what what would it be? Worlds apart, um, two, two, two empires, <laughs> right? Um, two empires invent their futures, <laughs> and um, you know, obviously, the, the the analogy is, the comparison is obvious, um, but. Um, Look, I, I think the opportunities today are better than they've ever been. Mm. The menu of investing is longer. Look, when I joined Sequoia, we had every time a business plan, this was in the days when people dropped off the business plan and it was typewritten or it came in an envelope, it was pretty much a bell rang in the office every time we got a business plan. It was, it was fairly rare because the investment menu was so limited. Yeah. And uh, it was just in the Bay Area, basically. There was some uh, business in business uh, in, your, in, uh, in Boston, around Boston, but very little elsewhere. The menu was so limited to semiconductors, hardware, little bits of software, but nothing more. Price of computing, obviously, was very high. And what's happened over the years, and this is why I think people in the venture business generally have been very successful, is that as the price of computing has come down and with the evolution of different platforms, whether it's the personal computer or the smartphone or mm -hmm. now you know, the distributed net absolutely everywhere, the number of places that can get infused with technology has just gone like that. And the result is um, a profusion of investments mm -hmm. into sectors doesn't matter what it is. Could be hospitality, could be media, could be entertainment, could be finance, could be a whole raft of things that were never on the menu in the 1980s. And that menu is only expanding. So whether you're uh, in Asia, whether you're in, in the US or in Europe, mm -hmm. yes, the geography in which you're located, the, the leaders of it may have different agendas from what they perceive as their competitors in the world but your investment menu as an entrepreneur is bigger than you've mm. ever had. Yeah. What still keeps you hungry? Because you have had so many successes in life over such a long time, and you always kept reinventing not only yourself as a person, the companies that you were building. What, what is the core that drives you? What, what keeps you hungry to... To achieve well, I, I, th I think it's curiosity. I'm also in the fortune, really fortunate place of being able to go back to school. <laughs> and that doesn't usually happen to somebody of my vintage because, you know, I, I'm now pretty involved with Sequoia Heritage. It opens up a world of invest. I know very little about the world of investments. I know a little bit about the stuff that we've done over the last 30 or 40 years. But in the greater scheme of the world of investments, I have had a very cloistered life. So now I'm back um, at school uh, with some of the best investors in the world at what they do, and I'm getting educated in a whole bunch of things I'd never thought about, never contemplated, never imagined. So actually, it's pretty darned interesting. And then there are a bunch of sort of extramural interests. Uh, I've started a media business uh, with a buddy, X Stripe guy, mm -hmm. um, in in San Francisco, which is an effort to talk about anything is uh, possible, to do the impossible, and demonstrate that you can have a thriving, profitable uh, local media business, oh. and and a variety of things like that. But Sequoia Heritage is my uh, main focus in life. Speaking about Sequoia Heritage and what's next for you and kind of the 
investment menu, it's, it's great to see how it's increasing from just digital venture capital to basically now anything that you want to do that could be within the scope of heritage, whether it's tech, whether it's real estate. We've read about this great project building a new city in Solano County, uh, <laughs> 50 miles from San Francisco. Um, it sounds pretty visionary. It sounds a little bit too exciting. Can you speak about it, or is it something... Uh, well, I, I look, the very good and I'm not trying to ask the question no, in a fine. different way, um, <laughs> promise. So I, I was somewhat astonished. Well, I was astonished by two things, one of which is that we've been able to keep it quiet for six years. <laughs> and the second thing was the amount of publicity it got when the New York Times, bless their clever little hearts, got wind of the story. And um, I think the intentions are... Um, uh, very clear, Jan Sramic, the, uh, who's the ring, uh, who's actually orchestrated all of this and is a European who relocated to, uh, Eastern European who relocated to Silicon Valley, has been very clear that we want to do what's right um, uh, for the community there that brings prosperity to the community that will be mindful of all the stakeholders, but you know, mm. the number one problem facing California yeah. is housing. And this is very close to San Francisco. Uh, and with any luck, um, I realize that there are skeptics and, um, and, and cynics, but I think eventually actions will speak louder than words. And when people understand where we're heading, uh, people will, uh, people certainly in that area will come to believe that it's one of the very best things that ever happened to them. Mm -hmm. I love that vision and uh, I'll be very curious to follow that. And I think it's interesting, you know, how you're taking things just from the digital ecosystem to any entrepreneurial investments or endeavors. It's something we always get fascinated by our old economy entrepreneurs. Many of our investors have built companies fully bootstrapped organically, so they're maybe a thousand ways to be a great entrepreneur and a thousand business ways to build something. Throughout this whole journey, has there been one lesson you really, really had to learn the hard way? Well, it's true today. I, I mean, I didn't realize it as much 40, 50 years ago, but I certainly do today. And this isn't an attempt at false modesty or anything. It's about how little I know about stuff. And um, I think uh, that would have served me well a long time ago as well. Uh, as well. But that, that's the lesson that I, I take away more than anything. Thank you. If you allow me one last question, since we have so many founders here, entrepreneurs, but also VC entrepreneurs, um, which one piece of advice would you give a 30-year-old in Europe starting a company for you the journey. You waited too long. You're 10 years late. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Michael Moritz, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Rob and Sir Michael Moritz. What a treat for all of us to be able to listen to that conversation. Uh, it's my pleasure to now uh, uh, introduce to you one of the most accomplished and fascinating founders in Europe. Torsten Ryle is co-founder and co-CEO of Helsing, the largest defense unicorn in Europe. And if you guys read the news, they raised one of the largest rounds last, uh, last week of 200 million, which is the largest um, record for Europe. Torsten was, co -fa was founder of Natural Motion, the video game development company, uh, which he spun off while researching for his PhD at Oxford, and, was, uh, and which he later sold uh, to Zynga. Torsten is uh, going to be chatting with Caroline Daniel, who is a journalist, political commentator, and partner at the Brunswick Group. She spent 17 years at the Financial Times, uh, including as the editor of the FT Weekend. Please include them. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so 
just a reference back to the FT. My first job at the FT was covering the first dot-com bubble back in 99. And I have to say the AI bubble feels pretty similar to that, but maybe with uh, fewer parties. Um, so there's obviously been a big commercial pile-on in terms of AI at the moment. Okay? Goldman Sachs last week forecast that 200 billion would be spent by 2025 on AI by different companies. And the seven largest AI companies in the world have been responsible for the main part of the rise in the stock market in the US. So there's a lot of hype, trillion dollar valuations, so you've still got a bit of a way to go, Torsten. Um, but it comes at a time of um, massive geopolitical change and the uh, challenges of running a business when you're thinking about the investment landscape changing hugely. Joe Biden has obviously just banned US um, investment in AI in China. So as, we, as you sort of sit here today and think about creating a defense AI company, let's take you back to 2021. And that was pretty prescient. It was a time when Ukraine obviously hadn't been invaded. It was a pretty challenging environment for defense. ESG funds were massively against it. Why did you decide to do that back then? 2021 felt like a completely different world. I have to say now, looking back, it's not that long ago that we started Helsing, just um, two and a half years ago. And at the time, obviously, the Ukraine war hadn't happened yet. But what was becoming clear was that there was this big shift in, uh, I guess, geopolitics. Um, it was clear that China's attitude was changing. Uh, it was clear that Russia's attitude already had changed. Um, I personally was quite worried and disappointed by, I guess, the West's um, reaction to the Crimea uh, annexation. Uh, obviously, there were some sanctions, but we didn't take it very, very seriously. That was one thing that happened. And the other um, thing in 2018 was the Google um, Project Maven walkout, um, with, uh, which some of you may remember, where a number of employees at Google decided they didn't want um, themselves and also Google to work with the Department of Defense in the US. And my thinking at the time, this was 2018, 19, and then 20, was if these engineers, some of the best engineers in the world, don't want to work on this problem, who actually will? Because the issue quite clearly has been, and I think that's becoming even clearer now, that defense is becoming a software problem. Um, but almost none of the software talent wanted to work in defense. And, and those were really the, um, the reasons behind it. And I honestly have to say, I think there was a degree of intellectual laziness um, on the part of people who wanted to live in free and open societies, be able to say what they want to say, be who they want to be, but they weren't prepared to protect those open societies. And uh, th that was the reason why we started Helsing in, in, in 21. At a different time, uh, we were able to attract investment in Europe, I think, I guess, against the odds, or at least against the advice that we got so, from people. So when you decided to start the company, what was the kind of landscape in terms of the VCs you started speaking to? How many people just said, no, we would ever touch defense, never touch AI in defense? Lots of kind of concerns about sort of robot drones and autonomy um, at the time. What was the kind of reaction you were getting? So, so we didn't bother to talk to uh, that many European VCs, to be honest, because it was clear. Um, Sorry for everyone in the room. <laughs> because I, it was clear, qu clear quite quickly that um, European VCs a, didn't have the conviction uh, to invest in defense at the time, and B, also had um, LP agreements that made it hard for them, or at least they weren't prepared to interpret them in such a way that allowed them to invest in a company that was going to protect democracies. And, um, and so we didn't bother um, too much with VCs. Uh, we, we raised our uh, seed round from uh, individuals, from different family offices, from different funds, and then we're very lucky um, uh, a few months later that we managed to raise just over 100 million euros from um, Daniel X Prima Materia um, Fund uh, that really kind of got the company started. So when you sat down with um, um, Shaq and with Daniel Ek, how did you pitch it to them? What was the kind of, um, and I know in that the, the Daniel's sort of fund is all about creating European moonshots. So why did it matter that it had to be a kind of a European backed company rather than um, sort of thinking about going to the US? It's the same pitch that we have with all of our employees, with everyone in the company, with, with the kind of all of us, all stakeholders, it's our, we feel a responsibility to help protect our democracies. And um, that includes creating capabilities that keeps our countries and societies secure um, and creates our border secure. So um, let's fast forward to Ukraine. Obviously, that investment looked pretty prescient. And obviously, last week, you're now the European, Europe's biggest uh, AI company at a valuation of 1.7 billion, which is pretty remarkable after just two and a half years. Um, 
you're doing work in Ukraine at the moment. Can you just give a sense of kind of what does defense AI mean? I mean, let's just kind of get away from the killer robots and killer drones. Can you just sort of unpack where the defense AI space is going and what new defense actually means yeah, and as an investment proposition? So, so fundamentally, there are two things. The, the, the first one is that, as I was saying, defense has become a software problem, like pretty much everything else in the civilian world. That's also true for defense. It's just that a lot of stakeholders in defense haven't quite realized it, including uh, some of the existing companies. And you can only really develop cutting edge software if you are software only or software first company. So the first thing to say is we are not a hardware company, we're a software company, that's all we do. And we try and um, hire um, and, and incentivize and nurture the, the best talent in the industry. So that's the first thing. Um, the, the second thing is that AI specifically as part of software is, is actually the thing that unlocks incredible capabilities in defense. And we're not really talking about AI on drones with computer vision. It actually goes much deeper and it goes much bigger. So we announced um, a couple of months ago that we've been selected to provide the electronic warfare capabilities for uh, the upgrade for the Eurofighter in Germany. Uh, so this is a big, uh, expensive asset. It's one of the most um, important capabilities uh, on the continent. And the capability gain that we are able to provide without going into too much detail by completely switching how it works, moving it towards deep learning and AI, is massive. We, we always talk about internally that the capability um, leap that we want to make is always at least 10x. And for us, this is not a marketing claim. This is, this is the benchmark that we want to hit. Otherwise, we won't bother getting involved. And so there are huge opportunities for AI uh, in the air, uh, Eurofighter being one example, um, uh, in the sea, on the sea, and subsurface as well, on land and everywhere else as well. And so when we think about AI, we think about AI to connect an AI-enabled big existing hardware and assets because they become much more powerful as a result. Because the reality is we actually don't have the money in our societies to spend a lot more money on existing or on new hardware and buying lots more of it. We actually have to make it much more capable with software. So if you think about this as a sort of um, emblematic company about European sovereign capabilities, um, what other areas does Europe need to sort of develop this kind of sovereign capabilities that we don't have right now. Just want to give a sense of the yeah, we have, we have it every, I mean, we have the sovereignty issue pretty much everywhere. We've, we've got it in semiconductors, clearly. Uh, we've got it in uh, energy. Uh, fusion is a good example. Um, we've got it uh, in quantum computing. Uh, we've got it in deep tech in general. Uh, but our view has been, and we had it in defense too, um, to be honest. Um, the US has a number of next generation defense companies. There's Andrew, uh, there's Shield AI, there's a, there's a bunch of others. But Europe had nothing. And in our conviction as founders, I should say we're three co-founders, was from the beginning that it's, there's no point in complaining about this and analyzing it. If you want to do something about it, and this is the great thing of being a founder, you can actually start a company. You can build a team, you can build technology, and you can raise money. And we've never believed that this kind of company is hard to build in Europe. It isn't. It's, it's, it's all doable. The money is there. The team is there. And actually, even the uh, acceptance in society is there. Um, and, and, and I guess my view is that's true for all the other areas where we have a sovereignty issue. It will be perfectly possible to build this company, a next generation semiconductor company, robotics company in Europe. But I'm just going to counter that with a few, uh, with a few sort of annoying facts. Um, so we're sitting in the UK, and last year um, Rishi Sunak announced plans to uh, invest 900 million in compute power in the UK because he realized that UK was falling behind. It comes at the time when um, Mar um, Amazon Web Services is just investing 30 billion in just one state in Virginia and its data centers. If you have a sort of asymmetry like that between both governments and the U US big tech companies, how can it be really realistic for founders to kind of compete with that, that mass? Well, we, when we started, um, we got a lot of pushback saying that, you know, you can start a company like this, an AI defense company in the US because there's a big market, there's a big budget, uh, it's one language, um, same politics, etc. Uh, it's impossible to do it in Europe because it's fragmented, um, the budgets are, are, are lower, um, you have to deal with different political stakeholders in uh, every single country that you're in. And the answer is, who cares, right? You still can build a company, you have to deal with it differently. It actually brings with it advantages as well because we have probably more direct access to the senior stakeholders in Europe compared to maybe our US equivalents. So you can turn some of these disadvantages into advantages. And so I think it's good, for example, that um, the UK is spending um, you know, the 900 million on compute. I think it will be helpful. But it's also true that founders in this space, and in particular determined founders, will be able to build companies without that, and will be able to build unicorns and decacorns without that. 
So I'm just going to, not that I want to be gloomy about Europe, I love Europe, obviously, um, even if um, the UK government didn't love Europe quite as much as me. Um, if you look at um, the recent note came out this morning, in fact, um, from uh, Charlie Muirhead at COGEX, and he noted that investors have spent 18 billion on generative AI since 2019, and that European startups have just got 800 million of that, which is about 5%. So what's still not happening in Europe? How can we explain that why there's still this divide? It's all down to founders. Um, so there clearly haven't been enough founders being aggressive enough to build this kind of company. It's not down to the environment. It's not down to lack of funding. It's not down to political support. It's just founders. So what are they not doing then? Not uh, being ambitious, are they not being ambitious enough? I, I don't think so. I think, I think founders in general in Europe can be much more ambitious. I think we have all the skills that we need. We have all the talent that we need. There is enough money in Europe as well, including enough growth capital. Uh, I think currently it's lack of ambition. And, and what I'm hoping is that there's going to be a number of um, deep tech companies in the next few years that actually show this is the benchmark, this is what we can achieve in Europe, and, and, and we can compete globally. I, I, I don't think there's anything that holds us back. So just to sort of looking at the sort of regulatory space, which obviously there's a huge obsession in AI around responsible AI and ethics. It's pretty challenging the defense space to be thinking about applying AI you know, on the battlefield. How do you square that and think through the ethics of AI in your own organization? So we, we think a lot about ethics. Um, ethics has been part of the DNA of the company from the beginning. Um, we um, work together um, with our team on uh, the, our own regulation. How do we think about who we make? our technology available to, how do we deal with edge cases, how do we uh, make this as formalized as possible, but also how do we think about um, autonomy, about humans in the loop, um, about edge cases around that too. Um, and it's been extremely helpful to do this um, with, together with our um, staff. So we have workshops, we just had one a, a couple of weeks ago um, where we um, stress tested a particular set of regulations that we've built up internally. And the reality is that we do need to regulate the space of AI in general and also um, AI for defense. And there are obviously some attempts already. NATO um, has some. The EU has the uh, EU AI Act, which obviously doesn't um, affect defense yet. But the reality is also that the companies that are closest to this are probably the ones that are best placed to help um, create that regulation. Because you don't want to overregulate in such a way that you cover all kinds of things that are in practice irrelevant. Um, but you also want to make sure that you do cover those things that are relevant. And so one example is I think there's much too little talked about about what does it actually mean to have a human in the loop. Almost everyone has agreed that you want to have a human in the loop for AI-based systems. But what we're finding is if you just have a human in the loop um, and the human just ends up accepting everything the AI suggests, um, decisions uh, that the AI suggests, uh, it's not particularly effective. Um, at the same time, if a human feels overwhelmed by all the information, or doesn't have a way to query an AI's decision and just, just get a probability um, for a particular recommendation. That's not sufficient either. And I think too little time currently is spent on working with companies to be very precise about regulations and what it means to, for example, have a human in the loop. So when, just take us in that room that you had with your employees and staff. I mean, how far when they um, come to your company do they just have to subscribe to the fact that your, your technology is going to be used in a battlefield situation? But what kind of... What kind of arguments are you having in that room with your staff about your capabilities, who should use it, who you can sell to? How do you manage that kind of risk? So first of all, I haven't had an interview um, with a potential candidate that, that didn't touch ethics. Like literally everyone wants to talk about it um, and everyone, I think, feels strongly about it. And, and I've always found people ask extremely good questions. And those are the kind of people, certainly for us at Helsing, that we want in the company. We want people to be critical thinkers and, 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 and push us and encourage all of us to think about these topics um, in a thoughtful manner. Um, because, because you have to, and these are very complex um, topics. But um, we found that working together with people on this and actually making them part of this is crucial. Because the, the thing that people are worried about, one of the first things that comes to mind is, who, who do we work with and what um, you know, countries are we OK um, you know, making our technology available to? And, we focus on democracies. Like we, we make our technology available to democracies. And there's a, the Economist Democracy Index. And we certainly from the beginning had a, or right at the very beginning, had a clear cutoff at a particular number. What was a pure democracy and what wasn't a democracy. And, and that is our overall guideline. But it actually happens, you know, what happens to be the case is that things become more conflicts, uh, com conflicted and complex at the edge cases. So I had a session with, with our people um, a few months ago where I asked, like, 
who here would um, just support um, uh, pure democracies? And everyone raised their hand. And then I asked, who would um, support Ukraine in the current conflict? And a lot of people raised their hand as well. But if you look at the um, Economist Democracy Index, um, Ukraine is currently um, classified not even as a flawed democracy, but as a hybrid model. And so this is an edge case that you then need to discuss and actually make a decision on. And the reality is that very often it is context dependent. Even though you have strong guidelines, you need to be thoughtful about edge cases. So um, given your success so far, why isn't there more money coming into the European space to create more defense AI companies? Uh, well, there, there, is, there is no lack of money. Um, I, there are a lot of VCs. So what happened even with the European VC community, it swung from we're not doing this, and it's an, the iffy corner of um, investments, towards um, being very gung-ho about defense. And usually what people now do is they call it um, dual use so that it doesn't sound like defense, but it's still defense most of the time. Um, so, so the money is there. I think um, what, what isn't there is, is the founders that want to build a scalable company. I think that's the issue. Um, I just want to get back to sort of the European landscape and um, there's some regulation and what's happening. I mean, do you worry that actually Europe's doing the same thing again of just over-regulating AI and becoming a leader in regulation, not a leader in creating businesses? Yeah, I'm, I'm not worried about it. I think these things are independent, to be honest. I think um, th th they're correlated, but they're not causal. Um, the, 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 the European focus on regulation may be a little bit overdone. Um, but at the same time, that's not the reason why we don't have companies in this space. So the reason why, like, we had a lot of regulation in the internet, at least later on. Um, that's not the regulation why there aren't big um, European internet companies. So as you look at the, the broader debate, there's been a huge amount about Paul's AI and, and lots of kind of um, hand-waving about extinction threats. How helpful are they to sort of frame the conversation about the future of AI? And a good example is the AI Safety Summit that Rishi Sunak's running later this year. It's focusing on frontier risks rather than actually on Europe implementing AI at scale across its businesses. Do you think there's a kind of, it's been misdirected by the big tech companies to focus on extinction level concerns? No, I don't think so. I think it's, I think it's the right focus. It, it shouldn't be the only focus, but it isn't. So I think where governments are good is at thinking about regulation and uh, reminding everyone that actually we are potentially playing with fire, which I, by the way, think we are. In what um, way? What kind of fire are we playing with? I, I think on the AGI side, there is a, I think there is, a, there is enough evidence that we may be building something where we understand the mechanics of the system, the underlying mechanics, but we don't understand the emergent properties. And I think that's even true for some of the academic world. We, we, we are reaching levels of um, state change um, with some of the large language models that we, that we have where we clearly don't understand exactly what's going on. And I think there is a danger that we're building systems that go beyond a point in intelligence uh, and reach a critical mass that, that goes beyond us. And that's uncharted territory. And I think it's wise to think about this as an issue. I don't think we should panic about it, but we should feel a pretty serious sense of urgency to think about how can we control it. And, and I think we, we, we will find ways of doing it, but I think we have to take it seriously. So Going back to the battlefield scenario, how far does that play out with the humans in the loop or overseeing a system which they may not have any understanding of how it's coming up with those conclusions or decisions? How do, you, how do you square that concern you have as a person with the risks on a battlefield situation? So first of all, it's probably important to say that we don't use um, LLMs or foundational models to make decisions or recommendations. Uh, I, and I would advise against that, um, certainly for the time being. I don't think the systems are there yet. We use different types of, we think, very advanced um, AI, uh, which are pretty much entirely all, also deep learning based, but we wouldn't use um, uh, LLM. So I think, I think that's, that's pretty important. And what was the second part of the question? Oh, about sort of how, how can you be, be a clever human in the loop when you're overseeing a black box? So uh, in general, I think it's, first of all, I think it's extremely desirable to have a human in the loop for ethical reasons. And so one of the things that, 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 that you know, is, is, is one of our, main paradigms is that a human always needs in the loop, and we build the tools to do that. Um, one of the realities that we are going to face in, in, in future conflicts is that our adversaries will not always have a human in the loop because you sometimes gain advantages in terms of speed. And one of the specific issues is, and you can see this in Ukraine, um, and I think we have hands-on experience of this, the environment is almost always contested. So your airwaves are jammed, so there's very little information certainly at times that you can bring back to human decision makers, in particular from, from drone and, and, and related systems. But that means that we have a responsibility as companies to find ways of still having a human in the loop and work with the extremely limited and corrupted bandwidth that you have 
that is possible. And then secondly, you have to create tools that also let a human inspect the AI pretty much always in real time. So you can be a, a human in the loop that actually makes the right decisions based on the information that you get given. But we do have to face a future where in, the, in, the, uh, in, in real conflicts, our adversaries will not have a human in the loop. And they will, in some cases, have a time advantage on their side. And we have to essentially build technology that is leading so that we have a lu the luxury to keep humans in the loop regardless. Um, let's just sort of widen the lens a bit. You've been an angel investor as well and founded businesses before. As so you look at the kind of broader AI landscape, and uh, where would you put your money right now? What else is exciting you beyond the sort of defense space that you think is interesting, particularly in Europe? So, so first of all, I think, I mean, we are in the middle of a Cambrian explosion, obviously, in this space. Um, as we've done, as we've been in crypto uh, to some extent as well, we are now with AI. The big difference between crypto and AI is that AI is real, and it will create real value, and it will be extremely disruptive uh, for now many decades to come. But that also, you know, it doesn't mean that there aren't companies right now that are copycats and that are jumping on the bandwagon. And I think that has to kind of shake out over the next one or two years. Um, there are a lot of companies that build reasonably thin layers on top of Jet GPT and related systems that are probably going to find it difficult to survive um, because there's so little um, differentiation to everyone else. Um, there is a, a huge amount of um, promise, I think, in, in, in biotech and essentially turning biology into software. I'm a, I'm a biologist originally, and I'm, I, I, I think we'll see a huge revolution in this. It may not be as fast as some people think, because it takes a while to get these systems deployed, working properly, and then eventually, obviously, uh, getting licensed and getting approval um, for everything that's involved in this. I think so that's hugely exciting. But one thing I think that's under-invested under in and, and overlooked is embodied AI, specifically. I think there is a huge opportunity around robots, in particular around robots that interact with the real world in a way um, that just hasn't existed yet. We, we have obviously factory automation, but what we haven't got, which I find shocking, is agile, uh, competent, uh, bipedal robots. Um, if you look at the, um, the labor shortage that we're going to experience in the next 10 to 20 years, I'm surprised how few companies are still working in the bipedal robot sector. I think it's going to be massive. So I'm super excited about that. So I want to go back to your um, um, biology and uh why did you make the switch from having studied biology to then doing a course in AI? Um, well, I was always interested in understanding biology as a, as a process. Um, so I was always more on the theoretical side rather than observing animals, um, to be honest, or plants. Um, and so I, I did, um, I did an, after my uh, BA in biology, did a master's in AI um, to understand biological systems better and then just spent pretty much all my time in, in my DFO, um, which I then never finished, um, writing simulation systems, analyzing uh, AI. And out of that came uh, research into bipedal locomotion, which I then commercialized. And that's, that's how I started natural motion, initially for visual effects for big Hollywood movies like Lord of the Rings and others. But when you think about this sort of impact on biology and what's happening now with um, DeepMind's uh, protein folding and other initiatives, what like, excites you personally, thinking back to your early days as a biologist, about what the potential of AI is right now, rather than just the gloom around it? I, well, I think the protein prediction side was amazing. I actually tried to enter CASP, uh, one of the first CASP, which was the protein prediction um, competition in 99 um, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a friend, uh, but we failed miserably um, using neural networks for, uh, you know, to, to predict um, protein structures. And I think what DeepMind have done specifically, I think we, we owe them a, a, a huge amount of gratitude because it's been an absolute breakthrough. And I think we're only seeing the beginnings right now of it. Obviously, you need to translate structure to function and do that in dynamic systems as well rather than just static ones. But I think it will be revolutionary. And the same thing, by the way, happens right now um, around mRNA and around related molecules. The ability to predict um, protein structure and protein uh, and, and molecule interactions with other molecules is massive. So when you wake up and think about the sort of five, if you sort of had a vision where visionaries here about the next five years and what kind of developments you're going to see in the defense AI space, but more generally around AI. I mean, one thing which just excited me was around the application of AI to listening to animal language and being able to actually predict. There was a great speech at TED this year um, about predicting that an orca would someday do a TED talk because the um, AI is developing so fast in terms of the analyzing human languages. I wonder if you could just give a sense of your you know, what's really surprising you, even as a technologist, about the pace of change right now? So, so on the defense side, if we do our job well, and a couple of other companies in the US, I, I think we will be able to, over the next five years, is make Europe safer. Um, and, and the equivalent US companies will do the same in the US. And I think that there is, uh, there is actually a chance that if we hopefully have enough time 
uh, we will be able to avoid some of the large geopolitical conflicts that are currently on the horizon, and that is our biggest goal by far, is to avoid um, additional conflicts in Europe and, and, and hopefully also contribute to avoiding a big conflict around Taiwan and China. How much, how much more needs to be invested in technologies like AI to allow that to happen? Um, actually, it's, it's, so in the investment amount is not even the scary uh, amount because it'll be much cheaper than buying a new uh, aircraft carrier, for example. It, it is much more, what's much more requirement is the commitment by governments to do this. And we're starting to see this happening. You know, the, the contracts are coming, but more of that needs to happen. I'm less worried about the money, but just people just need to get it in government. So, so when you speak to governments, how underwhelmed are you by how much they understand what's happening with AI and procurement bodies that you have to deal with? Reasonably underwhelmed, um, but, it's, um, but it's improving, and it's improving pretty fast, at least in pockets. You have, for example, in the air domain, uh, Eurofighter electronic warfare is one of the most protected and most difficult um, domains to penetrate. And the fact that the German government uh, selected with our partner SAPA uh, um, quite a new company with a different approach, I think, is a big sign of hope as far as I'm concerned. And we're seeing this everywhere else um, as well, so it's happening. But there are also you know, other parts of um, different forces where that isn't happening, to be fair. Um, I just want to get personal for a moment about just when you think about AI in your like, regular life, not in your defense life, what's the most extraordinary thing you've been playing around with and that you've actually done with it? Um, I use Midjourney a lot. Um, I think Midjourney is impressive, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that so I'm not unusual. I'm sure lots of people are using it. Um, there are um, now really impressive uh, ways of, to synthesize languages and do that quickly. Um, for content generation, um, my girlfriend is a film director, for example. That actually is, is, is disruptive uh, and super interesting. I'm also, also particularly excited about music generation because I, I, I used to produce a lot of music and now I think quite quickly it's becoming obvious um, that that's not going to be necessary anymore because that's going to be AI generated. Um, you've got a five-year-old um, kid. Um, when you think about um, his future in, in the sort of AI landscape, are you, um, there was a great stat recently about that half students are using ChatGPT to do their you know, examinations and study, and half the teachers think it's plagiarism. So uh, as you think ahead for your kid, how do you imagine the landscape for him in terms of what he should be learning, um, how far should he be learning coding, what would be your advice for sort of the future of education around AI? My so I, I'm, I think about this differently now to uh, how I would have thought about it um, about a year ago. To me, the core skills now of any child growing up is uh, a human, human interactions and what it means to be a human to other humans. Because I think that will be the, by far the most important skill. Uh, almost everything else will be commoditized by AI. Almost every cognitive task um, in the next 10 years will be commoditized by AI. And so, as humans, I think we need to have the competence to understand what's going on, but we won't be able to outcompete the AI. And so, careers in uh, law, accounting, uh, VC, uh, actually even running companies, will be much more commoditized in 10 to 20 years' time than they are right now. But being a human to other people, being able to create human art, um, being able to care for other people, that won't be commoditized, and I think that will always have value. Well, I think that's a great way to end, given that we're in a room of human-to-human -human contact and we haven't yet been able to disrupt the events business entirely. Um, Torsten, thank you very much indeed. And join me in thanking Torsten. Thank you. Thank you. In the sunshine when he Nice. Hey, Torsten. All right, guys, you can, you can follow me. <laughs> there are nice people here. Cool. All right. So, um, we are actually, we're going to continue right away with a tomorrow fund-inspired session. So you, you heard earlier about, uh, well, you, you quickly heard about the tomorrow fund, what we're doing in Frontier Tech trying to, uh, to, to finance breakthrough solutions to the, to the world's largest problems. And today, I'm actually I'm super happy that we have David and Niels with us. So um, I'm, I'm only going to do the quick intro, but then uh, you guys, you can, you can tell us the, the actual details. So Niels here on my left, he's a unicorn founder. He started Sunfire, so it's a company in the green hydrogen space and uh, did that actually 13 years ago. So he was the one that I was referring to with the overnight success that took 13 years to build. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, very happy that you're here. And uh, then we have David.
David, is, um, yeah, I think you actually, you, you tried starting lots of companies in the early days, then that didn't go anywhere, uh, and then you were always an avid gamer, and then uh, David started Unity, so it's a, it's a Decacorn company in the in a game engine space, and David transitioned to transition. So uh, David's new fund, which is called Transition, it's climate-focused, and I'm, yeah, I'm super happy that, to have the two of you here. And um, I would say, maybe actually starting with Niels, that you give a proper intro to what Sunfire is actually all about, and then we'll con to continue with David. Pleasure to do so. Uh, thanks, Sebastian. Great to be here. Um, so uh, what is Sunfire doing? Sunfire is a fully vertically integrated uh, manufacturer of so-called electrolyzers, so big technical devices um, that uh, this, the smallest single unit we build is 12 meters long and has a weight of 100 tons. And those devices turn water with renewable electricity into hydrogen. And we produce them from the membranes to the cells to the systems, all of it in-house in our production sites. We're about 600 people. Um, we have uh, around uh, 200 million euro in, in direct backlog, uh, another three, four, hundred million euro in, in, uh, in framework agreements, uh, typically with big industrial groups, RWE, Total, um, Uniper, uh, and, and the likes, so big refiners, energy companies, uh, steel makers. Um, I would say we're amongst probably the top five electrolyzer companies in the, in the space and uh, fully VC-funded um, yeah, and, and we'll actually we'll we'll talk about why hydrogen is actually super relevant for the energy transition, but we'll do that in a second. Um, but just to also translate maybe for the ones who are not familiar yet with electrolysis and hydrogen. So to put it very simply, you have water and then you put electricity in it and then you split H two O water into its two components, so hydrogen and oxygen. So that's what you're doing on industrial scale. And then, uh, yeah, let's, David, let's continue with you. How, how did you go from trying to start lots of companies to then starting Unity and then making that, that shift to climate? Yeah, sure. So I guess I kind of, I, I was a programmer. I w always knew I had to be a founder of something because I couldn't work for anyone else. Um, that's still the case. And, and then, um, yeah, I started like four-ish companies that were like complete nullities. They didn't even fail. There was like nothing there. Um, projects you can think of as. And then um, at some point, I, a friend of mine wanted to make video games. We tried to make video games. Uh, we built software for ourselves to make video games. Realized that our software was unusual, differently shaped than everything else. So we just kind of went for it. And yeah, that's, that's still running. Uh, I'm still on the board. If you follow tech news, it's been a pretty painful week for us. But I'm not going to go into that. Um, <laughs> nine years ago, I stepped out of my operating role. I did a bunch of angel investing because that's what unemployable founders do. Um, and in, that, in those journeys, I came across climate tech, right? So people that were solving these kind of massive problems that we face as civilization, um, and it felt like coming home because I, I knew what to do with these people. I, you know, I was quite worried about the climate crisis like everyone else, but I'm not a politician. I'm a very failed scientist. I don't think I'm a, I'm a very useful activist. I'm not patient enough. Um, so I... Um, but I knew what to do with these. I invested as an angel. I became an LP in pretty much any reasonably credible climate tech fund for a while. Um, and with these kind of two lenses, I, I came to believe that Europe needed like a particularly structured venture firm for kind of core venture series, you know, seed and A, um, which is what I started building almost three years ago. So um, I'm once again in the role of, of translating what you've done before. So anybody who played Pokemon Go, <laughs> um, essentially, uh, that was built on top of Unity's platform. So Yeah, something like half the video games in the world and 70% of mobile games at this point. And um, what is it that, if, if there's anything that you think the game industry can learn from the climate space, or actually vice versa, maybe that's even more interesting, um, what, what can the climate space learn from the gaming industry? Is there anything? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, okay, one, 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 one fun thing about running Unity, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not a game company, it's a software company, you know, supplying the games industry. 
And it's very strategic because we inter interact with the chips and the developers and the uh, analytics companies and the ads businesses and, and the operating systems and, and, um, and everything around us is kind of, we're operating on this big system. And that was really fun. It was one of my great pleasures of running Unity was that, you know, it's this kind of big strategic multidimensional thing you're operating in. And then when I was an angel investor afterwards, I didn't get that because every company was just like making a gizmo, selling it. And it's really fun to work with founders. So I'm doing that. Um, but when I started working in climate, suddenly I'm back to this kind of big systems thinking. And that's really fun. As in within climate, everything really ties together. And we'll, we'll put a spotlight today on hydrogen. But what you're saying is because we have to transition ultimately the entire industry or the entire economy, that it starts with the cows that are on the, f on the farm, the food that we consume. Um, Absolutely. And, and you know, we, we have energy. this massive crisis, right? It's, it's insanely big. Um, but it's actually only one of several crises. Like the other crises are of biodiversity and soil health and ocean acidification. Uh, you know, ozone is the one system we managed, right? But there's like five others, uh, fertilizer runoff and so on and so forth. And, and, you know, the climate crisis is horrible, but it's also fortunately big enough that it rises to the attention of the general kind of population. And if I'm an optimist, which I sometimes am, um, I, I see that maybe the magnitude of that crisis is enough to kind of force us into doing something. And maybe that becomes an excuse for us to redevelop, re-engineer, re rebuild the old industrial system, which is an unbelievably wasteful, loud, ugly, unhealthy. Um, and, you know, we, we get to reinvent like you know tens of thousands of new industrial processes food transportation and so on um, and of course fuels yeah and well uh, let's actually let's let's go there so I think uh, since we have Niels on stage with us who was probably one of the experts in, in hydrogen I think it would be good for say the audience to to actually get a view on the role of hydrogen how, how does the hydrogen economy how does it actually work what, what are the components when it comes to transport, hydrogen as an energy storage means, etc. So maybe you could enlighten us in, say, simple words, uh, so all of us are on the same page, and then we can take that to, to go from there. Yeah. So um, I think, first of all, it's very important to understand that on this planet, we use energy in very different forms. We use energy in the form of electricity, and over decades, we have learned how to, dec to decarbonize that sector with solar electricity, with, with wind electricity. And roughly 20% of the energy we, we, we use, if you want, is, is in the form of power. So for that, we have great solutions uh, that, that are com work commercially, and no one's asking whether it makes more sense to build a coal-fired power plant or a, a big wind farm. It's, it's relatively clear what makes more sense economically and also for the planet. Um, but then there's 80% of the energy we consume, which is not consumed in the form of electrons, but which is used in the form of chemical energy. And today that is almost exclusively fossil oil, fossil gas, or fossil coal. Um, and, and this area of energy is responsible for the majority of the 50 gigatons of CO2 emissions that we have each single year on this planet. And um, while the, the key effort, number one, has to be to electrify as much as possible directly through battery electric vehicles, through heat pumps, um, through electrification of industry, it's also completely clear that in the long term, we won't be able to live without molecules. And that's where hydrogen comes into the equation. Hydrogen is a chemical molecule that can be used in the pure form in order to substitute some of the things we do with oil, coal, and gas. But hydrogen can also be combined with other molecules in order to form other more complex chemical structures that we will also need in our life. Yeah, so, I don't know, the wristband of my watch is made out of, of oil. Um, you could use hydrogen, combine it with other molecules, and produce renewable wristbands for swatch, uh, watches. Um, and so, so hydrogen is really, if you want, a Swiss knife or a, a, a multifaceted option in order to replace all those different things. And could go a bit deeper into different things that you can make out of hydrogen um, or with hydrogen. Uh, on the one hand side, for example, you can replace coal 
in the production of steel. Uh, so when we turn iron ore into steel, we today use a lot of fossil coal. Hydrogen can be used to do the same thing without any carbon dioxide emission, and the steel Which sector is responsible for that. Which you are already doing with Salzgitter, for example. Exactly. So yeah. uh, one of our key clients is the second biggest um, uh, steel company in Germany. They're responsible for 2% of the German CO2 emissions, and they are on a clear path to substitute coal in the production of steel by using green hydrogen. Another nice example is fertilizers. So we use a huge amount of fertilizers to produce the food we eat. And that is produced using natural gas that we take out of the ground. And in the production of fertilizers, we emit 6% of global carbon dioxide emissions. Hydrogen can be used again in combination with other molecules to substitute fertilizers. And just very quickly, one last one. You can use hydrogen and combine it with carbon to produce jet fuel. So you could potentially fly big planes using hydrogen-based fuels without or with very limited emissions compared to what we do today. So it's really this option for a multitude of, of different applications to, to decarbonize them. And I, I don't think, uh, may, maybe many of you have not thought about fertilizers, so just picking up on what you just said, um, and what a critical, huge role fertilizers actually play for humanity. So. There's a process called the Haber-Bosch process, which was invented about 100 years ago. It hasn't changed ever since. Uh, it relies heavily on fossil fuels. It's very energy intensive, but it actually, uh, it's two dudes, Mr. Haber, Mr. Bosch, who invented this process. Um, and actually due to that and thanks to that, uh, we have to say, we are actually only able to sustain and to, uh, to produce the food that actually keep all of us alive. If that process hadn't been invented 100 years ago, then uh, the population would only be about half. So 4 billion people. And maybe that sounds like a solution to some of our problems. But <laughs> that would have been nice. But unfortunately, uh, th 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 that process wouldn't have been so seamless. So AKA, there would have been, yeah, lots of people would, would have starved to death. So um, yeah, we can actually be very grateful. But that process is outdated and uh, yeah, needs to be either supplanted or, or um, added with by hydrogen-based processes or some others. We also invested in a company in that space. And um, OK, I think that, that gave all of us a good, a good intro. David, I'm not sure how much you looked into the hydrogen space. What, what excites you in that area? Sure. So you know, when we got started um, with building what is now Transition, Dot VC. Um, we were looking for, you know, what is, what is framing for what we do, um, and as I sort of alluded to, greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas emissions resulting in global warming are unbeliev unbelievably important. But there are there are a number of other crises around us, and they're all interconnected. And maybe climate change is the nexus of them. So we decided that we would operate on that slightly larger set than just greenhouse gas emissions. Um, looking at that, you know, some of it is software. You know, optimization, management of different things, counting of carbon, uh, carbon emissions. Uh, you know, it's not going to solve the problem, but we can solve the problem without measuring it. So these are important tasks. Um, some of the topics, one of the topics we really like and look at a lot is uh, using synthetic biology uh, processes. There's like a toolbox developed in the last 20, 30 years that is unbelievably powerful and can address a lot of these uh, problems. Um, so that's what, that, those are some of the things we look at. Um, there's a few others, but yeah, hydrogen is actually one we've not really looked at. Um, we know it's important, but it's a deep dive we haven't taken. And obviously, you know, some companies are doing great work already and are well funded. Um, so that's how, how we think about it. And what would you say as a, as a fund, what do you actually, uh, what do you dif do differently? So you are a former founder, mm -hmm. uh, you teamed up with your brother, with Ari, um, to, to start Transition, you're based out of Reykjavik, so uh, Iceland, which is also a place. Uh, I, I am. The fund is in London. The fund and is in really London. You, London. You guys firm. spend a lot of time there. And I think mm. you also said that it's, it actually it makes sense for you guys to come from there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it also offers some, some advantages. But maybe you could also, in your own words. Uh, yeah, so, you know, we have this. So my brother came from Index Ventures, where he you know, probably got some of the best training that venture has to offer in Europe. Um, and we're looking at the framing of this, and, and the, our hunch was, and I think it's proving right, that venture should be done by investors and operators, uh, not 
necessarily scientists, um, although you know a bunch of us have some kind of scientific background. Um, so we try to build kind of a best of cla best in class uh, venture platform with kind of the knowledge of what great looks like, how to build great big companies, and 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 all the analysis work that the best venture firms do, and then combine it with a group of venture partners who are kind of the you know leading operators in climate tech. And when we, when we're getting started, we thought we have a, have a have a bunch of scientists around us, and we ha have some scientists, but it ends up being you know finance, regulatory building engineering installations, uh, those types of kind of, you know, really getting your hands dirty topics um, that the companies at Seed and, and especially Series A really need. So that's the kind of platform we've been building. And uh, from my side, I mean, we, we couldn't agree more. But what you heard earlier, what we're building, what we have built with visionaries is, is also, to some extent, uh, you know, we, we, we've seen the same problem we also came in as operators. We well, then teamed up with our LPs, so deep industrial expertise and backgrounds and, and access to networks that otherwise you wouldn't have. And on the other hand, those high growth founders, 45 plus yeah. unicorn founders who invested in, in visionaries. And, and to us, that's also that's probably one of the best value as that we can give to, to founders, especially actually in the frontier climate space. But I, I'm saying that, but I'm not sure, Niels, if you would actually agree. I mean, but what were you looking for in investors, and, and what would the ideal investor look like to you? Um, so we, we've, we've decided from a relatively early point in time not to go too much into the direction of strategic investors, because we always try to keep that separate and say our operative business and the partnerships we have, we, we don't let into our cap table. Um, not because strategics can't be good investors, but having so many different options and so much unclarity which markets will open up first for us, we thought it was not a good idea to, to link too quickly to, to the strategic side. So uh, eventually we were When, when I was running Unity, sorry to interrupt, you know, uh, it, strategics would come to us. And I always said, I like revenue. <laughs> like, yeah. buy something from me. <laughs> sorry. I yeah, know, but I mean, the, 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 in, in our case, it was really trying to, to stay away from that side, not to be kind of sucked in too much. and. So very much. But you have done it a little bit, right? Investors. With with Amazon, for example, who came on board, who also I think there's also an off take agreement, ideally, or maybe a potential in place at some point. But the 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 route is is always very much. F we want investors that want a return from their investment, and they focus on that and help us create a, a good governance structure and and help us with contacts and those kind of things. But no mix up of of uh, strategic uh, interests in the shareholder structure of the business and. I think we were relatively fortunate to have been able to, to select also the right people that fit with us and yeah, keep those two things a bit separate. So financial investors, people who, who are focusing on, on returns and on their investment is, is the focus. Let's, uh, let's take that and, and actually um, maybe move to a meta level, so to the European level. We talked about Europe before. I think Europe is one of those places where because of our industrial heritage, there is huge potential, especially in climate. Um, what do you guys think, if Europe wants to become number one for climate innovation and climate commercialization, what are we good at? What do we, s what do we still need? Can I start? Yeah. Either one. So, um, I, so first of all, what I observe personally, and, and actually that's a big source of motivation for me and for what I do is, I observe that in the course of the past 24 months, there has been quite a negative view on the industrial location Europe, on the industrial companies in Europe, on what governments are doing. Um, where it, at Sunfire, I was saying it's almost like a bit of a deindustrialization blues. Everyone's <laughs> negative, everything is going to the US and China. What is our role going to be in the future? And what, what we do is when we grow, and we're growing from a couple of megawatt to gigawatt, which is a huge step up, is we always look for partnerships with traditional companies that know how to take things to a professional level, that companies that know how to produce stuff at big, big scale. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that in Europe, we are in the fortunate position that we still have amazing mechanical engineering, plant engineering, uh, a great automotive industry mm. that has so many so valuable competences that we can use in order to take a new topic to a level that needs to be so 
enormous if we want to tackle the problem. Um, that's, yeah, this, this is a, really a big, big benefit. And in Germany, we, we often have this, this, uh, those two words, German Angst. Yeah? We're always afraid of doing things and taking things forward. And I think the hydrogen topic, um, the, the construction of this equipment, which is so similar to what we have done over the, the past 80 years in Europe, building good combustion engines, building good chemical plants, the skills you need there are so similar to the skills that we need with our topic that I think it's less about German or European angst. It's a topic that is more about European optimism and, and really a story that can motivate people and, and bring partners together. And there's for me, if, if I look at the 80 years in, in Europe, what made us strong was technical know-how, networks and synergies between partners in the value chains and differentiated high technologies. So not repetitive commodity business, but differentiated complex technology. And I think our topic is a topic that needs all those three areas and that fits beautifully into what we have in Europe. So I think it's also from that perspective. So thinking about the title, it's not just um, uh, prosperity uh, for, for the planet, but yeah. also for the people. And that's, that's a beautiful side of that business. And looking at the time, maybe David, quick answer. Yeah, I'll I'll try to be fast, <laughs> but uh, I, I am know actually you, you can do that. So. I'm a little frustrated because when we got started, things looked great. All the talent in Europe, a lot of good, good companies coming up. Of course, also in the U.S., we're, we're investing cross Atlantic, but we're really a European firm, and we're happy to help companies go both ways over the Atlantic. Um, then the uh, Inflation Reduction Act comes out in the U.S. with like you know trillions, literally, of of giveaways. Um, and that creates enormous gravity wells for companies to, cr to cross the Atlantic early, not just with plants and, and sales, but actually like moving. And then they go there and then they can sell back into Europe where companies, which is good, are forced to decarbonize. So the, the most sophisticated buyers of these technologies are actually in Europe, largely, right? Yep. Um, so you, I think you, the, the US is getting away with it again, uh, you know, getting all the industry over, or a lot of it, not all of it and then selling back into Europe. I think it's uh, very frustrating to watch. Europe has to get in the game. Um, and, and if funding is that, then they have to do that. And it's painful, it's annoying. You know, we wish the US had more regulation, so that they, they would also be forced to decarbonize there. They're really not, or not so much. So yeah, it is, it's actually very frustrating. Europe is really falling behind. The talent is here, we've got great companies, and many of them are gonna move. That's we why I'm glad that we're on stage here together. Yeah, I, I think what's, what's important is, is the story, storytelling element and the, to, to create a bit of hope and say, okay, this is a strategic sector that we are good at. Today, out of 15 companies in my space, 10 are based in Europe. So we have a real chance to, to actually take a great position. And I think we need to become a bit smarter on the political level yeah. to not let that go away into other hands. But again, I have hope that there's a bit better understanding than maybe we had in the nuclear sector or in other sectors in, 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 in the European energy industry yeah. where we've let topics go away. Yeah. So I'm hopeful that we'll be a bit smarter. And at least in, looking, at, looking at your example of Sunfire, I, I don't know when uh, the, the, the German e Minister of Economics, I think he just visited you in Dresden and handed over a nice check. So at least there are positive signs and I think that all of us here mm. are together today uh, under this uh, motto of, of building to endure Coming from first principle, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. I want to turn to... There's one more framing that I think is important. Sorry to cut in. It's that, you know, sometimes you look at, you know, regulation in the countries I've spent time, Denmark, Iceland, and definitely Europe as well, where it's like, you know, we're going to be neutral here. We're not going to emit more. That's good. Um, and that's the end. But that's not the end. The emissions here are pretty small on a global scale. You know, our mission has to be to develop the technologies, export the technologies, so that we can save the planet together, because we can't save Europe by like, not emitting carbon, emi carbon here. Yeah. Sorry. I just wanted to get, kind of la using the last few minutes, um, regardless of whether you are in the climate space or not, I just wanted to use your presence here and your founding stories, this 13 years uh, overnight success in the making, you having run Unity for 20 years. Um, I just wanted to get that kind of some lessons learned that you had decisions that you made that looking backwards you would have made differently, mistakes that you've made, where somebody who's now here in the audience about to start a company where you would say, yeah, please do that differently. 
Um, actually, if I can just s slightly uh, adapt the, the, the answer first by saying it's super nice to be in an environment like that because I come from a world where we put 100 tons of steel into an industrial plant and we, we operate that. Uh, and this is, a, in, a, in a way, a very simple engineering mechanical type of work. Um, there is, in my opinion, pretty significant potential in AI, for example, when it comes to autonomous operation of our equipment. Um, I know that some of the partners we work with that are uh, helping to take our equipment into operation do that better uh, without any human beings involved in it. Um, and, and, and this is a side that is interesting. We've had massive problems with the certification of the hydrogen that comes out of our machines, where I'm 100% sure that there are smarter ways of doing it than what the German government is proposing. Um, so, so I think when coming from the software world, getting together with people also in our world and trying to find things that can be done, I think can be extremely powerful and have a massive impact. So that's, that's an invitation to, to engage in that part of the discussion. And actually, I, I really like that approach. I think when, when I started my company, Pre-Visionaries, that was uh, 2013. Back then, I think it was, wasn't easy to find a business idea, but I think it was, relatively speaking, more easy, uh, easier, I think is the right word. Um, but now going as a founder in Spay, actually collaborating very closely, going into a specific industry, f trying to figure out how can I be a value here? What are the shortcomings in this particular industry? And then starting a company on those points that you, for example, just mentioned. I, uh, I really like that approach. David, any lessons learned? If, if, if you were to speak to, the, to the David 20 years ago, I mean, don't change fees is probably one. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry. It's I, funny. Uh, <laughs> that, was, that was the big unity uh, for, thing. Fortunately, most people haven't read that sorry. piece of news, but it's a, it's a shitty mo moment. Uh, I don't know. Um, just be, you know, just care. Okay, I mean, one thing I learned being a founder, I'm very light touch, very gentle, um, but I learned as I built my company, Nobody will ever care more about your company than you do. And so that forces you and also gives you permission just to care a lot and show that you care and care about the nuances and care about the people and care about getting rid of non-performers and you know, care about the customers and just like show care. I, I don't know. I, I, I should have done more of that in the early days. I was so intellectual and gentle, you know? Okay. I think that's uh, those. I li really like those words. Um, and with that, Thank you very much, and thank you guys especially. Thanks, Sebastian. Thanks a bunch. Thank you. Thanks okay. David, Niels, and Polly. <laughs> just, um, just a quick announcement for those of you who'd like to catch up and meet each other. We've got a great networking space downstairs in the crypt that I'd like to invite you uh, to use for that purpose. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, our next session, one which is close to my heart. We'll be hearing from Eleanor Crespo, founder and co-CEO of Pigment, which is one of the most exciting startups in Europe today. She'll be talking about her journey as a founder, how she is hyperscaling her business, and the lessons that she's learned along the way. Eleanor is joined by Miriam Partington, DAC correspondent and future of work reporter at Sifted. I'm sure we are all avid readers of her work. Please join me in welcoming Eleanor and Miriam for what promises to be a really fascinating conversation. Good luck. Hello, everyone. Thanks very much for sticking around. Eleanor, it's so nice to meet you in person. Very nice to meet you, too. Thank you so much for, for this. Uh, of course. So we were just having a quick chat backstage, because you founded Pigment in 2019, just before COVID. It took you two years to build the platform. Maybe you can kind of center our discussion by talking a little bit about Pigment, why you decided to launch this particular product, and why was this you know, problem the most interesting for you to solve? 
Sure. So for those who don't know Pigment, Pigment is a SaaS company. We are a business planning platform. So the idea of Pigment, uh, at first, so we are two co-founders, actually, Roman Nicoli and myself. And when we started Pigment, the main idea was to say we think decision making in large companies is most of the time made on inaccurate or incomplete data. So we really wanted basically to solve the problem of decision making at scale, which is a very, very big uh, issue to tackle. And the idea was to say, how can we create a data platform that can literally be in the hands of any business user of any large company in the world over time, serving not only finance team, but HR team, marketing team, literally bringing data together, people together, and processes together to collaborate on the right data and to help people make better decisions. And the reason why we did that is very simple. So on my side, I actually worked for Google, for the EMEA CFO, and then I was actually at uh, Index Ventures with Ari that, uh, that we mentioned in the, in the previous talk. And I realized that you know, at, at large companies like Google or at fast-growing companies uh, that we are backing at Index, that was a big problem. My co-founder, Romain, was actually the co-founder and CTO of Criteo. And Criteo is a company that IPO'd now 10 years ago. And I think, you know, from his experience at Microsoft and then at Criteo, he realized that that was probably one of the biggest issues to solve today in any company in the world. So we wanted to have a large ambition, solve a very big problem, and that's what we did. As I understand it, there's a lot of potential for this particular project, and there's lots of opportunity to expand in other different areas. What would you say are some of the kind of short-term or maybe longer-term goals that you have for the product? Yeah. Uh, so short-term, uh, the main thing we are trying to do with Pigment is, first of all, to be in the hands of every single Fortune 500 company, every single uh, CAC 40 company, and basically build the platform that can serve all of these large companies. So that means that basically we are working on two main areas. One is the power of the platform, the scalability of the platform to serve you know, any team in any of these large companies. And the second is the simplicity of the platform and the fact that we want to make it very collaborative. So that means we are building, we have a very big roadmap around AI, but we are also thinking about the platform as a multi-product platform. So that means that we are literally building a product that is pigment for HR, a product that is pigment for marketing, product, pigment for finance, pigment for everything. And that's really the way we are thinking about the pigment, short term. And we see long term, what we will do, we'll go way, way, way beyond planning. We are pushing the boundaries of planning to the maximum, and we want to go in the boundaries of the ERP, the HRIS, etc. So there are a lot of things that we are going to accomplish, I think, in the next couple of years. So you're one of the fastest growing SaaS companies in Europe right now. You've raised 248 million, if I'm correct, and also growing to 300 employees in the last three to four years. What are some of the lessons that you've learned from this like, kind of fast growth stage that you think might be critical for other founders to hear? Very good question. So I would say one of the biggest learning is the people you hire. It seems like a very easy answer, but I think some things that people are always amazed when we talk to either customers, partners, people in the ecosystem, like you know, candidates, is really that we put the highest of the highest bar. And I would say not only in terms of the skills, the expertise, and you know, we really try to hire people that have like 10, 15, 20 years of experience in our space, but also in the fact that we wanted them all to fit our company values. And there is something that we've done really well, is what we call the bar raiser interview, where literally at the end of every interview process, we put candidates on the grill to make sure that they actually fit the values that we want at the company. So that's the number one. The number two is being customer-centric, and I mean, that seems very simple, again, but you have no idea how many SaaS companies I've met that are not customer-centric. That means that my time, I spend at least 30% of my time with customers. With the, the user experience, to give you an example, we had a management on-site this week. We spent literally one day only talking about customer experience. Lifetime cycle of a customer. How can we serve better a customer from when he's a prospect to when he buys pigment, to when he implements pigment, to when pigment is live? And that's, I think, the, the care that we've put into that customer journey made our customer our largest ambassador. And I'm going to tell you something. We didn't have a head of marketing up until six months ago because our customers were our best marketers. They were the biggest ambassador of Pigment, and they created such a word of mouth that it has been so powerful. And we've done the same with our partners. We've done the same with, obviously, our team members. And I think these were the big, big, big power of, uh, of the company so far. You mentioned team, um, as in the people that you hire. But I guess a lot of the success of a company is also the founding team. 
And you've spoken a bit already about your co-founder and co-CEO, uh, Romain, who's also exited his own company before. And um, you know, I, sp I spoke to one of your early investors, and I asked them, why did you invest in this company? And they said that one of the things was because of this incredibly close relationship that you have um, with Romain. So what do you think it takes to kind of find that perfect co-founder and then build this incredible functional relationship that you two clearly seem to have? Yeah, so uh, first of all, so uh, I think, you know, I'm one of the luckiest person in, in the world, and uh, I have to say, yeah, the, the success of Pigment is largely, largely due to Romain, because he, the, the, the only reason why we are successful today is because of our platform, and the engineering team is put together. And so today with Romain, we are actually co-CEO, which is something that is pretty unusual. And um, maybe one advice I will give to people that want to start their own company is that before you start a company, if you want to have a co-founder, spend time together. But what I mean spend time together is not spend like a few meetings here and there, spend one month, two months working together. Spend time before you hire your first employee. And with Roma, we have been very, very lucky because actually before starting Pigment, we literally spent nine months, just the two of us, thinking about what we wanted to do together and thinking about how we could design in the best possible way this company. What, you know, basically we talked to like hundreds of customers, hundreds of partners, hundreds of people in the ecosystem. And what was critical in that journey was really to get to know each other and see if the feeling was mutual. And we had been very clear from day one that in these nine months, if something would go wrong, we would stop the relationship immediately. And um, the way, you know, it actually started is that for me, it was actually a dream to work with Romain, because I think that Romain was one of her the best, if not the best CTO, you know, that had ever created a unicorn in Europe. And, you know, when I met him, you know, I, I had done my wish list of, like, who do I want to work for? And he was the number one. And, you know, I think that's also something, like, like, do not hesitate to go for the people you dream of working with, because, you know, things can, the chemistry can be there. So that's the first thing. Spend time together, try to find someone that you dream of working with, and really understand if the personality fit. Where we are very lucky with Romain is that there are a lot of complementary things that we do together. First of all, he's 10 years older than me, so his experience goes way beyond mine, right? So he has scaled the company from zero to post-IPO. You know, he has seen so many mistakes. And I bring something totally different. You know, I think I bring actually perhaps my uh, optimism overly... <laughs> I'm always a little bit overly optimistic compared to him. And I think, you know, this duo is fantastic because we have very, very clear ownership of areas where, you know, he leads tech, product, he leads HR, I lead the rest. And basically, that works super well because our areas of responsibility are very well defined. And what makes us stronger than you know, anybody else on Earth is that we challenge ourselves every day to the max. We just work together as team players every day, and we really try to always say, how can we do better, how can we do better, and be very honest to each other. And I think, you know, again, I am definitely a thousand times more lucky than he is because he's just extraordinary, so it's easy for me to say that it works well. Sounds a bit like a romantic relationship. It's just something you have to kind of put like constant work into, I guess, and stay that aligned. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's actually the opposite of romantic in the sense that uh, we have so much objectivity in everything we do that, you know, the transparency is just here every day. And perhaps a romantic relationship is about transparency as well, I don't know. But I think Thank actually the contrary is that there is no emotion in anything we do. We try to always take a step back. We don't take ourselves seriously at all. We are always like, you know, how can we do better challenging ourselves, saying the truth to each other? And it works really well. But, you know, I, I know that that doesn't work really well for everybody, but that's the way we work. So I want to focus um, on the other side of this equation, which is hyperscaling family yeah. as well. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you actually raised a Series B round three weeks after having your twins. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, it's true. But, which uh, sounds like a crazy whirlwind. Yeah, but honestly, I don't think it's a good example to give <laughs> because it's, uh, it's not something I would recommend to anybody having twins in the room. No, honestly, it's... <laughs> Uh, the, the reality is that, uh, so I had twins in 2021, and what happened is that uh, with Roman, we are a planning company and we are planning founders, so we are super conservative, and probably a lot more conservative than other people. So we have always, basically, we have always been preempted when we, we never fundraised properly. I never actually did a fundraising deck of my whole life, which is great. It's a great time saved. But actually, we have always been very conservative in our journeys, always saying, okay, 
if someone preempts us at a point where we still have all the cash from the past two fundraising, but we think it's a good moment to raise, let's do it. And what happened is that, uh, uh, so I had my twins, and we got interest from like, US investors at that time, and it was 2021, and the market starting to like, get on a very, very good edge, and we are like, we never know how long it's going to last, and so obviously I was supposed to be on my leave, but we were like, well, you know, if tomorrow the market is over because of COVID or whatever, perhaps time is now to do something great. And, you know, we are still pre-product, pre-everything, pre-product market sheet. We had zero customer. So we're like, well, anyway, let's do it now. So, but honestly, I wouldn't advise that to anyone. The only good thing is that, you know, when you are newly mom, like, you know, they were my first kids, you want to be efficient, you have no time. I was super tired, so I was like, you know what, like, give, me, give me a term sheet in an hour, I sign, go, let's move on, due deal a month max, and let's go. Because honestly, uh, that's, and I have to say that since then, it has always been the case. We had Iconic, actually, in the last round, and I was super thankful to Seth and, and Matt because uh, they did it the same way. You know, we did uh, due deal in uh, 10 days, I think, so it was very short. And uh, that's very good when you can move forward with the business. So. Yeah, absolutely. But how do you kind of you know, as an entrepreneur of a fast-growing business, how do you actually keep your mental health and well-being kind of in check when you've got all these different kind of plates spinning? Yeah, well, I think, you know, uh, if I think about what we do, uh, and if I think about what the other speech was about just before, global warming, you know, when you think about health, about global warming, there are topics in this world that would probably keep me up at night more than doing a SaaS business, right? I think what is really great about what we do is that uh, you are allowed not to take yourself too seriously, right? It means that uh, every day you are allowed to take a step back on what you do, because if I don't sign this customer tomorrow, I can tell you nobody will die, right? It will be a similar story everywhere. The world will keep running. And it's the same if a relationship goes west with a partner, everything will, will go well. So I think that helps a lot is that at the end of the day, what we do if every day we think that, you know, we shouldn't take ourselves too seriously and that we are just trying our best and that, you know, we have no regret in the way we build the company, then everything is fine. So that's really the way I've tried to think about pigment every day. And I think the only thing that worries me is when I have a, an issue, when an employee comes to me with a personal issue or something that is, you know, a real life problem, but otherwise uh, it's very easy. And I have to say that honestly, between my family and the company, I have not even one second to think about my own mental health. So at least, you know, <laughs> it keeps me moving. Yeah. As a female founder, it's probably a question that's fired at you quite a lot. Like, how are you taking care of your family and then also, like, running a business? Like, how do you feel about that? Because yeah. it seems like this is not something that is necessarily, you know, a question that's of often asked of men. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe, I don't know if Mark Benioff was on stage, but maybe you can ask him too, because I feel like it's only us two ladies. So <laughs> I'll probably do that. But uh, honestly, the reality is that, uh, I mean, I do like everybody else, right? Like, I have to cope with uh, a very, very busy life. Uh, I didn't do children not to take care of them, so I'm super organized more than uh, probably a lot of people uh, uh, on Earth, meaning that, you know, uh, my schedule is the same every day. I am super, super diligent of being with my kid in the morning, being in, with my kid in the evening. I actually try, more than me traveling, I have a lot of my team members traveling to me, same with customers, same with partners, so I travel as little as possible so that I spend as much time as possible with my family, because already, you know, uh, I travel too much compared to what I would like to. And so I think, as a founder, it's all about making choices. It's all about being efficient. And, you know, it's just about working hard. You see, my, you know, I see every day is like the same. My routine, see my kid go to work, see my kid work again, and, 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 and off you go. And it just means sacrifice, right? So it's, it's like, of course, uh, I don't see as much as I want my friends or the people in life, but that's life. You will just disappoint a few people along the way, but uh, that's uh, what you have to do for a few years while your company is fast growing. So. Yeah, absolutely. So just to wrap up then, because I can see this big, scary clock. Yeah. Um, but you know, in times of economic downturn, right, I guess there's a lot of founders that aren't seeing that fast growth, perhaps, or like there's not these like small milestones that you're, you're used to seeing. How as a founder can you kind of like keep going during this time and maybe celebrate success in a different way? So what do you mean? Can you, can you uh, explain a bit better? Sorry. 
Yeah, sorry. So as a founder right yeah. now, you probably don't see that kind of like breakneck growth, right? That um, we saw kind of in 2020, 2021. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to like celebrate those like small wins. How can founders kind of celebrate success during this time and kind of keep themselves Yeah, going? Going. well, I think yeah, it's, it's obviously difficult times and it's the macroeconomic environment is, is clearly not easy for a lot of companies out there. But I think, uh, uh, I mean, there are still ways to celebrate your success every day, right? Meaning that... Uh, every new customer for a SaaS business, every new, you know, whatever, like milestone that you achieve, I think, you know, it's even more rewarding in this microeconomic environment to be able to achieve some, some you know, little steps in your journey. So I would say, you know, uh, uh, in order to cope in that environment, like just focus again, I would just say, you know, focus on your customers, focus on what matters the most. Obviously, you know, we have heard a lot about being lean, being efficient. I actually see positive signs right now in the VC market and in general in the US about the market kicking back up. So, you know, I think there are positive signs that, uh, that every company will, uh, will start being in a, in a pretty good shape again. So I think it's about, you know, staying strong in that, uh, in that uh, environment. And stay tuned. All right. Thanks very much, Eleanor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello everyone. Today we are joined by one of the greats, Nicholas Zenstrom, who's here to talk to us about the state of European technology. Nicholas really needs no introduction at all. Uh, he is the founder of Skype and Atomico, two organizations that have laid the groundwork for many of the great European tech companies that we have had the fortune of working with or backing. Um, he is joined by our Sahar Megani, growth of the, a partner of the Visionaries Growth Fund. And I will hand it over to the two of them to begin their discussion. Thank you, Bella. Niklas, welcome to Visionaries Unplugged. You're one of the biggest champions of tech in Europe and one of our proudest success stories. Yeah. I think of you as the godfather of European tech, so I'm really excited to be here with you today. We only have 15 minutes, so I'd love to jump straight in. Sure. When you think about Nicholas, the founder, what did it take to build a multi-billion dollar business back when you were building Skype? And what does it take to do that now? Yeah, sure. So you know what? Um, last weekend, we celebrated um, 20 years of yes. Skype since the launch. So we had a big reunion in Tallinn, you know, a few hundred people, and you said, trip down memory lane. You know, the reality back then was that the ecosystem if you would get like everyone in venture, everyone in startups in the whole of Europe, it would be like half of these people, you know? The, there was really no ecosystem. There was no other entrepreneurs to learn from who've done it before. So I think what was required was just um, tenacity and not just not giving up and just going for it. But you know, also timing is everything. You know, we were very fortunate. There was a lot of things happening at the right time. I mean, a lot has happened in European tech since when you started Skype. Uh, what do you think, you know, what advice do you have for founders that are trying to build these businesses now? How is it different? And, and what, how should they be thinking? Yeah, a lot of things have happened. You know, $3 trillion has been created a value in European tech. I think the best advice is just to learn from others and to just, you know, seek out other entrepreneurs who've done it before and, and also to, um, because there are others who have similar problems that you've had. But I think it's just about um, having a vision and, and having a lot of grit and going for it. Yes. So on, on a related note, you've recently spoken a lot about the idea of building resilience in Europe, this idea that the European ecosystem has to learn to embrace failure. Yeah. Why is this so important to you? Yeah. So I think you know, when we started Atomico in 2006, I spoke a lot about fear of fail failure and we shouldn't be so fear of failure because that's the startup journey, the journey of entrepreneurs, the journey of um, startup investors is that a lot of things don't work out. And 
we used to have a culture in Europe that you shouldn't go out and take risks, you shouldn't fail because it's not good for your CV. I think that's behind us. Okay. However, now when we've had this market reset, there's a lot of companies that are, that are yet to face you know, the most extreme challenge of closing down or taking down rounds, but really closing down. And I think that's where <clears throat> this whole fear of failure is going to be crystallized because there's been so many years of a bull market, a lot of companies that maybe shouldn't be able to raise money managed to raise money and they kept, kept it going. Mm. Now it's going to be very, very different because there's a lot of companies that are going to go out, they're going to run out of money and they're not going to be able to raise. And then that's the kind of the moment of failure. And I think we should not look at that as failure. We should just look at that as a really brave attempt of those founders to go out and take a chance on building those companies. Because the worst thing that can happen is that you get these kind of companies that don't go anywhere. You have zombie mm -hmm. companies that don't grow and they don't really, they don't really make money. And they're just, they're just there. Because what happens there is that you have, you're locking in talent. You're locking in entrepreneurs. So if those companies shut down, it's actually really, really good relocation of talent so those, the team members can go and join uh, a startup that maybe have more chances. And maybe even more importantly, the founder gets released with a lot of experience and most likely going to start another company and be much more, much better equipped with experience. The other thing that this founder will have is a really, really strong desire to show the world yeah. that they can be successful. I know it myself because I started a few companies that didn't work out and that just made me so much stronger and gave me so much more um, um, uh, will to, be, to succeed. No, that's great. And I guess, you know, you've, you've, this idea of kind of these zombie companies or companies that maybe have a lot of runway, maybe haven't reached product market fit, how are you advising, and these are very difficult conversations to have between yeah. investor and founder, yeah. how are you advising these companies that maybe find themselves in these low growth situations? Yeah. It, I think the reality is that it's not like a general advice. You need yes. to look at case by case basis, right? And there are a few companies where you think, you know what, they still have runway, it's a really strong team, maybe they should kind of mix it up, pivot, or roll the dice mm. one more time. Um, and so that, that's typically would be almost like the first advice, but it's also kind of how much runway you have because yeah. it takes, if you want, if you realize things not going to work, okay, then maybe you, you want to set yourself up for an aqua hire, yeah. but it takes time to engineer that. So you want to kind of start up really, really early. The most painful situations that, that, you know, founders and investors find themselves in is when the runway, you know, running out of money and you have to kind of, you know, file for bankruptcy and, and it's just painful for everyone. So really, you know, evaluate, do you have another chance to, to roll the dice or otherwise you just kind of try to wrap it up and find, you know, aqua hire, you know, kind of find a home for the company. Yes. But that's also calling it, okay, that was a great attempt. Let's go out and start another company. Great. Actually, so speaking of aqua hires, you know, We've got in the audience VCs, founders, employees of startups, LPs as well, um, all of whom are seeing liquidity challenges at different levels. Um, how are you thinking about liquidity and exits yeah. in your portfolio? Sure. It's, um, it's a big topic, right? Yeah. It's, it's, um, hindsight is great. And when the market was super hot, you know, I think most of us got carried away and uh, of course you want to hang on to your successful companies. And, but what's happened is that a lot before the market turned, there were so many funds went out much, much quicker to raise more funds. So it's a real, real strain on the whole LP community, right? Because they don't see money coming back. But I think that that's something what we all have to bridge because you know, right now, maybe not so many liquidity opportunities. Um, there's some IPOs happening right now. It's like, I think the jury's out if yeah. that's going to open up the IPO window. But I think eventually, you know, you need to have a little bit of a patience. And, um, but for sure, I think all, you know, fund managers and also companies have to think more, a little bit more about managing right. liquidity because, you know, because 
we have all these kind of paper valuations, and, and ultimately it's about delivering a cash. Right. However, it takes a really long time to build successful companies. So that's, I think that is about if you have companies which are doing really, really well, both for the team and for investors, take a little bit of money off the table, you know, secondaries uh, along the way. Yeah. You, you mentioned a little bit about kind of aquahire. You know, M&A is, of course, one way of kind of getting to that liquidity. Um, what role, in your opinion, do VCs play, if any, when it comes to M&A in the portfolio? Because we always hear the best companies are bought, not sold. Um, but I wonder kind of what your opinion on that is. Sure. No, no, for sure. The best companies get bought, not sold. <laughs> That's certainly true. So I think that... You know, the VCs have experience, maybe they've seen it many times before, so they can also be helping to advise and can help to create competitive situations that we try, always try to do. Yeah. Because if you have a company that is kind of doing so-so, it's not like a rocket ship, and you have a buyer. If you only have one buyer, yeah. it's not going to be... Everyone's, right. All the shareholders will be disappointed with the, with the outcome. But if you manage to get two two potential buyers, you get a different situation. Right. So I think those are the things that, you know, we can help with also advising founders and, and, and uh, also kind of try to help to, you know, also create a little bit of competitive pressure. I'd like to ask you about the success cases and the companies that are flying that are doing really well. Um, despite kind of the incredible growth that we're seeing in tech in Europe, Europe continues to see what some people are calling this unicorn drain. So the very successful companies moving across the pond to the US as they're trying to scale and build global leadership. How big of an issue do you think this is? And, and how do you see this evolving yeah. uh, for Europe? I think it's not a big issue, to be honest with you. I think that what we see is, you know, there's what, 350 kind of unicorns. I don't think we can call them unicorns, but billion dollar <laughs> companies. Um, and I think most companies are staying in Europe. And I think we need to separate a few things, like companies being started in Europe and then where actually they just pack up the bags and, and just relocate to the US. That's, that, that's the drain you're talking about. I think that's very few cases. The other one is like founders have ambitions to build global companies. And then, of course, US is a huge market and you need to address that market. And to do that, you might have to spend a lot of time. Maybe the founder has to spend time in the US to really develop that market. It doesn't mean that the company is leaving. The third issue is listing, right? So you have a company in Europe being very successful to go in public on, in New York. It doesn't mean that the company is moving to New York. It just happened that the, the listing on an electronic market base that has New York in its name. Right you mentioned that you had your 20-year anniversary of Skype and the who's who of the recent kind of European tech, you know, they were kind of born out of that experience. So the share of kind of companies that are being started by repeat founders is at an all-time high in Europe, which obviously is a really exciting sign of kind of the developing and the maturing ecosystem. On the flip side, we're also seeing as a result a lot of hype, a lot of FOMO, a lot of big rounds early on. How are you thinking about that dynamic, uh, especially at the very early stage? Sure. I think there's fewer FOMO, <laughs> fewer huge rounds the last, over the last year, right, since the reset. So I think that's the good thing with the reset. Then, of course, when you have a new, new um, exciting uh, topic like generative AI, then you get that, you know, you get certainly a bit of hype right. in that area. And there's some of those runs then becomes really big. There's really no proof points, there's no product. And it's, it's challenging because, you know, do you want to play in those areas or do you want to wait it out? So I think that's, I'm pretty sure that like what happened in generative AI is following the typical hype curve. And we're like on that first up on the hype curve. So certainly we're going to come down. Got it. And I, I'd like to draw that out a bit further. So kind of on that note, at the very early stage when companies are starting out, their pre-seed and seed round, like how important do you think it is for them to feel constrained in that early stage? Yes. I think it's good to be constrained, right? Because it's focus, it makes you focus. Um, so having too much money too early is, is not great. 
um, I, I think it's, yeah, you, you're building a stronger culture. I mean, an anecdote. So when we started, not Skype, but Kazaa before, it was 2000. Okay, that was like the dot-com crash. And we told ourselves, such a good timing to start now when there's very little money because we can build a really scrappy business. Think about if we had raised money before the crash, we would be fat. And, and so I think that's what we see today as well. There are certainly a lot of companies that raised too much money before the reset and without product market fit, without real revenues, those are the companies going to struggle. So I think it's better to start with less. For, we have a lot of investors in the room. Uh, how do you advise kind of younger investors who haven't lived through many cycles? Um, what should their investor psychology be? Yeah, so this reset, of course, it was a lot of value that disappeared from people's uh, um, P&Ls and, and balance sheets. But it's a really good lesson for not only investors, but also entrepreneurs. You know, if you look around the room here or in most VC firms, uh, probably the majority of investors didn't experience a downturn right. before. Yeah. So I think it's a really, really, really good lesson because we all got carried away. We thought that everything would just you know, go up to, to the right. You know, multiples was really, really high. So I think what we learn about this is about, you know, it takes a very long time to build companies. And you have to think that they will go through market cycles and, and that companies need to be able to have long term, some, whenever there's some kind of exit, that valuation is going to be normalized. Right. We have time for just one more question. So this is one that's been uh, on the minds of, of quite a few people that I've spoken to. You've had incredible success in your career with Kaza, Skype, and now Atomico. What still keeps you motivated and what drives you? I think we just got started to get going. Yeah, I know. So my mission and Atomico's mission is to help to build European tech. And why is that important? You know, because the future is about tech. You know, it's like maybe in 10, 20 years, we don't really talk about the tech sector because it's just new type of companies that are replacing the old. And it's really important for Europe as a region to be a participant on in the world of tech, right? And what we didn't have 20 years ago, we did not have an ecosystem. And I was fortunate not with, with Skype to, we had a big, first big global uh, company that become a multi-billion dollar exit. So I found myself in this really fortunate position to also to be a role model, also have the means to do something about it. And back then it was really Silicon Valley was the only place in the world. But there was no reason why we cannot build great companies all around the world, in particularly in Europe, because we have so many good ingredients. You know, we have four of the four top 10 technical universities, right. twice as many software developers as US. So that was my mission. And it was great to see now, like Europe as a tech ecosystem, we don't, you know, now we're scaling. You know, right. there's, there's more companies being started in Europe every year than the US. Oh. We're almost, on parity with US in terms of early stage funding. And conversion from seed to unicorn is the same in US as in Europe. So I think now we get it going. And I think it's really, really important to continue this journey. And because we're still, when it comes to helping companies to really scale, we're not there yet. So, and so that's one thing, just creating the scale, but also being part of shaping companies to be more ethical, more diverse, more inclusive. Right. It's also a really important mission. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Hello, everyone. Hey. Just a quick public safety announcement. Um, if you are having a conversation uh, in the main area, it would be super useful if you could maybe take that conversation down to the crypt, just for the, the noise levels at the moment on the stage for the speakers. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, Mickey, the co-founder co of Waltz, is unfortunately unable to be here with us today in London. We're obviously sad that he can't be here and he sends his apologies, but hopefully we will catch him at Unplugged 2024. So fingers crossed and uh, watch this space. 
Now, for everyone else in the audience born before the year 2000, you all know who you are. I'm sure you can join me in reminiscing a little about smashing keys into your Nokia phone, playing the iconic game Snake. Now, times change, and so do phones. And so while this was happening, a new generation of mobile games were being built. Much loved and equally iconic games like Clash of Clans, Clash Royale. And so I'm extremely excited to welcome Ilke Bananen, whose company Supercell built this next generation. Now, these addictive games catapulted Supercell into its position as one of the largest mobile games companies in the world. And I think we can all agree Supercell is seen as one of the great startup success stories in Europe and indeed globally. It's also a great pleasure to welcome Harry Stebbings to the stage, who will be leading this conversation with Ilka to talk about resilience and the origin story of Supercell. Now, obviously, Harry has an extremely successful career as a venture investor, but leaving that aside for a moment, I think it will be his podcasting career, a podcast that now has over 100 million downloads, viewers in over 120 countries, and interviews with some of the greatest founders and investors of our time, that will put him in very good stead to lead this conversation with Ilka. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please join me in giving a very round, warm of applause for Ilka and Harry. Thank you. Oh, well, this is exciting. It is exciting. Right. Okay, so we're going to dive straight in, Elka. You've said before that you are the least powerful CEO. Straight away, we know that you're not American. Um, but uh, tell me about the statement. Unpack it for me. Well, sometimes, to be honest, like uh, sometimes I wish I never had said it. Um, cause it <laughs> o o first of all, oftentimes um, it gets misunderstood. But, but first of all, it makes it sound like I have nothing to do, or you know, I actually don't do that, do that much. Um, but what I originally meant with that statement was that, uh, like, the, the, uh, the kind of heart of a supercell culture is this idea of these independent teams that we call cells, and that's where the name of the company comes from. And, and the whole thinking is that you know these cells are their own independent, you know, kind of companies within the greater company, and we give them like a complete kind of independence, but then also responsibility to build the games that they want to build. And, 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 you know, and, and, and they are completely independent. And, and the kind of thinking is that uh, when we can let these cells make all the decisions, first of all, because they don't need to get approval uh, from anybody from the higher ups, you know, these decisions get made very, very fast, which makes them execute faster. But second of all, because these decisions are made by the people who actually create the games, so these people obviously are the closest to the product and to the players, and therefore, that should increase the quality of these decisions. So, so the, our kind of thinking is that uh, you know, the more these cells make these decisions by themselves, the better. And in an ideal world, you know, they would make all the decisions, decisions, which means that I would make no decisions, which would then m make me, I guess, in, in a way, uh, the least powerful CEO. So that's where that sort of uh, thinking comes from. I think something I, I find hard personally, and I think many founders find hard, is actually kind of the emotional side of like looking after your team, but also guiding your team as, as a leader. My question to you is like, Doug Leone said before, Sequoia is a team, we are not a family. Are we teams or are we families? And how do you think about that balance? I think we are, uh, first and foremost, we are teams. Because if you think about a, and I'm a big sports fan. I oftentimes I, you know, I annoy the people at Supercell by co comparing our teams to, to you know, sports teams. And obviously, like the, the goal of a sports team is to a professional sports team is to win. That's the kind of ultimate goal. And the way you kind of want to get to that goal is that one, you need to get the best possible players. You know, you, you place them in, in the kind of positions where they can have the biggest impact, and you need to have this great team culture and all of those things. And, 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 you know, and, and sometimes you have to make tough calls, you know. Sometimes you need to fire people from your team just to make the team better. And obviously those type of things you don't do when you're your family. Cass, what do you think are the biggest mistakes that founders make in terms of team assembly and culture? When you look across the investments you have, the founders you mentor, what are the mistakes? Well, I think that one mistake that I've seen 
and I, I made myself also regarding culture is that it culture can be this kind of a warm, kind of fussy, fluffy thing that you sort of a uh, you know gets thrown uh, thrown around a lot and and but you know I, I think it's actually a very serious topic and and founders should spend a lot of time talking about you know not not just about like what type of products they want to build, but also what type of company they want to build. And then, you know, at the heart of that co uh, company building effort is the culture, ultimately, at least in, in, in my opinion. And so, you, one, you need to spend a lot of time on it. Um, and then the mistake that at least I did, and I, I see many people making, is that, you know, they can talk about the culture, but then they don't, like, define it, um, and, and, they, and uh, at least for us it took a long time to actually write it down, because it felt like this kind of big corporate thing to do and, and all that, but, uh, but you know, if you don't write it down, it's, especially as you scale, it becomes it harder to kind of communicate it, and also like written text has this advantage that it kind of forces discussion, and if somebody doesn't agree, like, you know, what, have you, what you have written down, you know, that's going to be a very healthy discussion about the, the culture. And then maybe the last last thing is that uh, you know oftentimes um, you know when you know there's a team member who actually doesn't fit the culture you know most people uh, or many people uh, and, and founders they maybe like shy away from having that difficult difficult conversation with, with that somebody because ultimately like if somebody isn't a fit uh, to the culture you know you somehow you that person has to exit the company and those can be like very difficult di discussions and, and decisions so. Um, so I, I, for me, like culture is, is a real thing, and you should take it very seriously. So I spoke to some of your investors before, and they said that I had to ask about the beer versus champagne culture at Supercell. What, what is the beer versus champagne culture that we have? Beer versus champagne. Um, well, that I don't know about, and, and you know, uh, I'm sure if it make, makes us sound like almost like alcoholics, but um, <laughs> but you know, the, the champagne culture, like where you know that comes from, is that uh, like back in the day when we kind of killed our first uh, game, and obviously it, it was a kind of a sad moment, and, and and then the kind of team like you know wanted to like talk to the rest of the company about like the lessons that they had learned through through that experience, and I thought that. Uh, you know, I, I sort of cheer up the, the meeting a little bit, and I, you know, I, and back then we were a much smaller company, just a few tens of people, and I thought that I would, you know, go and you know buy a few bottles of champagne, and you know, we so somehow like in a way celebrate this failure, and not maybe the failure, but but you know the learnings that would came from kind of that that failure, and then that thing started to live on, and it sort of became this kind of internal thing of ours. But the whole point is that, you know. Uh, you know, when you are in the games business, like, you know, it's, it, I guess it's quite similar to the venture capital businesses that, you know, they, the, you're successful only by, like, generating these, like, um, and creating these outlier successes. Sure. Uh, and, and, you know, you try many things, but then very, very few things actually work out. But then you want to take as much, much risk as possible because that's the only way those outlier uh, successes can even happen. And therefore, like, when you... Do a lot, take a lot of risk in an effort to create those outlier successes. It means that there's going to be lots and lots of failed games, and and you know therefore it's it's in our best interest as a company to encourage people to take risks. Uh, but that means a lot of failure. So so therefore it makes sense to make the failure be as safe as possible. Because if people start to be afraid of failing, you know they will kind of start to play it safe, and then I don't think those outlier successes would happen. So how do you sustain that morale when we have multiple failures in a row? I mean, you had three at the start. Or if you're a venture firm, if you know, it's, uh, liquidity is you know, few and far between now, um, if you have a long period without massive hits, without IPOs, how do you sustain morale in the periods between the hits? Well, first of all, like, uh, you need to have the right type of people. You want to have the people who actually thrive on that, that kind of a challenge, and they are... Uh, and, and they and it, it's it's you know you know this this joke that you know I'm sure when you can, when you talk to a, like a room of entrepreneurs and they say there's like a, you know 20 entrepreneurs and you tell them that, that you guys realize that only one of you 20 will be successful and then everybody is like sorry for all the other entrepreneurs because they think they will be the one and it's a little bit the same thing in in the games and game teams so. You, you almost like you have to live in this kind of a bubble of, of your own that, okay, like, of course my game is going to be the next uh, multi-billion dollar hit game. And I'm kind of sorry for everybody else. I'm sorry that you guys probably won't make it, but we will. 
And it's, and, and, but you need to have those type of people who are kind of crazy entrepreneurial game developers and creative people in your team. That's the most important thing. And then the other thing is what I just said. You, know, you never, ever punish people for failures or making mistakes. Because in fact, you almost want to encourage them to do that. Because, uh, you know, because that's, that's where we're gonna, the biggest successes will come like, uh, ultimately from them. People take huge amount of risks. Uh, and and you know, one of those days when we kind of get lucky, uh, it will become a, a, a big success. OK, I think that actually kind of companies are defined by a few moments, the best, the worst, and those decisions are made large part by you. When you reflect on the Supercell journey, what do you think is the best decision that you've made, and how did you learn from that? Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure like, what the, is, if there's been like, a single sort of best decision, but. Uh, but some of the great decisions that we've made you know, have actually had one thing in common, and that one thing is that they've been very hard decisions. So either you know, they've involved in or they have, have had something to do with like, you know, increasing the focus, like you know, starting to like, kill initiatives or kill other projects, getting more focused, or even doing a pivot um, to something else, or you know, changing fundamentally how we can think about things. And you know, change can be very hard, especially when you've been sort of successful uh, before. Um, so those type of things, you know, uh, unfortunately, of course, like letting letting go people and, and those type of things. But I think oftentimes the hardest decisions have also been the best ones. How do how do you approach them? Do you talk to your wife? Do you talk to your team? Like, what's your process for making those really hard decisions when you know that those are the big decisions? Um, well, I, I try to actually talk to quite a few people, and, and I, I try to be actually very open about it and very honest with, with our people. Do you talk to your team about them? Yeah, I mean, for sure. Uh, and, and, you know, before making any, any kind of uh, decisions, uh, you know, I, I, I talk to, like, a, a, either a, a smaller group of people, but oftentimes, you know, a very large group of people. And we still try to do that. So these days we are... Uh, I, I guess like uh, roughly uh, 500 people. So of course you can't, you possibly can't talk to everybody, but but you want to talk to like the some some key people for sure. If there's commonalities in terms of the best decisions are hard, if I were to say, hey, can you choose your worst decision that you made? It could be a game that you released. It could be a market entry that you did. What was the worst decision that you made, and how did that impact your mindset? I, I think um, the, the kind of worst decisions that we've made or are oftentimes, you know, things that, you know, are actually decision, decisions we haven't made. And, and oftentimes they have something to do with the kind of past successes. So I think in many ways, like, uh, we've also, like, you know, had these moments where I think we've been very close to, like, uh, being uh, victims of our past successes. And, you know, and what I hadn't realized you know, before was that, you know, since we have been obviously super, super lucky and, and you've had these amazing successes, like, you know, something like, uh, you know, uh, Clash of Clans has done way more than $10 billion, like, during its lifetime, and we've been lucky to release, like, five of these, you know, multi-billion dollar games, etc. So what happens, like, when you get these successes is, is that, um, you know, you, you start to, like, very easily look in the rear view mirror. You start to look, think and, like, okay, we should actually repeat the things that have made us successful rather than looking forward and, and, and having this curious and open mind. And, and, you know, and what I've learned from that is that, you know, actually, I don't think, at least in our business, the hardest thing is not to like, uh, create success. The, the hardest thing is actually to repeat success. And, and, um, uh, and, and you know, like, uh, uh, it, uh, just a very concrete example. So, like, for example, I just spoke about our kind of the cell culture and cell model. And for years and years, we were so proud that how small our teams are. And we felt that that was like at the very core of supercell culture. But then, if I'm honest, like, you know, that culture like, hasn't served us well, especially in these live games, because the reality is that if you want to produce more content and do better games for your players, like in, in this time and age, you know, it requires a way bigger team. And it took us years to kind of realize that. And it's a great example of like, you know, something that, you know, you know, kind of made you, you great isn't necessarily that same something won't, you know, uh, make you great in, in the future. Can I ask you, you mentioned going kind of that to 
teams and kind of trust as well. You mentioned the cells earlier. How do you think about trusting teams to make decisions independently? If you sit at the top of CEO making the good, the bad decisions, what does that reporting structure look like in terms of the cells and how they make decisions and how they flow back to you? Well, for me, like, um I mean, trust is, is sort of a kind of glue that keeps all the company together. And, you know, we have very little process and, and you know, relatively like, uh, you know, uh, kind of flat hierarchy. Um, so, I mean, trust is essential for us. And that, as, as I said, it, it's kind of the lifeblood of, of Supercell. And for me, you know, trust is binary. Like, either I trust a team or a person 100% or when I don't trust that team and, and person. And, and, you know, as long as I trust the team, and, and especially the lead of that team, you know, then uh, those people, like, should make the calls. And, and, but if I, but then, on the other hand, like, if, if, if at some point I lose the trust, you know, then, you know, our approach is never that, okay, we will go and tell that team what to do, then that team just shouldn't exist at Supercell. Is it possible to regain trust? I, I think it is. Uh, you know, like uh, we've had a number of cases where, for example, we have a team and, and it isn't like performing that well, but then they do, as, as sports teams do, we do some changes to the team composition, like maybe like the lead of a team changes or, or some other changes. And yes, I mean, you know, then we give them a kind of fresh start. I think we should talk about Europe as well, given we're obviously in London and given the context. So when we think about Europe, We've both been to so many events where it's like, now's the time for Europe. I mean, I've been in this for nine years. You've been in it for you know, a little bit longer. Is now the time for Europe? If so, why now? And are we just kind of saying the same thing again? Well, I'm, uh, I absolutely believe that now is the time for Europe. And, and the way I think about it is that if I, I mean, if I compare now to the time when we founded Supercell, it was more than 13 years ago, like, you know, when we founded Supercell and, you know, very practically speaking, like how many VCs there in Europe who I could like realistically go and, and speak to about raising a large sort of seed round or large series A round for a gaming company from Europe. I mean, not that many. Um, how many people there were who got uh, other like fellow founders, entrepreneurs who got call for an advice, you know, like a little bit later on that, how do you actually like build this like multi-billion dollar company and, and you, how do you gonna get to scale? Like how many, how many entrepreneurs from Europe there were like in, in those times? And again, not many, like, well, one of them was just here on the stage, Niklas, who, who I did call and, and was lucky enough also to have as our investor. But, but there was a very like limited number of people. And then if I compare that to like where we are now, I mean, there's like so many uh, great VCs, you can like get funding from, you know, there's so many great founders and, you know, who built, like companies at scale from Europe uh, and, and, you know, like, an, like a, and, and who are very happy to kind of give you advice and, and many of them invest to these companies, including myself. And, and, uh, and so I think it, it's, it's, it's way different. How do you think about founder-led funding? And what I mean by that is you and, you know, there's a cohort of European powerhouses who are investing heavily. How do we think about the next five years in terms of European powerhouse founders? and their role in the funding ecosystem? I think it's extremely important. Uh, and um, so the way, the way I think about it is that, you know, I mean, <laughs> first of all, like, uh, maybe it's obvious to everybody, but that at least I, I feel very, very passionate about creating or trying to help create the kind of next wave of like extremely valuable tech companies that come from Europe. I I'm, I'm feel very passionate about European entrepreneurship as a whole, and I think it's incredibly important for our part of the world and and you know and i think we, we kind of the european founders with experience and then with capital uh, i mean the, uh, i think they play a crucial role in that and i i almost would say it's it's our responsibility to invest in sort of the next wave of founders and i and you know and actually the good news is that i think it's happening all over and like on my part i've been you know working with guys like obviously mickey who isn't here but they've you know, Robert Gens, who's the founder of Zalando, and actually Eleanor, who was just here uh, on the stage, and many others, and they we can invest it together to companies. And, 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 you know, and not only do we provide the capital, but we also like provide the kind of a, 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 sort of our expertise, obviously, and we can, I think we can help them solve very practical 
practical problems as, as kind of fellow entrepreneurs. And I think, you know, if we kind of all the European founders sort of like in a way like unite and help each other out, you know, that's the way we'll, we'll build those like, uh, you know, $100 billion and, 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 be, and more valuable companies which actually come from Europe. I had a guest on the show the other day and they said, America innovates, China replicates and Europe regulates. And I was in the gym this morning and I saw this Brussels conference and it said uh, Brussels regulating the world. And I just want to hear, how do you think about actually regulation being a preventative barrier for Europe, which it seems much of the world think it is? Is that a fair summarization? Well, I, I, I certainly do worry about it and, and you know, and again, but I would also like put, put also some responsibility in, the, in us as, as sort of entrepreneurs and European founders is that we probably should do even more to like use our influence to like make, you know, make the environment and better and make Europe the world's best place for, for you know, tech companies and, and, and startups. But I, I think it's a real risk and I think, it, you know, some of that has been like talked about even, even today here on, on the stage. What would you like to see change if we can do something to be better? like proactive, what can we do to be better as an ecosystem, Europe moving forward in the next one to two years? Well, lo lots of people say that one of the disadvantages of, of Europe is that they are such a kind of fragmented yeah. kind of ecosystem. But I would almost say that, hey, uh, in the spirit of what uh, Polly and, and, uh, and Robert said in their opening words, I mean, let's turn that disadvantage to an advantage. I mean, I mean nothing prevents us as, as kind of European founders and and investors to kind of like, like work way closer together. And, you know, and, and I think lots of great things are happening, like including this event, like where we kind of bring this community together and let's just get better, like uh, somehow like, you know, working together as a community. And, and, like, and I've been lucky enough to be part of like many great communities, but one of the, probably one of the best communities I am part of is actually the, the, the Finnish startup and, and sort of the games community. And, and I think what m makes that community fantastic is that, you know, nobody thinks about the other companies as like their competitors, rather like we, we and here we come to your uh, analogy about family, we actually do think about us as a kind of family, it's a very big family these days, but, but you know, we fundamentally share this belief that this, if one company is successful, you know, it, it, it will benefit everybody in the community, and hopefully we could get the, even more that type of thinking to the European, like, uh, tech ecosystem. And you, you said there about family. I want to move into a quick fire round, but you've got three children. You can call yourself up the night before your first child and you can say, Ilka, you should know dot, dot, dot. What would you tell yourself? Good question. Um, well, obviously, like uh, we've heard here like uh, today, like how important it is to be like very I guess like uh, decisive and obsessive and about your company, etc. But you know, my advice would be that you know, I mean, spend as much time with your kids also as, as possible. Like you know, you know, don't, you know, that that's still I, I think that's still ultimately is the most important thing. You can have dinner with anyone, dead or alive, and you get to spend the evening asking them questions. Who would you spend the evening with asking questions? I would uh, spend time actually with my uh, my grandfather, who actually unfortunately passed away, like you know, uh, right before I was born. So I never met the met the guy. I heard great things and love to spend spend time and ask questions. You can be CEO of any other company for a day. Which company would you be CEO of? Nintendo. Why? I love their games. Uh, you know, I've uh, grew up playing their games. I still play their games together with my kids. You know. Uh, Whenever somebody says Nintendo or mentions one of their games, you know, people smile and, you know, I'd love, and, you know, my biggest dream with Supercell is that one day we'd love to be, you know, uh, you know, do, be able to do the same thing. And, and the other thing is that they, Nintendo is more than 100 years old, an entertainment company. So, you know, uh, and, you know, uh, from my point of view, like, that's a, like, a, I know it's an extremely bold dream and it's very, very early for us, but, you know, that's the kind of uh, inspiration for us. Does money make you happy? No. Why? 
I don't know, like, why, why would it? I, I think there are way more important things in, in life, you know, family, kids, friends, you know, all these great things that you can do actually, that actually don't require that much money. Do you appreciate the freedom that money gives you? I do, I do. Yeah, okay. Um, what would you change about the world of venture capital? Uh, I'd love it to be even, to think it, I love the world of venture capital to think even more long term. Do you think we don't today, as a VC giving feedback, do you think we don't think long enough term today? Uh, I'm sorry? Do you think we think too short term today? Well, I, I think some do. Uh, and and I, I think, you know, like uh, we, we should rather than think, to think of, and I know it comes from kind of w w the way that these funds are structured, but sometimes you'd think that, you know, we could be able to think in, in, in decades, not just in, in years. What's the next five to ten years for you and Supercell? In five to ten years, if we have this conversation again, where's Ilka and Supercell then? Well, hopefully we would be a few steps closer to that big dream that I just spoke about. You know, we are trying to, you know, uh, build this company which, uh, you know, would have a, you know, uh, hundreds, if if not a billion, billion players. You know, and 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 you know these global games that are played all around the world. Uh, you know, and and you know that just make people people happy and uh, and again like you know in our business the the kind of hardest thing is not to like you know create success but but the hardest thing is to repeat success and build this like enduring company that would last for decades and and hopefully in the best case for more than a hundred years so hopefully in five years when we have this conversation to feel that we are a few steps closer to that uh, bold dream Ilka thank you so much for doing this I've so enjoyed it and it's been great to have you in London thank you so much Harry <laughs> Well done. Hello again, everyone. Um, at Visionaries, we love to connect the dots, and it's so great to see so many of you here today who are really vitally important to that mission. Um, we wanted to actually give you a proper networking break to, to go and connect the dots. So we're going to give you a short 15-minute break. Um, feel free to grab a refreshment, grab a drink, grab someone to connect and reconnect with. And uh, we'll be back here in 15 minutes with our regular programming. Um, for those of you wondering how you'll know when that is, just listen out for the large gong. Um, so yeah, have fun, everybody.
describing visionaries in three words? I would say entrepreneurial, authentic, and connected. Smart, pragmatic, and of course, visionary. And we're just getting started. And the community that visionaries managed to build is really impressive. The visionaries is really kind of the most ambitious, one of the smartest, and also one of the most aggressive ones. And that's why we just love working together as we share those values. Visionaries has a really cool USP in terms of bringing old economy and new economy founders together in a really strong LP network. That's really a bridge which is easy to be crossed and they kind of build it. We had heard um, a lot uh, and like positive things about Visionaries as investor. And of course there's a great network of operators and companies behind the Visionaries set up. That's the kind of the mission that can be spread uh, across the broader community. I really liked the team. I thought that they were people that I could trust and really work with for a very long time through the ups and downs. High conviction, very decisive, something that um, I thought we could really benefit from. To execute, keep on trying. There is so much opportunity. Europe is a, a, a super large market. You can do anything you want. One of my favorite moments with Virginius was uh, the ski trip in Austria last winter, where we got together with a whole bunch of founders and entrepreneurs from the entire ecosystem and just really had a, had a great time together. It will make the entrepreneurs' likelihood of success a lot greater. Visionaries understood our product, our user, our industry very well from, 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 from the beginnings and are looking forward for, for what's to come. It's, it's casual, and uh, casual is much better than more formal. So. Okay, so my most favorite moment is probably not a very fun or happy one, but when the SVB crisis hit us, I thought that Rob and his team were um, the most proactive, pragmatic, and creative in trying to help us get through it. And so I look back at that moment with a lot of gratitude. And we're just getting started. Let's come there. All right. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, with that, we are slowly going to wrap up our networking session. And thank you so much for coming and joining us for Unplugged. I, with Visionaries Club, it's always a very special time of the year and day for us because uh, yeah, we have this unique opportunity to bring together some of the most exceptional founders and uh, investors and friends in one place and you know, listen to the stories of each other. And uh, yeah, in the following session, actually, um, under the title Leading the Charge in Fintech and Business Planning, um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to some of our very own Visionaries portfolio founders who will share their stories and tell you about how they are transforming entire verticals in fintech, procurement, and compliance. Um, yeah. And first of all, I'm excited to welcome our first founder on stage, uh, Bogdan from Apron. And uh, yeah, a few thoughts on that. So we are actually at Visionaries very strong believers um, in the transformation happening around B2B payments. And specifically, if you think about full small businesses who kind of form the backbone of our economy, uh, they are the ones that are being weighed down by very cumbersome processes. And essentially, Apron radically changes the way those small businesses handle payments and using the platform customers can just pay and reconcile um, invoices within a matter of seconds. So yeah, handing over to Bob Dan to tell you more about what they are building. Thanks, Martin. Is that the pointer? Yeah, that's the pointer. <laughs> I'm just going to click through to our slides. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Bogdan. I'm uh, the founder of Apron. 
And I want you to meet Sam as well. Sam is also an entrepreneur, and she runs a uh, hotel and a pub in Devon. Uh, Sam is also an apron user. So what's interesting about Sam is that she logged in on Sunday and paid 300 bills in 15 minutes in apron. And why this is cool? This is cool because this was her old kind of life before apron. Typical bill payments process, manual, disintegrated. Before apron, this would take her half a day every Sunday. Well, good news is we fixed it, and this is the volume we're going after in the UK alone. So that's apron. Thank you. Give it to you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Bogdan. Um, yeah, next up on the stage is actually Fra from uh, Trulia, and I'll just give you the pointer. And yeah, on the note of you know payments, open banking as a, as a thesis for us is you know something that is we really believe that it's fundamentally revolutionising the entire fire financial landscape. And you know by allowing banks to contact the third parties with secure APIs, you just bring a lot of transparency and uh, into the market and allow customers to fully have you know, control over the finances. And yeah, we really believe that Trulio is one of the key leaders charging that transformation. So Frank can tell you a little bit about that. Hi, everyone. Thanks for um, you know, inviting me here today. And, and I think like Visionary is putting together something really amazing today. So thanks, thanks so much. Um, my name is Francesco. I'm the CEO and co-founder of TrueLayer. We are a payments network built on top of a technology called open banking. So in a nutshell, we are trying to do the job of Visa and MasterCard, but based on entirely new rail. So to give you a little bit of a sense of scale, uh, we process about $40 billion worth of transaction on an annualized base. We are responsible uh, of about 35, 40% of the entire volume of open banking, think, think like market share in the UK. Um, and we serve thousands of developers, small companies, but also more than 350 um, enterprise companies. Um, and, and some are, are, are there on screen. And, and also, like talking about resilience, uh, we, we are baked by uh, an amazing group of investors. And I think, like in this climate, uh, I, I have to say I'm extremely proud of the relationship and the, and the you know, um, kind of names that we managed to work with and the partnership we created uh, along with visionaries, uh, of course. So um, we, we, we started like um, in, a, in an, I would say, with a slightly different take. Uh, initially, myself and, uh, and Luca, my co-founder, we were in San Francisco. And, and we really liked this idea of banks building APIs, and there was a regulatory change happening in Europe. And so in 2016, we presented that, uh, that slides there to Connect Ventures, uh, highlighting this, this idea of how do we connect all those different APIs, all those different banks together? Uh, how, is, how are developers going to uh, access this underlying infrastructure? And, and over time, over, over the years, we started to pick different use cases and understand what were the capabilities of this whole new modern infrastructure that were created. And it's around 2019 that we really stumbled upon these payment use cases. We, we put out what, what we called back then our payments API, and that kind of like took off pretty rapidly. And so we started to compound users, compound uh, volume of transactions. And so it, it kind of brought us to where we are today that is um, trying to reimagine the uh, world of uh, payments and, and the financial systems through the lens of this new technology. And so to, to try to bring things a little bit alive, also my mom never understand what I do, so uh, I'm trying to simplify for, for all of you here today. This is a little, little video, little demo. So imagine you are on a, on a marketplace or a, on an e-commerce website. And, and you want to purchase it like a good, you have um, different payment options. One of those is this one, uh, instant bank payments. So you click on that, and then you select your bank. In this example, for instance, Revolut, which is a very valid partner. And, and then you get moved into the uh, Revolut app, and you address the payment, you do face ID, and the payment is done. No 16 digits. No second factor authentication on, I don't know, SMS on your phone. 
Uh, and for the merchant, that was a real-time transaction. So no chargebacks and, and a lot of other uh, positive things. And this is really the value proposition that we are bringing to market. Um, we, we know that we are very early in our journey, but our ambition is to really take on some of the largest monopolies in the world and reshape, reimagine um, some of the value proposition for all the different constituencies of this ecosystem. For merchant being cheaper, faster, better, uh, you're converting for consumers safer and, and a smoother journey. And even for banks now, it's becoming really a way to increase revenues, to be more relevant into the digital landscape and, and, and compete against some of the largest companies in the space. Um, I often get asked, okay, what's next? Um, I think what's next is always like the next vertical, the next um, segment of the e-commerce that we are trying to go after. Uh, we are trying to build something that is extremely ubiquitous and, and, and horizontal, and so we are relentlessly going after country after country and, 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 and segment after segment. So this year, big, big focus over e-commerce and, and also over international expansion. And thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Fran. Um, yeah, our next company is actually Tacto. So staying very close to B2B transactions from that, what's matter? Um, actually, we are going to speak about procurement. And procurement and B2B transactions are a very important part of procurement. So procurement essentially is the, is the function of um, sourcing and purchasing. So it can be anything literally in B2B from buying toilet papers up to procuring industrial goods for your assembly line. And um, yeah, interestingly enough, it's an incredibly outdated um, vertical. And uh, many companies, especially SMEs, completely lack the tooling and the data intelligence uh, to understand what's going on in your supply chain, right? So we saw things happening like the war in Ukraine and uh, the COVID disruption. And um, many, many companies have no clue what's going mm -hmm. on in their supply chain. And they have no idea how to mitigate the risks that are associated with those things. So essentially, Tacto is kind of building an operating system for these SMEs. So in an AI-enabled um, platform, they give full transparency and overview. Uh, and they require the insights to mitigate those risks in their supply chains. And um, yeah, Andre couldn't make it in person today. So we're going to go and tune in virtually um, and listen to him. Uh, yeah, there. Hi, I'm Andre. I'm one of the co-founders of Tacto. And first of all, thank you so much to the whole Visionaries team for inviting me to Visionaries Unplugged today. Unfortunately, I can't be there in person, but I'm still super grateful to have the opportunity to present Tacto to you today. With Tacto, we build future-proof supply chains. So we work with the backbone of Europe, mid-sized industrials. Therefore, we fit quite well into the Visionaries portfolio. Because our customers manufacture the physical world. That means everything from washing detergents over food, snacks, um, to medical technology, lighting, and tunnel drilling machines. So in total, these companies, we're talking about over 50K mid-sized industrials in Europe here, not yet our customers, but hopefully soon, um, they make up over 4 trillion euro in GDP in Europe alone. And when you manufacture physical goods, so the average industrial, um, about 50% of all your revenues are spent procuring material. That means we're talking about 2 trillion euro in procurement volume in these mid-sized industrials in Europe. And in the past, these companies focused mainly on the 50% of internal value creations. That means, for example, optimizing your production process to produce more goods. But now the times have changed. So the supply chains got so much under pressure in the last years that the companies really need to do something there and get them under control. You had several, several disruptions such as wars, uh, pandemic um, and so on um, that put them under pressure. You have now a lot of regulations such as the European Supply Chain Act and you of course have sustainability. So these companies really need to look at how they procure these tens of thousands of materials with thousands of suppliers from thousands of suppliers all over the world to optimize this 50% of external value creation. And that's what we do with Tacto. We help our customers build future-proof supply chains. For us, that means digital, efficient, and sustainably. 
That means we help them to digitally procure material at optimal conditions. We help them to efficiently master regulation without effort. And um, when we can be sure of one thing, that um, is that there will be more regulation in the, in the European Union. Um, so we help them with that. And of course, we help them to sustainably reduce risks and emissions. So our system, Tacto, is the one face to the supplier for these companies. So all supplier workforce, all supplier data is in our system and we help them to optimize their supply chains. How does it look like? I will show you in a short demo. Here you see uh, an individual supplier profile in Tacto. You have all necessary information in place, such as all contracts, all open requests, RFX processes, contacts, and of course, a timeline of all your historic activities, emails, tasks, and so on. I think you got the concept. But you can also dig deep down into your article base. So you see all the articles the supplier is delivering, the price points, and you get a very transparent overview about the price development. So how different cost components are developing, for example, like energy, raw materials, and so on. Because right now it's completely intransparent to you. For example, when the supplier requests a higher price increase, you don't have the basis to really react to that. Now you can negotiate here with like a transparent overview and you can maybe save a euro, which is a euro in profit for these companies. But you can also move away from the individual supplier profile more towards looking at your whole supply chain and supplier base. So this is, for example, the module we developed for the European Supply Chain Act. And here you can assess all the risks that you have in your supply chain. So with that, you can efficiently comply to the regulation, but also you can look at ecological risks. So for example, huge CO2 risks that you have in your supply chain and can initiate measures based on that and transform your supplier base sustainably. So with that, I think you got a short glimpse of what we're doing and how we help our customers build future-proof supply chains. So we really want to work with the European backbone, all these industrials, to transform their supply chains and help them procure material at optimal conditions with our software. And thereby, we want to be the leading procurement solution for mid-cap industrials in Europe, probably one of the largest untapped markets. So if you want to be part of that journey, help us, um, build future-proof supply chains. Let's talk. And I wish you a great event. Bye-bye. Excellent. Thank you so much, Andre. Um, next up is actually Sven, founder of Secure. And uh, we are going from procurement to compliance. And yeah, it's actually the problem with compliance is that it's incredibly tedious, complex, and requires a lot of manual labor and um, and yeah, fees spent on consultants. And essentially, that's where Secure comes in, because they're building a platform that completely automates um, anything required around compliance and uh, anything associated with data privacy and information security, and uh, therefore really, really uh, save a lot of resources and time uh, for the businesses that better be doing their own core business. So uh, yeah, handing over to Sven. Hello, everyone. Hi. Talking about compliance is actually like asking people how much they enjoy their dentist appointment. Like, you have to do it, there's a necessity to do it, but if you take longer, <laughs> the pain gets even worse. So you're doing it, but involuntarily. So every role in a company that's exposed to compliance in the first place always also lacks the capacity to execute compliance. So, and that makes them vulnerable to a very old business model. And that business model is, if you're paid by the hour, take your time. So everyone grinning right now, I know you guys, you are legal advisors or IT advisors because you make a living out of that. Um, but hold short a moment, because the issue on compliance is you have to do 80% of the work up front to get the first 20% of results. And only the very last steps of the 20% of work gives you actually the 80% of results. Because compliance frameworks always work the same way. You have to analyze the company first, then you're generating the data points and content, then you're analyzing that content, and at the very end you can design risk models, monitoring, real-time suggestions. And that is actually the issue in the end. We at Secure, we turn that thing around. So we are paid by the results, so we have to cut out the hours and replace them with automation. 
this automation actually enables the client to get quicker to the results in their compliance spaces. So the compliance spaces for us are the four major topics any company is facing at the moment. So we are covering data protection, information security, whistleblowing, and anti-money laundering. So in each of these spaces, our clients can start to either in information security, get a certification they need for new business that has to be attracted. They are going to a European market, they have to be GDPR compliant. And all these spaces we cover on the very same platform. So that SaaS platform we call the Digital Compliance Office. So a company can subscribe to one module, for example, data protection, and they start to execute that compliance. We go that far that even the authorities accept us as the appointed data protection officer, even though we are covering it with the platform. When the company has finished being compliant with data protection, they can move on in their journey because we know after that to generate new business, they have to get an ISO certification. So they take over all the efforts and all the insights on the platform by a click. They add the new module and they can start like their ISO certification or SOC 2, which helps them to generate new business. If you are an SME company that's 20 years old with legacy, we automate the audits, so you can start right away. If you are a scale-up or a grow-up, you can connect your tech stack and integrations, and we generate every document, the policies, and everything we need out of that. And you save most of the time that usually you get advisory upon. And that's the whole purpose of the platform. So it's the speed and the accuracy that we are doing with that. We go even further. So you can do anti-money laundering, whistleblowing, and we also cover the supply chains of our customers. So with the supply chain monitoring, this doesn't hold back just to a monitor for child labor or in-compliant supply chain. We also roll out on the suppliers of a company the other modules. So you can see if your suppliers are GDPR compliant, if their ISO certification is on track. So you can monitor down your supply chain and you can use the platform to report up to your tier one customer you have. Even further, um, this can also be used from PEs to monitor their portfolio and from enterprises to monitor all the subsidiaries they have to. So you can imagine if you're an enterprise, you have 20 subsidiaries, you can monitor all the information security, their status, the trainings, and the GDPR of all your subsidiaries. So this is also the space we are going to, and we are doing this for five years now. So we started in 2018, which was like the peak point of GDPR by coincidence, and this is how we started. And from that journey, we took some learnings by going there. And the main learnings I would show you um, that we took over the last couple of years is, first of all, the expert dilemma. So it's necessary for us to have experts in our company because they generate the content. But experts tend to build silo solutions and expert solutions, not customer-friendly solutions. Everyone who is using our platform can roll it out in the company and doesn't need experts. So we had to train all our experts to think like product people and engineers and always focus on the end result, what they have to use. We are five years in business. The next learning was it's a marathon, so everyone in the company has to get used to that the company is changing every 12 months. The third item is like a very, very mean truth, because if you have a performance culture, the new work culture doesn't fit to it that, to that extent. So if you're scaling up and all your employees are working remotely, you have such an extensive way of additional uh, work to onboard them when you just rule it out of the box. The fourth item is not just in compliance, that the decision makers who's buying the, the platform is not necessarily the users. So you always have to separate from the users and from the procurement officer, for example, and those actually need storytelling. They need to understand on a high level what's the benefit from the platform they are procuring, and that doesn't just include features or very nitty-gritty stuff. And the fifth and large is actually the reason why I'm sitting here. So we are four co-founders on the company, I joined in later. I joined in two and a half years ago. And we are always very really determined on our founders team that we use our profiles efficiently for the roles we have to execute at the moment. So I started in the company as the CTO. 
And now I'm the CEO taking over that role, and everyone from the leadership team, we know our psychological profiles, we know what our like, flaws in communication are, and we really let the company run over our egos. And that was actually the key, how to get two lawyers, a sales guy and an IT guy run a company without running mad all the time. So thank you. Thank you, Sven. Um, and finally, please welcome Phil from uh, Yokoi. And we're going to talk about expense management very similarly to compliance. It can get very tedious, complex, costly, clunky, and really time and resource intensive. And um, essentially, what, what you can also imagine is that the higher you go up market, the more legacy stack you also need to deal with. And integration with that is incredibly difficult. And uh, Essentially, Yoko is a company that builds, especially that orchestration solution, deeply integrating with that legacy stack and therefore automating the massive part of that um, expense management and therefore aiming to become the ultimate single layer financial operation system for SMEs and really excited to be backers of the company and handing over to Phil. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, most people don't get excited when they hear expense management, because they just know those, you know, those receipts that you need to collect and then bring to your finance team or to your manager. And uh, what a lot of people don't know is that the process actually just starts when an employee submits such a receipt. There's a lot that's actually following after that. And when you look at what it costs to just process one single invoice or one single receipt, it's $60 just processing cost for a mid-sized or bigger organization. And that's just, as Bogdan said as well, um, such a receipt needs to get somehow into the computer. It needs to get checked against policies. It needs to get through certain approval flows that differ based on location, based on rank, it also needs to find its way somehow into the finance department where VAT is extracted. It needs to get archived. It needs to get booked. There's a whole lot of things that need to happen just with one single somewhat boring receipt. And that's why we have leveraged artificial intelligence for exactly that use case with Yokoi. So we're not doing expense management only. We have combined the full spend management spectrum, which is expense management, invoice processing, and card payments, because all of them, it's all accounts payable. I'm an accountant, so uh, from an accounting side, it flows into the finance tool in basically pretty much the same booking order. And uh, for Yokoi, we are one platform, I put all the buzzwords in here that I could, all in one, we are end-to-end, uh, -end, and uh, we have AI as well. <laughs> so investors love that. <laughs> no, it, it, it's truly, we want to have one single platform. We want to break down the silos of expense management, invoice processing, and card payment, because why should anyone in an organization care whether they are approving an expense, an invoice, or a card payment, uh, it doesn't, they should have one app. It should be one platform, because you want to have all your cost data in one single platform, knowing exactly how your cost, how your expenses are flowing. And also, you want to maintain as few systems as possible. So connecting Yokoi typically to an SAP or to an Oracle, where all the booking, archiving, payout, and all of that at the end happens. Um, artificial intelligence is important for us because if you look at how stuff like expenses and invoices were processed in the past, it was mainly by either rule-based engines or it was by humans looking at those receipts. And imagine if you have to look and type those receipts in every single day or look for outliers, you do soon realize that with artificial intelligence, you get quite an advantage because you get the data needed. There's actually 300 data points we can extract from one single receipt. And based on that, we can already do a lot in order for the approval flow to get to a minimum. The goal is always 
out of 100 expenses or invoices that only one or two actually need a physical, a, a, a human to look at. These are the outliers, the exceptions, but all the others, all the ones that are fully compliant, low risk profile, within policy, or and a supplier you have already paid, you want them to be processed through fully automatically from the receipt, from the invoice, from the payment, all the way to the correct booking at the end in your Oracle SAP, whatever it is. So that's, that's what we're up to at Yokoi. We are specialized in mid-sized organizations. Uh, we don't do smaller organizations because our AI core or a our AI is core to what we're doing. We need certain data. We have a research lab back in Zurich, uh, where our headquarters is, Switzerland, where in our research lab, we only research on making the algorithms better because every single customer of ours gets its own AI model, which learns on their data and gets better over time. So we want to make expense management, invoice management, and card payments not only better, faster, and cheaper, we really want to make sure that we're building the software of the future and our customers get the best tool possible, streamlined in one platform, not only now, but also in the future. So if you know anyone, please hit me up. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, and with that, we'd actually, we would like to wrap up our session. Thank you so much for our portfolio founders for sharing their stories. And I think if you look at one big overarching theme is that, and why we love B2B software so much, actually, is that um, we believe that in the, in the value chain, if you look at it, there is no economic reason for anything not to be digitized in the coming decades if you can streamline it and automate it and make it more efficient. And all the companies that we are working with are exactly going into that direction. So incredibly um, happy to be able to work with them. And um, yeah, with that, um, we will wrap this session up and we will be back soon. Thanks so much. Cool. Thank you. So the next two speakers today, like so many of today's guests, need no introduction. But regardless, um, I'm going to give it a go. We originally planned to do this session live, but unfortunately, due to some last minute changes, we're no longer able to do that. Thankfully, both of our speakers did everything they could to make sure we could have this session. So they hopped on a Zoom, made a recording, and you're about to see that now. It's a pleasure to welcome Harry back, at least virtually, for this session. Given his stellar performance earlier today, I think we can all agree we're in a pretty safe pair of hands. He will be speaking with an individual who has built, arguably, one of the most iconic software companies the world has ever seen. Not only do Salesforce's buildings dominate skylines across the world, towering over their peers, we think this is a pretty apt metaphor for the company that Mark Benioff has built, the world's largest enterprise software company that ushered in the era of the cloud and changed the world of software as we knew it. Given the enormous success of Salesforce and his enormous success as a leader and CEO, having been named many times by his peers a great leader of his time, we're extremely grateful for him being part of this unplugged conversation. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome virtually Mark Benioff and Harry Stebbings. So Mark, I have been looking forward to this one for a long, long time. First, thank you so much for joining me today. It's always great to see you, Harry. Thanks for having me on your show. Not at all. I'm very much looking forward to this. I want to start. We had Dreamforce last week. I want to start with a broad question, but tell me about your vision for AI. How do you see AI moving forward from here, from this point forward? Well, I mean, we're going through an unbelievably great and exciting time for AI. And I have to be honest with you, I thought this moment was going to happen about 10 years ago. I had a bit of an existential freak out myself at that moment. 
and ended up making a lot of major investments for Salesforce in AI, building our teams, acquiring a number of exciting companies. And then we um, built our Einstein platform. And that's kind of how we became the number one enterprise AI today. We're moving, obviously, and everyone knows, the new version of AI, which is beyond predictive into, into generative. And then we've got another big wave coming very, very close, which is going to be autonomous and agents. And then, of course, we'll get to AGI. And I think that these four waves are all happening in a way simultaneously. Um, in a way that I think far exceeds my expectation. When you sit in the Salesforce boardroom, what are the reasons that Salesforce wouldn't win the next five to 10 years for AI? What are the hurdles you have to overcome? Well, we are in a remarkably good position. Number one, because we're in San Francisco, which is the number one AI city in the world. That's where all the talent is and all the great startups and companies. And it gives us a leg up on the ability to invest in these companies, but also to tap into the universities like Berkeley and Stanford, which have had such huge impacts on the AI world. So I think the other great thing about Salesforce is the nature of our product is that we command a lot of data. So we don't look at our customers' data, but we built our AI. In fact, we were really the first AI that was built where it was able to operate on the data without us uh, seeing the data. And that's really the magic of Einstein is that Einstein operates with a complete trust layer. Many people suggested that, you know, you mentioned SF being the center there. Many people suggested that you're in Hawaii. How do you respond to them? Is that fair? Is that not fair? Are they missing something? Um, I've always lived half and half back and forth. I've just loved both places and I'm fortunate that I can go back and forth. It's a short flight. Last week, you know, I was in San Francisco all week. This week I'm in Hawaii. Next week I'll be back in San Francisco. And so it goes. Usually I'm with customers. That's my number one place where I'm living. The people who say something like that, maybe they look at my life as being kind of how they operate their life. But my life is not static. It's a quite a dynamic uh, moment and every, I'm constantly on, on the move. I, absolutely. I'm sure you are. People don't know this. I run every single day and I listen to his commencement speech on the 13 truths. I find it actually centers me. Fuck meditation. That's what I need. And he says one thing. He says, well, he says many things, but he says life is not easy. Most things are more rewarding when you have to break a sweat to get them. And I was listening to this and I was like, I wonder what Mark would say to that when I ask him, when you reflect on the immense success of Salesforce, what comes to your mind when you think about breaking a sweat to get it? Well, he's one of my closest friends and we spent a huge amount of time together. And I'll just tell you that, you know, what he says is don't half-ass it. And that really comes from his dad, you know, and his mom I know very well. This family is a family of people who know who they, they get it done. You know, that's why I think he'd be a very good a mayor or governor or even a president because He's a get it done person. When he was working on his book, he like, oh, I'm going to write a top book. I said, Matthew, you're going to write the number one book. And then he became the number one book. He like completely goes for it. And it's incredible how he lives his life. He's an amazing person. He's a father. He's a son. Um, he is a CEO. He is a philanthropist. He is an actor. He is a writer. He is a song and dance man. When it gets right down to it, he's an incredible person in all these things because he believes that he can do all these things. He will do all these things that he must do all these things, and he does. And it's an incredible thing to watch. I've never really met anybody like him in my life. When you think about the Salesforce journey, what was the thing you had to break his sweat for? And how did that feel? You know, inspired by people like Matthew, I feel like I need to continue to work harder, do more, go play more places. Obviously, if Dreamforce is going to be successful, as like it was last week, I'm going to have to be there and uh, be a huge participant. And that's true in a lot of things that I do all over the world. So you got to go there and make it happen. I have to ask, when you were young, did you always have an inevitability of success about you? Did you know that you would be successful? I don't look at it as success. So maybe that's part of it. You know, when I was young and yeah, I worked very closely with my partner from my high school software company as one of our primary engineering leaders and architects, uh, Steve Fisher. And when we started our software company in high school, we were both about 14, 15 years old. 
And we were writing software on uh, Atari 800 and Commodore 64 and Apple II. And it was an amazing time because nobody knew what we were doing. We were building these uh, entertainment software products and different titles and cartridges. And some of it you can find now on YouTube. People have recorded all the software. It's, it's amazing. The thing that's cool about all that is that, you know, when we were doing all that, we were just entering the software industry. We're just doing it because we love software. That's what I love. I love talking about seeing software evolve, go forward. We talked about AI. And also the other thing that I love, philanthropy and giving back. And giving back to San Francisco. You know, we're the Salesforce is the largest philanthropist in San Francisco. We've given more than a hundred million dollars to the public schools, more than a hundred million dollars to the public hospitals. That's a lot about giving back, not not to mention all a lot of other NGOs and nonprofits in the city and all of the incredible mentoring and tutoring and volunteerism our employees do. Those are the two things that I love, I guess, software and philanthropy. And that's the, the yin and yang of my life that go back and forth that I do every day. I just have to ask, when you think about the array of different options you always have at your disposal, you mentioned the different frontiers of AI, the different ways you can spend your time. How do you analyze your decision-making framework today? And has it changed over time? How old are you now, Harry? 27. 27. So when I was... 27 at Oracle, I was already a vice president. I was actually just become about a senior vice president and I was inexperienced and I didn't have a lot of leadership skills. And I was working for an incredible CEO, Larry Ellison. He was awesome. And what I learned rapidly was I needed more skills, more capabilities. So I started to do a lot of personal development. There was no leadership training at Oracle. Oracle's leadership training was trial by fire. I was lucky to be able to hold my own because I was a, a, you know, an engineer, but I also had a business background, a sales background, a marketing background. So I started taking a lot of uh, courses and a lot of personal development courses. And I'd be working at Oracle and it, it would not be a shock to find me in a Tony Robbins seminar, a Stephen Covey seminar, a Deepak Chopra seminar. All of a sudden I had this breakthrough thought, which was there were five questions that I needed to answer before I started any project. Because I am an ADHD person, maybe one of the first that I knew, it was hard for me to focus and get around a certain project. I wasn't ready to take any of the ADHD meds, so I came up with something else. The something else was called V2Mom. It was five questions that let me really focus on my company, myself, a product, a customer, and the first thing I do before I do anything is number one, I say, what do I really want? You know, like we just had Dreamforce. I want to have the biggest and best Dreamforce ever. And as part of that, I want to totally save San Francisco. I want to release Salesforce's incredible new AI product lines. Number one is we want to have the number one AI CRM. Nothing is more important than that right now for Salesforce. Number two is we do want to have the best Dreamforce ever. And number three is we want to have an incredible San Francisco. So let's get clear about our vision. Now, what's the most important value associated with those three things? It's got to be trust. Customers are coming to San Francisco. They want to learn about our new Einstein One platform, which is our amazing new AI platform that has not just our core applications, but our Einstein and our new data cloud all integrated as one metadata platform. That's critical for us. There's nothing more important than that. They're going to have to trust it. They're going to have to find the success in that. They're going to have to find the innovation in that. But they're also going to have to find the safety of being in San Francisco as well. If they don't have safety or they don't feel safe on the streets, we can't do Dreamforce. We're not going to be able to communicate all these things. So we need to get clear about what are our core values that are really going to guide Dreamforce last week. Trust, safety, innovation, customer success. Now, uh, by the way, it was the most sustainable Dreamforce ever, sustainability, equality, to make sure everyone is treated well. We've learned a lot in doing, you know, more than 20 Dreamforces about how we have to deal with every stakeholder group. So what do I want? What's important about it? How do I get it? What is preventing me from having it? And how will I know that I have it? And those five questions really are guiding me. That's my V2 mom process. You mentioned their priorities. Uh, it takes me to Matthew McConaughey's talk where he talks about kind of the different checks and balances in his life where he has work, he has his marriage, he has you know, being a good father, being a good friend and, you know, his career. Can you take me to a time when your priorities have been out of whack and miss something's gone wrong there and what you've learned from it? Well, my priorities are constantly out of whack. 
<laughs> so, you know, my priorities are like my sp spiritual health and well-being, my physical health, my family, my friends, my business, my ability to give back. It's a dance. You know, when you have a dynamic life, I think it's a dance because different things are coming at you. It's the constant battle between the urgent and the important. In 1992, I started to really to take meditation classes and work with people. That also has really kept me, you know, going down the straight and narrow and keep my head in the game and also to really constantly consider the questions that you're asking me. What What is important and what do I really want? And what is the prioritization? And is it in balance or is it out of balance? That's been an incredible part of my life. I'm so happy to have that as well. You mentioned values. Uh, I know it's a fanboy, clearly. Uh, Matthew McConaughey says, we've financialized our values in society so much in his speech. I literally, like, I know it for word for word after about 4,000 runs. But my question to you is, Mark, and I hope it's not too personal. How do you reflect on your relationship to money today? And does money make one happy? Well, money's never going to make you happy. And I guess that's one of the reasons that uh, I'm so into philanthropy. I've given away more than a billion dollars to all kinds of organizations, mostly in San Francisco, mostly our university, mostly UCSF. I built two children's hospitals. I built an, an ocean program. I've done all kinds of things. Wherever I go or where I live, I make sure that I'm always giving back at scale to the community. Personally, I feel that to who much is given, much is you know required. I want to build a great company, but I also want to give back. Now, I want to tell you why that's selfish. Because it gets to your point. I'm not going to be happy unless I'm giving. If you could call yourself up the night before you had your first child and say, Mark, you should know this and give yourself some advice, what would that advice be? I think the number one thing that everyone needs to do is enjoy every moment. And I'll say to people the same thing, and maybe it'll help you. Tell me, what are 10 things that make you very happy? Now let's make a list of 10 things that make you not so happy. Now let's look at these two lists. How about doing a little bit more of what makes you happy and a little bit less of what makes you unhappy? Everybody knows what makes them happy and what makes them unhappy, but I think they have to have the permission to do less unhappiness and more happiness. And I think then you will be obviously happier if you're doing things that are making you happy. I'm going there, Mark. Fuck it. It's, it's the very late in the UK, so why not? Something that makes people happy for the millennial generation, maybe I'm going to get in trouble for this, is working from home. My team want to work from home. I want them in the office. I won. Uh, <laughs> my point is, how do you feel about the, what, what if it's work from home that makes you happy? And how do we feel about the reversion back to work in office? Well, I think for different kind of workers, it's different. And mm -hmm. I think like, start with our engineers. Our engineers only have to come in the office 10 days a quarter. You know, for our engineers, we want them to come together to collaborate and to hang out and to get to know each other. But they're very productive at home. I work mostly at home. I have for my entire life. I just have never been able to work well or be successful in an office. I can't tell you why. Today, I think there's a balance between working at home and working in person. I need to be with my customers all the time. Now, that can be digital, like I was just with a customer before we had this conversation. And I'm in my Zoom room here and I'm like hanging out today and, uh, it's a digital day. You know, last week I was with thousands of customers and it has to be a balance of being in person and digital today. I think for everybody, it has to be a little bit different. I think that for our sales and marketing people, we tell them that four days a week, we want to see them, you know, in person with a customer. For our sales and for our marketing people and our GNA people, we like to see them in person three days a week. Obviously I'm in an office right now. I'm not really at home. I have my chief of staff and other employees here working on various things, or my futurist was just here, we're doing a variety of things. I think there's a lot of benefits to being at home. I think there's a lot of benefits to being in person, and I think there's a lot of benefits to being with customers. I think you have to do all of those things. I totally agree with you. Um, listen, I want to move into a quick fire round. So I say a short statement and you give me your immediate thoughts. Does that sound okay? Sure, absolutely. Harry. Has anything been off uh, subject so far? Mark, I had to go through your team, and so I'm kind of like battling with a shield. <laughs> Gary, I told you everything's on on the table, and uh, you shouldn't listen to my team. That was never part of any deal we had. What does great fatherhood mean to you? You know, I look at my mom, and I look at my dad, and my dad was just one of the greatest people, and I just am so fortunate. He, he passed away when he was 83. That was about 11 years ago. Uh, he died of prostate cancer. It's one of the reasons that I fund a lot, one of the largest prostate cancer research 
programs in the world at UCSF. My mom also, you know, is a cancer survivor. She's had cancer four times, breast cancer twice, lung cancer, kidney cancer, oh, and skin cancer. That's one of the reasons why, you know, I fund uh, oncology and breast cancer as well. I think about my dad. I think about the incredible life he had. That's my role model. So that that's what great fatherhood is. What was your biggest insecurity today? I guess trying to do it all. You know, I do try to get, as I kind of said before, making it happen. I've got that Matthew McConaughey motion where I'm trying to do it all, being that every, being that every, you know, every season, every man, the Renaissance, it's, it's not easy in trying to do it all. It's not always working, but uh, sometimes it is when it is, there's nothing better. So it's a lot about, like you said before, staying in balance and keeping things in the right priority. Where do you think you still need to improve as a leader? I just love innovating and love creating and love growth more than anything. And I sometimes sacrifice things to grow the company, to grow innovation, to do new things. I love creativity. And so my team's job is to kind of keep me in the zone to bring me back so that we always have solid balanced financials like we've had, for example, in the last three quarters, especially at Salesforce, because that's where I really want to have my head and where the world is going, not not either where we are or where, where we've been. Single biggest highlight moment from the Salesforce journey where you're like, I remember that moment, that moment when I did this, the first Dreamforce, the first customer, the bringing your mother to the first Dreamforce. It was really last week when I got on stage and I did one slide that said, Salesforce is now San Francisco's largest philanthropist and we've given more than a hundred million dollars to the children's hospital and more than a hundred and fifty million dollars to the public schools. I wasn't sure it was really possible. Probably the best decision we made was when we started Salesforce 25 years ago, we put 1% of our equity, 1% of our product and all of our employees time, 1% of our employees time into a foundation. And it was simple then, Ari, because we had no money, capital, you know, <laughs> uh, employees. I always felt like if you just could take 1% of everything and let it scale, that it would be an amazing way to give back. Because while I love building product and I love innovating and I love creating and I love doing all that, I have to say that if that's all you're doing, you're not going to end up with a lot of fulfillment in your life. You're only going to get to the happiness and fulfillment if not only are you creating, but you're giving. You've got to give back and you have to find a way to give back at scale. And so many of my friends have, you know, they, they've died. And when they've died, they've left these huge fortunes. And then when they've left their family to give back, you know, at that point, and that was kind of their motto. Well, I'm going to go until the end. And then at the end, that's when my family will have the money and they could do the, the philanthropy. What's the hardest part of giving effectively? I was chatting to David Velez at New Bank the other day about this on the show. What's the hardest part about actually giving effectively? I think the number one thing that people must do is just start giving and find what works for them effectively. I know people who do very effective global philanthropy. That's not me. I've tried to do global programs. It's very difficult. I have a program called 1T.org, the Trillion Tree Program, trying to sequester 200 gigatons of carbon with a trillion trees. There's a lot of fulfillment and a lot of fun. And while building the AI version of Salesforce is amazing and all the things that are going on, never forget that you're going to ultimately get the most happiness and the most fulfillment is not, not just setting your intention for a great company with great products, but something that's going to give back and impact the world in a positive way. When we do this in 10 years time, Mark, if everything goes to plan with AI and Salesforce, where is Salesforce then in 2033? Today we're the number one CRM, you know, that. Number one in sales, the number one in service, the number one in marketing and commerce and platform and all of these areas. And it's been an amazing thing, you know, working with companies, delivering their customer success. AI is the opportunity to take all that to another level. So we've done it for our customers with Predictive. We've now turned over the generative platform to them. For a lot of companies, they want to use generative technology, but Harry, they don't have the tools to either build the apps or use the technology and make it easy or get the data together, we've packaged it together in Einstein 1. Uh, I understand the problem very well where they're 
just given an LLM and said, oh, now make this uh, success. And they're like, well, I don't know. What, is, what do I do? So we've been able to kind of put it together in a low code, no code way that makes it easy for them wrapped in a metadata framework. So when they add a field, it populates through all the apps and into the data cloud and into the AI and everywhere and then back into the core system. And that lets them build apps, deliver customer success, uh, create innovation using this AI. You know, I put a demo on uh, Twitter. You probably saw it on my feed over the weekend on the next generation of our platform. I'm pretty excited about what we've done in the last nine months with Generative. It complements what we've already done with Predictive. And what's coming for agents and for autonomy with Salesforce will be amazing. And where we're going with AGI, well, our future as Peter Schwartz, who was just with me, you know, he wrote Minority Report and he wrote War Games. You know, so he's got a pretty good handle on the future. He's an incredible visionary and has been for decades. We worked on the Apollo mission as well. And he's got some incredible plans for Salesforce in the AGI world. So I'm excited about that. We showed a vision of it with a video to our analysts uh, at Dreamforce. It's an incredible future. Thank you so much for joining me. And this has been a huge, huge honor. Thank you, Harry and Mark, for the incredibly insightful session. And uh, yeah, next up, I mean, uh, if you're looking at back at Salesforce in 1999, when the Salesforce Cloud CRM launched, uh, it fundamentally altered the software landscape and it ultimately propelled the company to a valuation of up to 200 billion. Um, next up, we are thrilled to welcome two truly exceptional founders, both of them whom built um, Decker coins that have similarly revolutionized software in their respective categories. Andrei Khosid, founder of Miro, and uh, Daniel Dinesh, founder of UiPath, will be discussing the topic of pioneering AI and automation in visual collaboration. These two companies have transformed the very fabric of how humans can maximize their potential through automation and collaboration. Miro, the leading whiteboarding solution, had recently surpassed 50 million users and is serving everyone essentially from individuals to almost all Fortune 100 companies. UiPath has revolutionized pretty much robotic process automation, crossing the threshold of 1 billion revenues um, last year. Both Andre and Daniel are masters of iteration. They have torn down and rebuilt parts of their product to build successful companies. And today, they will share some very personal moments about their story of building these companies, as well as discuss the role of AI and unlocking new frontiers in the new generation of building this product. So please join me by coming, Andre and Daniel, to the stage. Where we want to. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yes, as uh, Martin said, we are experimenting a lot, me and Daniel, and when visionaries reached out to us and asked, like, would you guys interview each other? It was a pretty crazy idea, but we thought, why not? Let's experiment with that as well. Uh, I know Daniel for five years, uh, since 2018, when we were raising our Series A, and Daniel joined us as an angel at that time. Uh, which I well, lucky me. <laughs> luckily, uh, and I missed his round, Series A, because I didn't have money, and I didn't have s such great friends who will introduce us. So, and yeah, uh, I thought that it will be an amazing opportunity to speak with Daniel, with all of you today in the room, similar to how we have these conversations one-on-one -on -one over video, when I call Daniel and ask him for advice, and ask him how he is doing and whatnot. Uh, Daniel didn't call me before uh, to ask me for it, to ask for advice, or uh, so I thought that maybe it also would be interesting for you to learn something from me today. So with that, let's start. I think I already learned quite a bit from you, Andre. I I, I learned. Uh, I've seen your grit and your ambition. You remember one time. You told me, I was thinking of Daniel 
way of speaking English. And if he, Daniel can make it, for sure I can do it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so like, <laughs> when, when you're kind of a founder coming from Europe to the Bay Area, and like, you, you speak with the accent, like, some people don't understand you, and then you uh, occasionally meet the guy who made such a successful company, and he speaks with the same accent uh, like you. I was like, okay, maybe I can also make it. So that was, yeah, also a huge uh, unlocking opportunity for me. Uh, but yeah, jokes aside, like, you started the business in 2005, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I was graduating from school at that time. What was your dream? How you envision uh, this company back in the day? My dream was really to, to build a nice thing. I think I was born entrepreneur. I, I, I dreamt of building a company since I was like maybe 13, 14. And uh, I didn't have like a big idea to save the world somehow, which maybe it's bad in retrospect, but my biggest idea was to create a company where people will have joy working, where they can do their best, and that together we can create that sort of magic that's a new product that delights customers, where we can apply the best of our minds. So if you look back and uh, thinking about what you have accomplished, how far you are on that journey? Well, I think the vision uh, gets bigger and bigger As over you go, time. Uh, yeah. At some point, we realized that, uh, speaking about having a major impact in the world, it's actually not, you know, something you have to be afraid of. Because, you know, being raised in Eastern Europe, I always, the bullshit radar is so big. If someone says, I want to change the world, it activates it. So I don't believe this time. But going through different stages, you actually realize that having a sense of mission it's something what drives really great people to join you and participate into the journey. Oh, yeah, that's very true. Like when I started the company in 2011, uh, we have this just simple idea of bringing a whiteboard into a browser. There was no mission, there was no impact on the world. It's just like, yeah. why this browser doesn't exist in, uh, why this whiteboard doesn't exist in the browser and why people would not have access to it from all over the world. But then we kind of got this going. In 2016, we came up with a mission for a company. And that mission became a North Star for us that guides our decisions now, that guides our future thinking. And you kind of yeah, grow the... What's that mission? The mission is empower teams to create the next big thing. So, and uh, we continuously think how we can empower teams to create the next big thing, and like with the canvas, and eventually maybe even outside of the canvas because there are so many things that teams need these days. Uh, and this mission guides our decision making and future thinking. Yeah, yeah. that's powerful. Look, every time I, I talk to someone, I really want to learn from their mistakes. To me, that's, and I'm trying to learn from my mistakes. I keep learning over time and I'm reflecting a lot of my mistakes. So I'm curious, what do you think are your major mistakes that... Yeah, I, I wanted to learn from you in this session about your mistakes, but yeah, let me, let me share mine. I think uh, one of those was to maybe start and to evolve the company for too long without subject matter experts. It's like all the people in my team, including myself, were kind of not exposed to, to anything in this world, building the software at scale, uh, selling software, nothing. So we had to learn everything our way, and it took us quite some time. So I would think that there would be some uh, efficiency opportunities if I would kind of have a better mix of people who saw at least how to scale things and people who have this kind of complete beginner's mindset who are figuring out things. That's one of the things. So I would uh, think I can accelerate a bunch of things in general in a business. But what kind of roles exactly do you have? In I mean, like, think about this like as a interface designer, so, or even software engineer who need to build a reliable software. Like, I had a team of four, 
and they are all amazing engineers, and they're all actually staff engineers in the company today. But when we started this company, the kind of experience was to build a website uh, on a Joomla with 100 users per month, and that was the best experience on that team. And people were literally yeah. out of school. And yes, like they, we learned the, the journey and we, we, we build the software. But yeah, if you have a few folks who knows how to build reliable software from day one, it's a little bit better. You will have way less ex incidents. You will lose less customers in the first place and so on. Yeah, so th that's one mistake. Maybe, yeah, another mistake is also, uh, and it's, I think it's a big learning, is actually how you build your leadership team. So, because, uh, yeah, you, you, you go, you hire people, and they all have great CVs, they all have great experiences, but what does it mean to have a great leadership team? You need to figure that out, and how people would play together, how they solve problems together, and whatnot, and kind of, it took me quite some time to learn how to uh, kind of make, make it stronger and learn how to part ways with people. It was not comfortable for me for a long time. And coming from Eastern Europe, you know, it's like your company is your family. You can't let go people from your family. So that was a big kind of a mindset change for me as well. Well, I think for everybody, it's very difficult to fire people. It's one of my uh, good friends, which is the CEO of Workday right now, told me, Daniel, the moment you can fire people without having your consciousness kicking in, you are done as a business leader. So you will always have, but doing the right thing, it's hard. It's always very hard. And to me, building leadership, what, what my biggest lesson is that actually you need to look at people's personalities. I think you can easily find expertise. But matching personalities, I think it's much harder. Mm -hmm. And it's ne it never worked. I, I learned the hard way. You cannot change one's character. You cannot change one's personality, regardless how intelligent they are, hard, how empathic they are. You cannot. And it's not going to work. Yeah. You have to see this perfect you have to see match if and working. chemistry, whatever, so people work together great. Otherwise, it, it, it doesn't create that effectiveness. I'm curious, like you have now 25% of your team in Romania. Uh, you had way more people in Romania in per percentage wise before when you started to build your yeah. uh, kind of US office and U uh, Western European offices. Um, I'm curious, like how you integrated cultures, what worked well and what would you do differently if you do it again? Because you guys started in Romania, you worked in the US before, but, but you had to integrate those cultures and make that smooth. So, what are your lessons there? Well, I mean, always I had to, to be candid. I always had the bias against Romanians. I think Romanians are good engineers. That's not the, but I think they, in terms of working together, they are very defensive. And it's very hard to give feedback to them. So, my bias was against promoting Romanian leaders. So, I always hire. I want rather, let's go hire more experienced people, US, UK initially. And uh, it created a bit of a clash between, because Romania also have very nice streets. So we build a company with young people, smart, energetic. We were working hard. For us, Friday night, 10 p.m. was always people with their laptops having a drink and working. And it's an amazing experience. And I, I feel that I didn't pay enough respect mm. to them, but hiring always on the top of them and not giving them a chance to, to become really great leaders. So would you do it differently now? So what, what would you do? Like, yeah, I would... Uh, you would promote more? So, yeah, I think I would promote more. I would try to... Another biggest mistake that I made, not only related to Romanians, but I prefer sometimes experience to attitude. And to me, that's one of the worst mistakes. Especially as a founder, a first-time founder, as an entrepreneur, I always had this imposter syndrome. Yeah. And then I tended to say, 
let me try to hire someone that is experienced, they will guide us, they will do this. But they come with the baggage, unfortunately, and they don't fit in the culture. Yeah. And uh, people will feel bad about this, and they feel that I betray them somehow. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's very true. Uh, I had a conversation with someone recently in my team, and uh, they told me, Andre, you hired us for experience. I said, no. I hired you for two things. I hired you 50% for experience and 50% for beginner's mindset. And if you kind of miss on one of those sides, <laughs> you're yeah. not a great fit. Because like just experience, just bringing a playbook doesn't make any sense. And well, this attitude and the uh, exactly uh, mindset is as critical as the experience. Yeah, in retrospect, if I'm thinking what, what were the best treat that we had, I think it was our foolishness. Mm. We just went, you know, for a big market without thinking twice. So it was really good if you always, if you think too much and not act, I, I don't think you can go as fast as we went. I actually wanted to ask you a question. Um, I remember kind of your investors thought that kind of you scaling your go-to-market kind of aggressive and they were kind of at the same time excited and scared yeah. about how you did it. It just like really went aggressive with building your go-to-market. Anything you learned from that experience, anything you would do differently if you do it again? Because yes, you went after a big market with this kind of team that worked uh, on Friday t till 10 p.m., but then you kind of took a ton of dollars and started to kind of really aggressively go after all markets across the world. Just, well, yeah. yeah, look, I think it's interesting to put things in perspective for people here to understand yeah. the magnitude of mistake. And uh, <laughs> so we were growing in 2019 from like 170 ish ARR to 360 ARR. Yeah. It's an amazing growth. Very few companies ever achieve this. But in that year, we burned $400 million. And, which also very few companies at this stage did. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. So I think the, the key lesson is that that's, and it was really also hiring these big people and giving them a mandate and trusting them. Guys, just go. And I trust the people that we can stay within a budget. I didn't realize how important it is to put some governance and control at a certain, and not all the people are scrappy. I believe that our scrappiness from the, just two years ago, I believe that everybody will have it, but it's not true. No. So you have to put early this type of governance and controls. And that's, that's a big thing. It's like, yeah. so you have checks and balances. I think this session is uh, uh, somehow named after AI topic, correct? Let's, let's use a couple yeah. times this AI term during this session. So uh, what about AI? It's like you guys build it for a long time. It's like uh, before recent kind of boom around AI. And I'm curious, what's your view on the impact of AI uh, in your space uh, and where you believe we will still have a human in the loop and where you believe we will have automation um, as a primary solution and where you believe we can't delegate to AI anything? in your space specifically? Well, we were one of the companies that were put initially on the kill list by AI, by a few big funds. And uh, I think now people realize that things are a little bit uh, more mixed. For us, AI, it's equally a headwind than a tailwind. Yeah. In a way, it's, we believe it's a much bigger tailwind mm -hmm. because we can... Um, we can help our customer adopt our software easier. We are creating copilots for everything in our technology, and we are infusing AI. And that, to, to me, this is a very interesting question where, how deep will AI go within industry? Because right now, still, a year after ChatGPT was on the main stage almost, I see very few examples of enterprise usage besides, you know, personal productivity, small. I create this spreadsheet or I do, 
And uh, mm -hmm. so, I, I believe humans in the loop will be essential. Essential. For, for a few years down the road. I don't believe that uh, AI can solve the problem of hallucinations easily. But I believe that for very specific industries, combining LLMs and uh, dedicated models, can, it will allow us to go almost autonomously. And yeah. How do you see it for your industry? Yeah, in our space, um, it's pretty interesting. We shipped a bunch of AI capabilities uh, based on generative AI. Um, uh, things early this year. We have a decent traction with early adopters, but it didn't went as broad as I would expect. So you still, even with those magical experiences, you need to kind of, yeah, uh, get through this curve of early adopters. So that's one thing. Uh, we think strategically about what AI should, should be doing for our space. I believe that AI should be one of those people in the room where you do a strategic session, brainstorm, and whatnot. So you have three, four people solving the problem. AI co-pilot could be the fifth person in the room. And this fifth person can also contribute to the discussion, correct? Um, of course, we see a lot of uh, potential official efficiency gains where AI will help to summarize things and create kind of uh, takeaways from those sessions. That's pretty straightforward. Everyone is uh, doing this. but. I think the biggest opportunity is, will come from AI that will have the context of specific discussion and that can also connect to external data yeah. uh, and can combine both things because when you have this few people in but the room. But still, it's a creator tool. It's, it's a creator and it then you have a human in the loop. Yeah. And then you have a human in the loop. The human will make a decision, of course. Yeah. But I think there is a lot of power in that because you know, it's just like if you are three, four people, smart people in the room, you brainstorm on something. We don't, ha we don't have habits to go and Google what Google knows about that or what internet knows about that, correct? So AI can compensate for that and can bring perspectives that are already known. Yeah. And then you can combine what you kind of think in the room with what is known and then come up with a better answer solutions. That's what I believe, and that's but what we're... The main question, do you for. think that five years from now on, the yeah. clerical jobs will be heavily impacted? Do you see it pervasive? Do you see everything will be infused with AI? So we'll yeah. basically talk with AI companions all day long. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think more and more about that co-pilot will be presented in almost everything we do. Yeah. So we drive the car, we'll have co-pilot. We, I don't know, like brainstorm, we will have a co-pilot. We speak with our GP, general practitioner, we'll have a co-pilot. So that's we'll, my sense. So there's but still that's a, still a creator thing. Yeah, exactly. But do you think we will see agents that autonomously will do, will, will do operations, medium complex operations? Uh, this is out of my kind of expert zone. I, I don't think in the next three, five years, we'll see that because look at the kind of self-driving cars. It takes quite, quite time to... So you feel the edge cases can kill the... Yeah, I, I think there would be edge cases, but I think to your point, like, would we see it all over the place in five years? I, I, would, I would think no. Uh, in 10 years, in some areas, might be, yeah. My thinking is that we will definitely see co-pilots yeah. almost everywhere with a human in the loop and then We'll see what areas will. will well, it was a great pleasure. I think our time opportunity is up. to chat. Thank you, Andre. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks. You go here. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Andre and Danielle. Um, now we are going to have a 20 minute networking break again. And as a reminder, a gong will indicate when it's over. And then we are going to be back with another session of our portfolio companies um, sharing their stories. So, um, yeah.
Perfect. It's great to see a lot of you in the audience today. If I could ask one thing um, for the people who are just networking, if they could go into the entrance or maybe downstairs, that would be fantastic. Um, and for the rest of you, I think a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about four of our fantastic uh, portfolio companies, and in particular, four portfolio companies that are revolutionizing the way we work with AI and consumerized SaaS tools. The first person I want to introduce to you is Bina from Central, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about the future of ERPs, and particularly ERPs for small and medium-sized businesses. Over to you, Bina. I think you need the clicker. Cool. Super. Thanks. Nice. Then. Perfect. Um, um, what are we doing here? Um, Central. We have a an, 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 an different founding story. Uh, we had original own business, hardware business. We built and produced microcontroller boards, embedded systems, and we realized that we have two crazy work every day with managing our business to reorder things, to write sales orders, write invoices, have everything all over um, an overview in the warehouse, what happened there. And uh, then we sh looked around what is there in the world, what could help us to make this easy and fun and, and really what a modern company would like has a tool. And we realized that there are really only old, ugly, clunky software there in the world. And this is not what is a fit for us as a software company. And that's why we said, let's write this piece of software for ourselves. This was originally the idea. Then later, the people came to us and asked us, what, what type of software do you use here? And um, we would also like to have this because the people realized that we have a really smart piece of software what automatically reminds you and um, send emails to the right moment in the business journey to the customer what happens with the sales order, with the goods. And we are waiting for suppliers that you send back, things and so on. And this really um, drives a lot of, of engagement for the first people who came to us and really understand what power you have when you have the right software in place and you don't have to hire a lot of people who do manual work, task, whatever. Um, it's, I think, um, um, big, big thing um, um, for every small company because you normally have everything but you don't have a lot of money and, and that you can hire a lot of people. You have to find ways that you can make it super smart and easy. What is our software? We have, um, um, we call it, um, it's an ERP. It's always questioned, is ERP for SMB the right word or not? But it describes it best as a software for business operations, really from order management, inventory management, procurement, payment, shipping, all the things what comes together. What for a bigger companies normal that you have with one, one software, it was not possible for smaller companies that you have no, really no one place where you can bring all the things together and have the, the great overview about the things. Additionally, what is also different to the old world is we live in a world where we can lose a lot of um, tools and, and modern um, payments and um, services and so on and that we have really a lot of integrations to a lot of cool, great business tools that you can easily really bring all together in one step without a lot of effort in engineering or whatever um, you normally would need in the old world. Typical customers, as so we are at the moment working mostly um, in Germany, that's where we came from. We started first experiments also to go international. Um, E-commerce businesses really fast growing, but also normal growing in e-commerce businesses. We like customers with B2B, B2Z. Um, when you have mixed business models, we make the life easier because this is the tough challenge when you have different channels and really will bring everything together in one place and have the overview um, over the things here. That's me. I'm, I'm really excited to be a part of the story and we try to really make everything best that all the people around the world can feel the power of a modern SMB ERP software. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bina. Uh,
Next up, we'll be hearing from Automated. They're using AI and RPA to automate a lot of the mundane and repetitive tasks that I think all of us know from the office. And it's my pleasure to hand over to Patrick, the first of the two Patricks on this panel, <laughs> to talk a little bit about what they're doing. Yeah. Seem to be a lot of Patricks here in the room today. Um, so let me see. Perfect. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we are democratizing business process automation. And let me start a little bit differently than uh, we normally would start. Probably some of you guys have seen pictures like this. Um, these are called Rube Goldberg machines. And why am I showing this? This is a self-operating napkin. It's a machine designed to perform a very simple task in an overly complicated way. Uh, I mean, you see it here. It's really complex to build. It probably costs a lot of money if you do that in real life, and it's going to take a lot of time. And this is actually how process automation nowadays feels for a lot of businesses out there. And in the end, if you look into the market, and especially if you look into companies where you have a lot of non-technical people, you see that people feel that it's really hard to automate processes. And um, it takes a lot of time, right? If you try to automate and process end-to-end, -end, it takes a really long time, and it's super hard for people. And probably if you then get external people to support, it's going to be really, really expensive, and you're going to write really big checks. So this is where we come in. We really want to avoid that we're only scratching the surface when it comes to process automation and tackle all this complexity that's below the surface, which comes from highly individual tasks that everybody here in the room probably has. They're not documented. There's a lot of exceptions. And it's really painful. And that's why they don't work with all the standard tools that are out there. And in the end, let's take a step back and think about what does it take to automate a process. And it's, it feels sometimes it's a, it sounds simpler than it is. But in the end, you need to think about what do I want to automate? Right? And it's often something a user does, or you have a business analyst, or maybe use a tool for that. Um, and it takes some time. Secondly, you need to write down what this actually, what the automation should do. Right? So what are the technical requirements? Somebody needs to write it down. You need to maybe also use a tool or a studio for that. Secondly, or thirdly, actually, who's writing the code? Who's writing the automation? Who's building it? Right? Either you have a studio, a plug and play, a, a couple of things or an engineer is building something custom, getting really expensive. And then you need to deploy the automation and make sure that it's actually working on your device and doing what you want to do. This is really painful. And that's why it's also often very costly if you hire people. And what we do, in the end, we do it all with our solution. Right? So we build an AI, a model that's basically taking all the studios, all the people out of the equation when it comes to automating processes. So you could say, we automate the automation process. How this works is very simple. In the end, our system uh, monitors the behavior of a user. This could be navigation. This could be entry of data, selecting a drop-down value. And this is how normally people enter and work on their daily basis. It's super annoying every time the same stuff. And then after a few repetitive uh, executions, actually, our tool jumps in. Right? So it's coming up with a process uh, documentation saying, this is actually what we have recognized. Is this what you want to do? The user can still stay in control and give some input. And then the automation is built on the spot and actually directly deployed to the user. And then it's one click, and the magic happens. Right? And with this, basically, we give access to process automation to everybody, especially people that are not technical, for all these highly individual processes that are out there. So in the end, we always say there's four key benefits when we talk to people. It's obviously uh, very simple now. No knowledge. Right? You just work, and something happens. And with this, you have high value instantly, because you don't need to wait for anything. It just pops up. You don't have to think about it. And especially important for our customers now is you don't need to work in a separate studio. It lives where you work, so you don't need to do anything in a studio or a tool. It's basically in your environment. And lastly, you can create massive time savings. And uh, that's what we built. So thanks a lot for being here. Thanks a lot, Bobby, for the intro. Over to you. Awesome. Uh, I think it's difficult to overstate how much time that's going to save people. Um, I'm, very I'm very much looking forward to seeing Automated deployed in basically every company. Um, so next up, we'll be hearing from Loxo. Uh, Loxo gives sales teams the ability to create private mini sites, hosting all the information their prospects will need in one place. But Toby will tell you more about what exactly they're doing.
perfect. So Loxo is the buyer experience platform. Essentially, we take all of the time-consuming work that the very best sales reps do to stand out in their deals, customizing slide decks, pulling together materials, creating action plans, and we automate it so that these things, these best practices, are not only being done by the one or two reps on your team, they're being done consistently for every single deal, every single rep across the board. And we do that by integrating a number of data sources, Salesforce, call recordings, your asset repository, even the sales leader's playbook, and then generating customer-facing sites which have everything that your buyers need in one place. And these become a resource which gets shared around amongst the buyer team. Now, I originally created the first version of Loxo uh, when I was back at a company called Ironclad. Um, I've been fortunate to join them as the first business hire back in 2016. And I ended up moving over to London to open up the go-to-market effort for Ironclad here in Europe. And the challenge was, Ironclad is a legal tech product. We were selling into in-house lawyers, a really, really tough sell, long, complicated, lots of stakeholders, highly competitive. I needed a way to stand out. And so I would spend my weekends creating personalized websites in Webflow, different pages for the key stakeholders that were involved in the deal, creating action plans, creating videos to introduce myself, the response from the buyers was unbelievable. I had people coming to me and saying, we're choosing Ironclad because of your sales experience. If you sell like this, we can't wait to work with your customer success team. But then as I take a step back from this and I look at the rest of our reps, it's not scalable. It's not something that everyone is going to be delivering in every single deal. It's not a consistent and reliable motion. And so that's really the idea for Loxo. It's can we productize this? Can we operationalize it? And that's what we've delivered. And you can see some of our customers up on the, up on the screen here. I love this quote. It's from someone that reached out to us just a couple of weeks ago. They're a competitor of Ironclad. And they said, look, we've lost three deals last quarter to Ironclad. When we asked the, comp when we asked the prospect why they chose Ironclad over us, they said it was on the strength of the sales and the buyer experience that Ironclad had created. So look, we're obviously in this sales marketing tech space. You're probably familiar with a bunch of other solutions, asset repositories, digital sales rooms, mutual action plans. There's a lot going on. But really, we have a view on two things in particular that need to be in place for a system like this to really work at scale across a company. Number one is you have to make this something that is easy, is effortless for every single rep to use in every deal. And so the key is automation. We think of this as co-pilot for reps. It should be effortless when they get off of a call, plug in the call recording to generate a personalized tailored site just for their deal in a matter of seconds. We think of it a little bit like Tesla's full, dri full, uh, full self-driving self platform where any input from the user is sort of suspect, and we want to eliminate that over time. Can we automate it? And so that's where the integrations come in that I mentioned, but also, of course, large language models increasingly. The other piece is, OK, so it works for reps. It's flexible and easy. But how do you get this working for the enablement team, for the marketing team, actually make this scalable? And we think of this as command and control for PMMs and marketers and enablement. We've created this incredible tree structure. It's really a first of its kind version control system so that when you need to update or change or add new content, you can do that in a single place. And you can see on a single pane of glass all of the templates and sites that this work is affecting. You can actually measure the impact of your work for the first time as a PMM. The critical piece that makes that work is what we call Git for sales. So if you think about it, you've got sales reps that need the flexibility to make edits and personalized changes to a site. But then you've got a marketing team that's coming in with new content. How do you deal with the merge there? Well, the old answer has been you either have outdated content that isn't changed, or you overwrite everything that the rep has done. We've created a third way. It's Git for sales. So it gives the sales rep an ability 
to merge their changes together, preserving the edits that they've made and also incorporating the latest content. It's the way that we strike this balance between flexibility and speed for reps on the one hand and visibility and control for marketing leadership and enablement on the other. So that's a quick introduction to Loxo. I'd be remiss not to say if there are any heads of sales in the room <laughs> and you are interested by anything I've said here, if you're looking to stand out with your buyer experience and make that scalable across the team, do let me know. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you, Toby. Um, I think it's pretty clear that this will be quite impactful for a lot of sales teams. Last but certainly not least, Patrick number two from Workflex. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> Workflex's vision is to become the one-stop shop for HR and people compliance, focusing on business travel and workations to begin with. And, and that's what I think you're going to tell us a little bit more about now. Yeah, thanks a lot. My name is Patrick. I'm one of the co-founders of Workflex. And we support companies in making business travel and workations compliant. So before I get into it, I think all of us do some kind of business travel. But I do have a question for you. Who of you in the last 12 months has been on a so-called vacation? So you temporarily work from another country, either to extend a vacation or visit family abroad. So I see some raising hands. Okay, and I think it shows the world is changing. But um, who of you is aware of compliance risk around this? Who has heard of tax risk, data protection, social security around it, labor law? So I think it's reached the masses. And... So a lot of raising hands and kind of what we see also with the clients that we support, they have a lot of people working abroad either for business trips or during vacations. But they have one big problem because they're struggling with compliance. They're paying lawyers a lot of money for this. They have very time intensive processes because whenever an employee goes abroad, let it be just for one single day, you as an organization, you need to cover permanent establishment, employment tax, social security, health insurance, labor law, work entitlement, etc. So you think this is complex? <laughs> well, welcome to our world, and I make it more complex for you. <laughs> the problem really is, whenever an employee goes abroad, it's an individual situation. So when I go from the UK to Spain, it's different when I go from the UK to Germany. Always depends on the country combination. From the compliance perspective, I also need to check what is my nationality, what is my position in the company. Depends on the number of days I go abroad. So I could go on for this forever. So there are a million of compliance scenarios. So this makes it super, super complex. And well, if you think compliance is expensive, try non-compliance. A lot of companies had, had to learn the hard way. Uh, most recently, Bosch had to pay a 300 million fine. So compliance is complex, but uh, well, luckily there is a Workflex. What we do, we provide a software and we sell it to organizations and we make compliance very, very, very easy. So how it works is that within companies that use our product, every employee can go into our product, say, I want to work from abroad, for example, from Spain, answer a few questions, and we as Workflex take care of all the compliance processes. So it's fully automated and the company don't need to worry about it. So I think the benefits are quite clear. Our clients say they reduce the compliance exposure significantly. They save a lot of time, up to three hours per trip. And also enabling employees to work from abroad is a huge benefit in employer branding. So really foster a better work environment. So if you did have your hand raised before, or if you want to raise it again, please hit me up later. And uh, thanks for that. Thank you very much, Patrick. And with that, we're wrapping up our session. That won't be the last time you're hearing from these four fantastic companies. So watch them very closely. We're very, very honored to be working with you. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the evening.
Hello, everyone. Today, we are going to dive deeper into the mysterious and dynamic world of angel investing. We have a fantastic list of panelists who are about to join us on stage today. To begin with, we have Zeynep, partner at General Catalyst, a prominent VC fund. We also have Gloria, founding partner at Puzzle Ventures, an angel operator fund aiming to bring together operators and founders from successful tech companies such as Personio, Stripe, and WhatsApp. And then finally, we have Carmen, founder of Cocoa, a self-described VC turned angel. And moderating the session is Eleanor, deputy editor of our favorite publication, Sifted. So enjoy, everyone. Awesome. Oh. We're going to have one, one more guest in a second. I think this is our, uh, the only all-female panel today, which is amazing. Yes, let's hear a round of applause for the all-female panel. We're just going to wait for Carmen in a second. <laughs> no worries, everyone. We'll just wait for a second. I feel like it's a good crowd. Earlier in the afternoon, I feel like it kind of like thinned out a little bit, but I feel like we've got the evening session now. Yeah, the rain helps. The rain helps. And here she is, our final panelist, Carmen. Okay, we don't have much time, so we're gonna kick things off. Today we're talking about Europe's early stage ecosystem and angel investing. So, Gloria, I'm gonna go to you for the first question. Kind of start at the most early stages. We've seen this incredible rise of the angel community in Europe. What is behind this? I think it's, basic, it's basically um, two aspects. One, we were far behind on operators being VCs. So I remember when I was a VC in 2016, 17, I read a study that said 92% of European VCs had never been an operator or founder before. So a lot of people came from consulting or investment banking. And I think a lot of the founders that started businesses back then didn't really feel represented. They didn't really feel like the other side of the table really had empathy for that journey. And I think a lot of them had in mind, oh yeah, if I have money one day, I want to change that and I want to contribute to the ecosystem. And then in the last couple of years, we just had um, a rise of exits in Europe. We never had access historically. But I looked up the numbers and in like 2021, there was uh, 3 trillion in enterprise value if you um, accumulate all the companies in Europe. We had in 20 and 21 about 350 billion euros in the exits. And all of these founders and operators, they finally had money to deploy and to give back to the ecosystem. You can only buy so many like, invest properties and you really understand the technology ecosystem. And so a lot of people ended up um, just really wanting to change something, wanted to bring like, the operating perspective into the European ecosystem. And then we had obviously the, also the rise of scout funds um, where there are probably 15 to 20 scout funds now in Europe, uh, which enabled smaller operators that probably didn't have huge exits yet um, to become active angels. Yeah, completely. I think scout funds have definitely played a bigger role and you see larger VC funds trying to encourage that angel community, that formation there. Zainab, what do you think about the whole scout phenomenon? Um, I agree with Gloria. Recycling of um, talents and capital is inc incredibly important for this ecosystem to be built. Um, and with the scout programs, it's particularly important in Europe because it's a fragmented ecosystem. So um, scout programs have been super powering early stage investing, particularly angel and seed, which is where the magic happens. And more than that, it's really superpowered collaboration. And as we know, it takes a village to build a company. So the more collaborative that all the funds work and the angels and the scout programs work, it actually helps the companies. Mm, definitely. So Carmen, I want to come to you now to kind of bridge that gap between angel investing and early stage funds. How do you see that collaboration taking step from like the pre pre seed to the first institutional check? Yeah, that's a very good question, and I think one that the wave of emerging managers on like microfunds, um, like Gloria's or Cocoa's, 
um, really um, is, is fostering. Because if you think about it, the beauty of being an angel or a microfund is that we're very flexible with our ticket size and we're very flexible with our stake, which means that we can really work together with funds and collaborate rather than compete and therefore kind of build win-win situations. So at the end of the day, because if Zainab wants to invest into a company, whether I invest or not doesn't take anything from her and whether she invests or not doesn't take anything from me, it can be both both of us, not just her or me, that changes the dynamics completely. And so we share deals, we share deals constantly, which has also made Europe a very fluid ecosystem in what people see. Um, we share DD insights a lot. <laughs> and we also, when it comes down to actually working with the founders, it's also a very symbiotic relationship because when you're small, like a micro fund and you have like an angel stake, the relationship you can build with a founder is different than when you have a big stake. It's not better or worse, but there are different relationships. And so if we both, the lead fund and like the small micro fund work together, we can really play the different roles to make sure nothing gets lost in translation and, and, and actually kind of people can coordinate and work together. So I think it's a very, uh, it's really moving the ecosystem forward and it's yeah. a lot of fun. Completely. I think you touched on a really interesting thing there, which was your ability to go in and not really care about how big a stake was and, and use that to form a collaborative relationship around a deal, right? And that's such a big question that so many VCs have. Is it about access or is it about you know, getting ownership? I'd love to hear your take on that, Zainab, because obviously you guys are a little bit further on in the value chain, right? How do you think about that and how do you explain that to founders? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a balance between access and ownership. So it's about investing in the right companies. Mm. And for us, um, as General Catalyst, we've been investing in Europe very actively since 2016. Uh, we were, at the beginning, more investing at the growth stage because we were based in the US. We opened our office two years ago. Then we became more active in Europe doing early stage investing. What we know is um, the European venture ecosystem is built on local funds. And they are incredibly important um, to this ecosystem. Um, and I think if you want to be collaborative and you want to be investing with other funds, then you need to sometimes give up on ownership. And that's OK, because that's something you can build over time. It's a lot more important that your partners are also getting ownership. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot more important that you're in the right companies and you have the right people around it to provide value add. I I think there are like two dimensions to say next point. I think there's one which is smart. There's one which is your fund model. And math is math, right? And, and the, you have two levers to maximize the probability of a company being a fund returner. The size of your fund, which you cannot change once you've raised it, and the stake you own. Because if you're a 100 million fund, you own 1% at exit, a company needs to be a $10 billion company. If you own 10% at exit, a company needs to be a $1 billion company to be a fund returner. And that's math. Now. And that's why the smaller the fund, the more flexible you can be on stake. Now, on the other, on, on Zainab's point, which is also very true, is understanding that this is a very long-term game, right? And that you, if you optimize for everybody feeling like that's a win-win situation, you can then build up stake in the future in that specific deal, and you'll get many more deals from those people. So I think that is the two kind of forces at, at play. We tell founders we don't give a damn about stake, but I can do that because of the fund model. And I really actually believe that funds who are much larger and are constrained math-wise, but understand the long-term like, nature of the game are, doing, are, are quite smart. So how do solo GPs fit into all of this, Gloria? <laughs> I think a solo GP is just a more flexible microfund model, meaning for me, what counts a lot is speed. I can basically go from meeting the founder from the first time to like making an investment decision in two, three, four days. What's the quickest decision you've made? Mm, 36 hours. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, basically. <laughs> Because I knew they had a lead term sheet that they hadn't accepted yet. They hadn't started speaking to angels. And in order to get the allocation that I wanted, I had to make a decision before they're basically going out to the, to the market. And so for me, that kind of being able to just drop everything else, not needing to go through several different levels of approvals. I mean, I was at Index for a couple of years. 
And I can tell you, like, it's definitely different levels of approval to get there. Sometimes with the US, so you have the problem with the time zones, et cetera. And I can just be like, OK, I believe in this or not. I do some references. I call a couple, a couple of LPs, operator LPs, and be like, hey, is this something you would use in your company? Yes, no. And I can be really, really quick. And that's kind of even easier if you're on your own and you don't have to even coordinate with a second GP. The most important point, though, for me was that the smaller the fund size, the more collaborative I can be, because then the fund model maths work really, really well. And so the more GPs you have, the larger the fund needs to be, because otherwise, also financially, at some point, it doesn't make that much sense anymore. And so for me, the way I was telling uh, the story to LPs was, look, as a Nikud on the block in Europe, I think you have to decide between ownership and access. Only the really brand name VCs can really do both. The Sequoias, they don't have to care about whether they get in, and if they ask for 15%, they'll get 15%. However, I have to decide between the two. Mm -hmm. So I clearly am going after Axis for several different reasons. A, it's more fun to work with the best founders across Europe. B, um, I think Europe is not a large enough ecosystem that, it, that there are tons and tons of unicorn founders uh, like starting out today, like every single year. So going into the best companies is even more important than in the US. Right. And so it was really important for me to kind of go after access. And at the same time, what I saw when I was an angel after my VC period, I saw the seed funds were raising larger and larger funds. And so all of a sudden, they had to play for ownership as well. Right. The, the multi-stage funds were coming earlier and earlier. Index launched a seed fund, for example, and they're going to continue being like that. So all of a sudden, they can't be collaborative with each other anymore. But there's room for someone like me. And I always say, like, Greed is a very, very big emotion, and meaning they're not going to decrease their fund size going forward. So they basically will need to play the ownership game going forward. And so there is a gap in the market that I can basically play in. Yeah, totally. And I think that hints to something that we've discussed before, which is some of these funds are going to get squeezed, right, in competition for these, these you know, fewer good deals, right? I know, Zainab, that's something that we were talking about, for sure. Yeah, so this kind of goes back to my point of when you're working and collaborating and you're investing with your partners, you want to make sure, as much as possible, everyone's happy. Yeah. And local funds are kind of the backbone of the venture ecosystem we have in Europe. So if a unicorn is coming out of Germany and there's no German fund that's invested in it, that's not really good for the ecosystem. Yeah. It's really important that the local partners that we have, the local successful funds, get to be a part of that journey. Um, so I think with the, what Carmen was saying, if you have that long-term vision, you need to make sure that the, the, the funds and people you collaborate with get to be in those companies. Mm, totally. The other thing that we haven't talked about today is liquidity. Um, and that's super important at the early stage, you know, so that those angels or, you know, founders turned angels or operators turned angels can also see some liquidity and put that back in the ecosystem. How have you thought about that as both an angel and early stage fund, Carmen? So I've thought a lot about that also because I <laughs> put together 100% of Hopkins pre-seed and everybody asks me if I sold on time. And <laughs> no, I did not. Um, look, I think that's a Europe, actually an interesting um, thing for us to think as an ecosystem as well. As, as Gloria was saying, Europe doesn't have that many exits, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have that many IPOs, but also acquisitions are getting harder and harder because of the competition. It, it is actually quite difficult to see um, the liquidity events. And so as a small um, shareholder, there is this question of like when to get out. And also, I think that we've constantly been debated between this idea of being builders and supporting the company till the end and the, another of our fiduciary duties, which is to generate returns for the LPs. And I think that that's a constant, like there's no answer. And there, but it is as an ecosystem in Europe, we should really think about it because I think that it is one of the things where probably the US is a little bit ahead than we are in that more like transactional money making mindset. Yeah. Um, even in like provoking exits when like a company is not 
going to be an IPO, but it could be a 200 or 300 million acquisition. And, and I think in Europe, we, we will get there, but it's still a little bit early in how to generate those liquidity events, not just wait for them to happen. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Gloria, how do you think about that liquidity question? What are some of the barriers you see there in Europe? The good news is that it's easier to exit 2, 3, 4%, yes. like a small <laughs> fund, than 20%, especially if you just uh, let the last round or the, the, the two rounds before, etc. So I really hope that at some point there is a there's a need to clean out the cap table. And as part of that, um, people like us can actually also exit some of the positions. At the same time, in my angel investments, I've been terribly bad at it because I always believe like, okay, yeah, exactly. they can go further, they can go further. So um, <laughs> Pikmin is one of my angel investments actually. <laughs> And I had the chance to, to sell all of my shares in the last round, and I said no. Um, and I hopefully won't regret it. Um, but I think definitely I'm only investing in B2B companies. Most of them need to think global from day one. So hopefully they have a chance to also go public in the US, for which you need US revenue. Otherwise, it's really tough to do that. And so hopefully it's going to be a little bit easier um, to sell some liquidity uh, earlier than in for some other types of uh, investors or for investors that I only spending or investing in consumer companies for sure, mm -hmm. uh, f for example, that have a harder time to exit, I would say. Yeah. Zainab, what's your view on the liquidity question? Um, Gloria kind of hit the problem. When we think about an IPO, we think about the US. Yeah. And I think that is the problem. As a multi-stage investor, of course, this is more of an urgent problem uh, for me, because we don't really get to do those secondaries when we invest in a company, we're there for the long journey. Even if you join at Seed, for example, Stripe, we're still with them and we're building our position and we still have a big share. And that's going to be really important in Europe. I think it's the one topic probably that keeps me up at night. Mm. You know, what is going to be the IPO market uh, going forward, particularly in my domain, which is more fintech? A lot of very successful outcomes are local companies. Yeah. They're in France, they're in Germany. Um, and the question is, where do they go public? Um, so I think that's something that the venture industry can, we can all collaborate on and think about, because it's going to be a problem that we're going to be facing in the next three to five years. Totally. Praying for access, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I want to kind of end off. We have a couple minutes left with a rapid fire round. So I'd love to hear from each of you First, maybe, well, we can, we can combine it. What you think some of the biggest risks or challenges are in the ecosystem? And what do you think European tech, European startup ecosystem needs to take it to the next level? Let's start with you, Carmen. I think I'll pick up on what we were talking about, which is the exit, like returns. At the end of the day, like what matters to LP is return generation. And I think that there is a question, and I'll start by saying, if I could choose where to start Cocoa again, I would do it in Europe 100%. So my conviction is full, but it is true that there is a question of where does Europe stand when kind of the tide recedes? And, and then like there's Asia, like there's, and then there's the US, and, and money allocation from the largest LPs in the world, like where, where is Europe left at? And we'll see. Yeah, great. Gloria? Mm, I think another aspect that doesn't get talked about a lot is where is our money coming from? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it is coming from, especially from the large funds, it's coming predominantly from American LPs. Yeah. Yeah. So the people that are going to make money here are in the US. It's the Canadian, American pension funds, endowment, university endowments, etc. And it's still super, super hard to raise capital in Europe. You have the public funds, the EIFs, the BPIs, the KFWs, et cetera, that probably uh, represent 50% of all early stage funds uh, capital base is probably from these public sources. It's still tremendously difficult to raise from European LPs. I probably spend 5% of my time raising from US LPs, and I manage to get 50% of my capital from the US LPs. Like, the decision making is so much quicker. Uh, in, the US, in Europe, it's like a six-month process, a nine-month process. EIF is like 
12, 15 months process. In the US, it's like two meetings. They don't know you, but they're still going to commit. And it's really like it's also hurting myself. I'm, I would prefer to like work for European pensioners and not for American pensioners. Um, but there's just not that much sophisticated LP capital. I would say the LP landscape today is where the European GP landscape was 10 years or 15 years ago. The level of sophistication and also the level of parties that are out there that can actually, that are professional and can actually write decently sized checks. Yeah, 100%, getting those institutional investors to believe in European venture, right? Zainab? Um, I agree with Carmen. I think we do th need to think about the IPO market, so that's definitely one, yeah. particularly for pan-European companies, because the IPO market is fragmented in Europe. Um, and the other thing I'll say is collaboration, because in Europe, um, you do need a village to build a company anywhere. In Europe, you need a very diverse village. So I think it's important for us uh, to remember that. Yeah, and it starts with panels like this yeah. with three amazing fund managers. Thank you so much today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, the question is, how do you get a Bavarian karate champion, a nuclear fusion PhD, and uh, the, the record holder in rowing here for the UK, how do you get them on one stage? The answer is actually very simple. You just host a panel on kind of the new frontiers of clean energy. So I'm, I'm super happy that today um, we'll actually have three amazing people on stage here. One is um, the founder of Theleron, Jorgen. He uh, invented, is in the process of inventing a new solution for storing energy, and he'll tell you all about it. He's the rowing champion. Then, obviously, the Fusion PhD is the founder of Proxima Fusion. That's uh, MIT PhD, Francesco, and then my partner in crime for the Tomorrow Fund, Tong, who is actually Bavarian champion in karate. And yeah, you guys, I hope you're going to have a good time here. Um, give it up for the three of them. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, so thanks so much for this nice intro, Bolly. <laughs> Very underwhelming achievement of mine that you pointed out. But yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a true privilege to have this platform, to share it with these two visionaries. And I think without further ado, let's, let's dive right in, right? Um, and let's actually start with some numbers. So in 2022, 40% of Europe's electricity came from fossil fuels, um, and the global number even surpasses 60%. So it's very clear that there's an urgent need to transition. And both of you are working on true breakthroughs in the clean energy space. So my first question is just, what do you think are the main shortcomings of our current energy system? And how are your companies, and you get a chance to present them, uh, tackling, tackling this massive problem. Maybe let's start with Jorgen. No, no, you start. <laughs> Is that my voice? Okay. It's my lucky day. <laughs> sure, so I'm, I'm Francesco from Proxima Fusion. We are a startup based in Munich, the first pin out of the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics in its 60 years of history. And we're working on bringing stellarators, some form of confinement device for hot, hot matter, to commercialization and to bring the power of stars, basically, for energy production. You ask, how do you see the, what are the shortcomings of the energy system? Well, I live in Germany. Of course, coal is pretty problematic. And we're investing a lot in different kinds of clean energies. And solar is so cheap and so wonderful at this point. But I see a shortcoming in thinking about the strategy of clean energy as only being that kind of renewable that is intermittent. I think we need to think a little more about baseload clean electricity. And that's where fusion comes in. I think storage. <laughs> please, please elaborate. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, um, Jesus, that's so, so bad. To hit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, renewables, very, very cheap. Um, 15 years ago were the most expensive way to produce electricity, and now the cheapest. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, 
and they vary. That's the issue with them. Uh, that's why we don't see it in the meter in our bills. So yeah, I think um, either base load or some combination of base load and storage um, is the solution. Yeah, let's, let, let's talk a little bit about intermittency. So especially renewable intermittency. Obviously, we don't have constant sunshine or wind, especially if we think about different geographies, right? So um, how is the industry currently dealing with this issue? And as we even deploy more and more renewables, which role does storage play? Because you mentioned storage. Um, yeah, uh, how are they dealing with it? They're not. <laughs> so, um, you know, energy goes negative pretty much every day in San Francisco, uh, in California. Um, in Germany, it's happening fairly regularly. It's wind, so it lasts longer, so it's days of negative energy even. Um, yeah, uh, currently, storage costs about 10 times the price of producing energy. So if you want to have renewables, you have to find either a new way to store it, or you have to find something to fill in those gaps. And right now, people use fossil fuels, and we're pretty fucked if we keep doing that. So, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What is negative energy? Uh, I think you need to explain that. Literally, it goes negative in costs. No one can find anything productive to do with it, so they just waste it. Um, so the price just keeps coming down and down and down until it's negative, and then they just turn them off. There's yeah. a cost associated with turning it off, so it has to go a little bit negative, and then guys go, wow, that's pretty bad. <laughs> and, and, and storage, it, it's more expensive, but um, I think we're betting a lot of lithium-ion batteries, for example, as grid energy storage, right? What's the problem with that? And are we going to get the, get the down costing that is necessary? Yeah, I mean, I don't believe so. Everyone's got an opinion. Um, mine is that un fundamentally, if you look at the material costs, I can't see how they can get low enough to make the storage that we need for that duration work. Um, we need to find something else fundamentally that energy is stored in. Um, and yeah, I don't think we're going to find that in lithium ion right now or in the future. OK. I might so, be wrong in you know, five years, 10 years, whatever. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll see. So Francesco, uh, let's, assume, let's assume we'll find a solution for storage. If we combine or pair renewables with efficient storage, it seems like we have everything under control, right? So, That'd be um, nice. <laughs> so, um, However, there has been quite a buzz recently about fusion energy. I think everyone in this room has heard something about fusion. Um, could you please tell us why fusion or how fusion does not only align seamlessly with this vision of a clean grid, but is even essential to rapidly phase out fossil fuels? Yes. So I think a lot of people have a vision of how the energy grid works that is very simplified. In practice, we need baseload energy. We need something to counterbalance, let's say, to, to match, to follow the load and complement the intermittent energy sources. So even if, if you look at any projection of how energy is going to be produced in a 2050 decarbonized European economy, you will always notice that there is still that chunk of fossil fuels out there. So at the moment, we don't have a solution for full net zero, full decarbonization without fossil fuels. So fusion, of course, is the more radical of the solutions that we can think of. We've been after fusion for 70 years. We know what fusion as a reaction looks like. The problem is not the fundamental physics. We're now entering a phase where it's the engineering, the scaling of what we've done in research over so many years. And if we, the reason why we've been after it for so long is because it could provide clean, abundant, safe electricity, really improve on other solutions and really create that cocktail of, of solutions that we fundamentally rely on. So it's not really about saying, do you prefer the storage? Do you prefer the solar? Do you prefer the wind? We, are not, we don't have the benefit of choosing one solution. We really have to find what matches each market, each situation, and Fusion will definitely have a place in that kind of future ahead of us. OK. Um, so I think we got very quickly into fusion and just assume everyone knows what fusion is. Can you give us an elevator pitch on fusion? Sure. So fusion is the energy of the stars. It's what burns inside every star. It's a fundamental process. Very different, basically the opposite of what is fission. So fission is what powers our nuclear power plants. Some people like it. Some people don't like it. Good thing is fusion has nothing to do with it. 
in the sense that fission deals with heavy nuclei that we split, and some of the mass is converted into energy. Fusion is the opposite in the sense that we take very light nuclei, most often hydrogen or forms of hydrogen. We bring them together, we smash them really hard, and then part of their mass also is converted into energy. This is the single most dense form of energy that we can imagine. So you could make from a spoonful of fusion fuel, so these forms of hydrogen, you can make the equivalent amount of energy as 11 tons of coal. If you think about 11 tons of coal, it's, it's a pretty substantial amount, and you understand why we are after this for so long. So fusion is really the ultimate source of energy. There is nothing after that for humanity to, to really achieve in terms of efficiency. Once we reach fusion as a viable, economically viable energy source, we really enter a next phase of human civilization. The question that is on many investors' mind is, when are you actually going to do it? Why have we been after this for so long and still don't have it? And that's for everyone to go and look up what has been the progress and why now there are 50 companies that are after fusion, and Proxima Fusion is one of them now. We think we have a shot at actually bringing fusion down to Earth. Cool, cool, thanks. So Love the strap line, bring the fusion down to Earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, and, and, and Jorgen, Francesco said 50 companies doing fusion. Will 50 companies be successful, or is it a winner-takes-it-all market in energy? Jesus. In energy, yeah. in general. What do you um, think? Like, I, I can't look from that perspective. I'll tell you about what we're doing. <laughs> but um, I think energy is a funny one. Uh, it depends how quickly you can get it in. If you've got the pants for it, if you've got the protection, then um, I think there's some possibility there. Um, but um, if you look historically, there's generally been one or two technologies that have been dominant, and there's been lots of other things around. Um, I think it might end up being a bit when it takes all. I know you think maybe differently on this. I think in each space, it's likely that there will be more than one. You know, you look at every major piece of technology, there is never, we try not to ever have a monopoly. We're looking also in the energy space more and more the question of energy resilience and energy sovereignty. So it's very likely that in Europe, we have to develop our own champions. This applies to storage, fusion, or anything else. So there will always be more than one party and different solutions. It's not obvious that fusion will be done in only one way. There are multiple approaches that are interesting. Different companies have different opinions about what is most likely to come to market first. Yeah, yeah. So we, we, we started it off pretty technically, but taking it more to the business side of things, right? A lot of VCs are here, most, most successful VCs on the planet. Uh, and VCs, historically, they have rather shied away from the energy sector. If you look at the clean tech 1.0 era in the late 2000s, right? Underwhelming returns. Um, yet, here you both are, diving headfirst into this exact space. And, and the question is really, why now, from your perspective? So what has changed to make frontier climate tech, the energy sector, um, maybe even the investment opportunity of our generation? Can I jump in on this one? It's I have very strong views, very controversial. <laughs> Let's hit it. Um, so I think if you look at the time it's taken for a company to get into the S&P 500 over the last 100 years, it's been decreasing pretty rapidly. Um, and most people think this is just the tech sector, but it's not. It's pretty much every sector. Um, and the same is true in energy. So the time it took for a technology to become the established technology in energy um, has been decreasing. So maybe coal, it was 80 years. Maybe natural gas, it was 40. Maybe wind, it was 25. Solar is now more around 20, maybe even 15 years to become established. Um, like those kind of time horizons are now coming into where VC is. And that's like not happened before. So you have this one factor, the time horizon is now correct. You have this other factor, which is like there's a massive change happening in energy. So like just to give some context, when the first kind of climate summits were going and in the mid 90s, um, they put all these targets forwards for 2050. Um, since then, it's gone from 78% primary energy from fossil fuels to being 73% in 30 years. In the next 30 years, there's like commitments in law that it's going to go from 73 down to 20, which is like a crazy, crazy change. So you've got this huge change in the biggest industry on Earth. Energy is the biggest part of world GDP. And you also have a time horizon that's now fitting in with the VC model. Like, I think you'd be... Yeah, there's some funds who aren't going on it, and I think they really should be. I think it's, um, it's the time to do it. Yeah. 
and I would add to that, I think, great points, different technologies should come into this picture of the VC world when there is an idea that is really changing how, how you could do things or when there is a breakthrough. And breakthroughs often come with enough research. And then there has to be a pain point. I think early on, Sebastian was talking about crises bring opportunities for founders. If you look at the energy perspective, I'm based in Munich. I think we have a bit of a pain point. I think there is a bit of an elephant in the room regarding energy in Germany, but Europe in general. The question that we need to ask ourselves is, have we suffered enough? Has this been ridiculous enough as an energy crisis? Is there a solution that actually meets the time horizon? As you said, things go faster than they have in the past. And then it's, there has to be an analysis of the technical roadmaps of the milestones that each company is proposing. But definitely, we are at a time when we absolutely need to invest in energy. And is the, is the situation, we see a lot of climate tech companies at growth stage move over to the US. What do you think about that? You're building in Europe, you're building in Munich, you're building in Oxford and London. Um, but what is your take on Europe versus US from a climate tech founder perspective? I think the US has greater access to VC funding, but that said, in I, the bet that we are both taking, I suppose, is that if you have the right technology and you have the right vision of how to fit into the energy system, the funding can be accessed. And Europe has tremendous advantages in some domains. I am not originally from Germany. I moved to Munich because that is the place where you can bring stellarators as a form of fusion device really to the next stage. So for us, Munich is the ideal ecosystem. It's where we can create this public-private partnership with the Max Planck Society. And all our bet is that that aspect of partnership, this, the conjunction of many conditions, is what will allow us to actually accelerate. And we hope to surprise people with how fast this is going to happen. OK. How many questions left? Two, three, four, five, x. Oh, OK. No, no, it's good. Um, yeah, look, I have a, a point that I, I feel very bitter about this. So uh, I went you know, at university with some very smart people. We did engineering. And they've all gone into banking or consultancy. And there's just a, like a, I don't know, an insepid culture of going into these things. Um, and like very talented people could be building amazing things. And you know, in my opinion, um, they're not. Um, and I think there's like a culture that needs to shift there. Like they need to be building stuff. Um, and I, you know, I really want that to change. I think that's when you make an ecosystem. When you make an ecosystem that's maybe an energy ecosystem in Europe, right? Like the talent stays. They want to be building these things. Um, I think that's awesome. That's what I, I have an ulterior motive with Thaleron is that, you know, amazing, talented engineers stay as engineers. And they don't become bankers and consultants. Um, if there's any in the room, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very interesting point on talent. But how about go to market? You mentioned California has this problem. Is California then a better place for Thaleron to deploy its solution first? Yeah, there's lots of places that um, are good. They have a, a great location. But um, yeah, I mean, I haven't said what we're doing anyway. So <laughs> no one knows why that's important. <laughs> OK, awesome. Yeah, let's, let's, uh, we have three minutes left. Uh, maybe also to understand this new wave of frontier tech founders of purpose-drivenness. Purpose I, I'd just be interested in this, this roller coaster journey, obviously, of building these super exciting, ambitious moonshot companies. Um, what, is, what is your fuel? Like, what drives you personally to get up every day and, and go all in, not only for the commercial return, financial return, but also to maximize your impact? Personally, I, I started my academic journey in physics. I was looking for a pretty radical way of affecting the world around me, looking for the highest form of impact. Fusion was that. So I've been chasing it for the last 10 years in my research. And getting into creating Proxima Fusion together with my co-founders has been incredibly energizing, and I think it's the one way in which I can actually make a big difference. I find that that is how we are attracting talent into Proxima Fusion. It's an extremely effective way of bringing people that really have our engineers. They want to not really work for an oil company or a SaaS company, and they, they really want to contribute to the energy picture. That same motivation is, is what really makes us yeah, push so hard. 
so that that, that actually helps you to attract talent that your company potentially can create a lot of impact. Absolutely. I think that having the clear mission is the single best way of finding the right people. How people about you, Yoga? What are, what, are, what are your drivers? Uh, I love building shit, so maybe that's why. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an engineer. Um, no, uh, I think there's another thing, which is, you know, if you look across every sector, so like progress of humanity is kind of energy in times efficiency of use. Um, and almost everything people are building is on the efficiency of use. You know, you're building a new SaaS product to make something more efficient. You're finding a new way to manufacture shoes, which is, you know, producing shoes at a lower cost. Um, but, you know, energy is like a, a fantastic thing to do because it touches everything. Um, you know, if you can make energy, and like, you know, solar is now 30% lower than energy has ever been in history, right? So if we actually got that at the meter, you know, what would that mean? That would mean that so many things that can't be done right now are possible. Um, and it would be, you know, humanity would change. Um, that's how I see it. I think energy is this incredible thing. Um, it's changing very quickly right now. And the time horizon is actually right for VC. Um, yeah, I don't know. This is why I think everyone in this room should be investing in it. Yeah, <laughs> not, awesome. Not, not just us, like this guy, everyone. <laughs> I, I love the obsession and it's, it's something of course, all of us look for in, in founders, and, and it's great. And yeah, let's, uh, let's wrap it up here. A huge thank you to our panelists for shedding light on intermittency, fusion, planets, uh, <laughs> the planet, storage, and, and everything else. And yeah, thank also you for, for caring about this topic, right? Um, and for your attention, and have a great evening. Thanks. We, um, Shravan and I, decided to do, a, to do it family style, um, yeah. sitting very closely to each other, because we're actually we're going to talk about family and what it's like growing up with a father who uh, started the second largest mobile phone company, well, not mobile phone, but the mobile Service. carrier in the world. And um, yeah, let's actually let's let's start right there. I sure. would say so. Um, what are the, the early memories? So, I mean, just, just to recap, maybe just also to get all of us on the same page. So, uh, Shravan, sitting right next to me, his dad, Sunil, um, started Bharti Airtel when you were eight. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just super curious if, if you have a dad who starts a, a company with 450 million subscribers, I think 18,000 employees, uh, sorry, no, 18 billion in revenues. 70,000 employees. I mean, that's, that's quite something. And you were at the tender age of eight. So what, what do you remember from back then? What, what is it like kind of growing up with, with Airtel? Yeah, I mean, it's um, quite a unique experience when you look back, uh, having um, somebody uh, at home building a business right in front of your eyes. Um, for me, my memories um, are really our everything around the family was centered around business. Uh, from a very young age, uh, my father had me and my brother reading the uh, stock price of different companies, uh, not really understanding at that age what it all meant. But you could see that he was very in, um, interested in making sure we were business-oriented and business-minded. I'm a big sports fan, so I used to watch the football matches on TV. And he would always be looking at the sponsors. He's like, oh, I know that one. You know, that, that, you know, is another telecom company in Europe. Or is it a telecom company in America? And I'm like, where is your focus right now? <laughs> and so the focus was always, always centered around business. And any time I used to go, you know, play sports or talk about what I wanted to do, at a young age, I used to think I wanted to be a tennis player and, or a football player. And he used to be, okay, that's great. But why not actually just think about, like, building a business in that ecosystem or by a club or by a league. And so I think, you know, we were all uh, very fortunate enough to uh, have his guidance along the way. Um, 
He's built a remarkable organization, um, almost 500 million customers, is the third largest telecom company in the world now. Uh, and to see the persistence over the last 30 years is uh, nothing short of remarkable. And did you, um, did you feel at the dinner table if business wasn't going well? So yeah. the mood swings was yeah. that? Dinner, dinner tables, yeah, at, 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 um, at many times became very tense. Um, and you understand it. And I think um, any entrepreneur that's building a business, uh, even today, you're going to go through a lot of tough times. And he's been through a handful of near-death experiences. And you know, at a young age, tr trying to make sense of you know, what um, an entrepreneur is feeling, there's you know, thousands of employees that are banking on him to build the organization. I'm sure he's thinking about doing well by the family. And so a lot of uh, um, stressful dinner table conversations, uh, no doubt about it. Um, but it informs also what we do now. So it's, uh, it's been unique to see that and you know, helps me in what I do today in dealing with entrepreneurs and, uh, and helping them in their journey. I think it would be, uh, it would be really great to actually double down on that and, sure. and to try to understand from those early memories what you actually took away from that, maybe also lessons learned that you're now employing with Unbound. And maybe you actually have to also introduce Unbound sure. to everyone. Yeah, so Unbound um, is um, an investment firm that I had started in 2017. And the entire concept of Unbound is really how do you deploy long-term capital in building generational businesses. And the idea you know, comes from my history of experiences. I've been in our operating business for three years. I've done uh, distress turnarounds, uh, was part of a few people, me and my father, we took out uh, one web from bankruptcy. And one thing was very clear is that entrepreneurs have committed their life to a particular journey. And what you really need along that journey is time, capital, and resources that can support you along the way. And what was really clear to me is that the, the model that, it, that we have today doesn't necessarily lend itself to supporting all the way through the journey. So I always say Unbound, uh, the name comes from not to be bound by the way the existing world thinks about solving a problem. And let's really be the long-term partner of choice for a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, and that's really what we're building uh, at Unbound. And it comes from the fact that to build a $60, $70 billion organization, it requires 15, 20 years. And that journey is a very long journey. It's not a five-year, it's not a seven-year, it's not a 10-year journey. It's a generational journey. And that's what we want to help entrepreneurs do. And that's also what you mean when you talk about 100-year companies? Right. So, I mean, the 100-year the companies obviously far. It's just to anchor the mind to think long term. Mm. Really, when we sit down with entrepreneurs, and you should speak to you know, anybody that speaks to our portfolio companies, I think the one clear thing that I think all of them will say is that we will have a very different conversation. We are not interested in what the next month, the next quarter, or even the next year looks like. And a lot of the companies we have supported at times where nobody else would be willing to show up. And the reason we're able to do that is because we have the long-term capital that backs Unbound, uh, which started initially with family capital, and now we have institutional capital sitting behind it. it in a, in a fun model, or I mean, not, yeah, so obviously now uh, you got me very yeah. curious here, uh, how you do that. Is, is there a duration, so or is it evergreen? So it, we, what we've, is got, it? we've structured it as a holding company. And I think that's really important, because the holding company allows us to do three things that's different than a typical fund. It allows us to take a longer duration. And so we use duration to our advantage. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's really important. We can double down on our companies, our great companies that are doing really well in year six, year seven. We don't have to worry about the fund cycle. And if companies are not doing well, but we still have a unique view and an insight that they are in a tough period, we can go and support those businesses. And so the holding company allows us to take an exceptionally long-term view. Um, investors do have the ability to take their money out, but you go all the way to year 15. Our assumption and our hope is that a lot of them will stay with us for a longer period of time. And how do you find those companies? How do you find those founders? What are they like? What, uh, how do you identify them? I would say the, the identification process is, you know, even you're, you've built a, a wonderful organization, and I think the identification process doesn't change. What we are looking for is, are you solving a large problem? Um, do you have the uh, ability to scale the organization? Mm. Uh, and I think that's 
I think one of the most critical things as a, as a leader, as an entrepreneur is can you scale an organization? Can you empower the organization to make decisions all the way across that allows you to be agile in, in, your, own, um, in your own journey? For me, I always think about looking at an entrepreneur for the next two or three years. And then every time there's more capital needed, you're reevaluating and re-underwriting the, the business and the founder. And that's, that's really the way we approach it. And would you say that actually having grown up in India, having lived in Africa, I think for a couple of years, yeah. overall having lived in seven countries, did that make you more attuned to finding companies like OneWeb or M Pharma, where somebody else may have stumbled upon those opportunities, but would have just passed on them right away? Yeah, I mean, it's, at the end of the day, everybody has biases, and the biases are built on the back of a set of experiences, right? So I was very lucky to be in Africa for two years, lived in eight countries. I mean, I did everything you could imagine. I sold SIM cards on the streets, put dishes on the tower, um, changed my surname, so for the first six, seven months, nobody knew who I was. So I could get a full induction into the world of telecom. Um, but that gave us unique insight more than anything about what it takes to integrate an organization, because we, had a, we made a $10 billion acquisition in Africa, how challenging that really is, and what it takes to build a business in an emerging market is exceptionally hard for a variety of different reasons. Um, one is your disposable income in an emerging market is a fraction of what we have here or in the US. I mean, if you look at the telecom average revenue per user in India is $2.50 per month. Over here, you're likely spending $30. And yet you have an organization that's you know, 18 billion of revenue, 60, 70 billion in market cap. And so it just frames the challenges very differently. And we use that to our benefit to identify great entrepreneurs. And um, business models like OneWeb, and yeah. I know you're very passionate about it. It's a, it's a low orbit satellite constellation. So essentially trying to bring internet to places where there is no internet currently. That's, I imagine that that also derives from having seen that live on the one hand. But then I think there's, there must be some other passion inside of you because you post about it. I would say, going through your LinkedIn and through your Twitter, it's, it's, it's a one where I, I'm not sure if you're a testimonial and, and you yeah. get paid to post. Um, <laughs> but there I, are, wish, I wish that was the case. I also me. saw uh, videos of you and your son, one of your sons kind of following the launch of yeah. one of uh, one yeah. new satellite. So uh, can, you, can you talk about OneWeb and, and that story for a bit? Yeah. I mean, the OneWeb story is exceptional. I mean, the, the reason why I'm passionate about it is we brought this company from the brink of bankruptcy to life. And so being, and, and we did it in the middle of the pandemic, right? So in June of 2020, the world is shut down. Uh, we were approached by the UK government to say, look, you guys understand telecom. This is a great asset. Can you help us revive it? And the speed at which we made that decision to bring the company out of chapter 11, to build the organization as a remote first organization is quite remarkable. And then Thinking through the benefits of having internet connectivity across the globe, I think we all know the benefits of having kids in villages connected yeah. that will never have internet if you don't have satellite connectivity. It's fundamentally impossible for terrestrial telecom businesses to reach the final places of the world. So hills, villages, I mean, aeroplanes will need a whole new infrastructure. And so to think through the fact that we can build a business almost from scratch, and build it into a multi-billion multi dollar generational asset that is making impact in society, that's the reason why I get excited. Because the impact is massive when you take a look at education, access to education, yeah. access to medical information, so AKA healthcare, um, business opportunities that arrive because of that, I, um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, using the, the last few minutes that we have, I'd love to uh, switch to a little bit, two, two more questions um, yeah. kind of on, on, on the personal side. So, you know, the two of us were both fathers. You have a three-year and a five-year-old. Yeah. And um, I, I, I was just curious, you know, how, how do you, what are the things that you do so that your kids actually can live an unbound life so that they <laughs> grow up being unbound little or large humans at some point? 
I would honestly say that's the toughest part of my day because, and, and the reason why it's the toughest part of the day is because every kid comes with their, you know, own sort of set of wirings in their brain, and it's um, it's the job of any parent, I think, is how do you ensure that at the end of the day, they're going to write their own story. How do you ensure that they are writing the best story they possibly can? Uh, and that's really the role as that, that I think of me as a father is that how can I ensure that they're getting the best experiences, but more importantly, also having the hunger. And I think that is super critical to me. I want the kids to be super driven, super hungry, and you have to make tough decisions in order to be able to uh, inculcate that. But if you have enough hunger and enough discipline, I think the rest of it will really take care of itself. And uh, you know, we're both me and my wife are working parents, so they already see both of us are out for work. We're coming late. They understand that you have to go to work to earn, to you know, enjoy the life that we do. And we just try to make sure that that message is very clear. And I, I actually really like that. I uh, so you you sold SIM cards. I also sold mobile contracts when I was a little kid and yeah. helped out at the supermarket. I actually, if Henry, if my little son, I, I'll try to get him to do the same because I, I thought it was very valuable. Okay, then um, actually, uh, as a last question, you talked about writing your own story and that you think that's important for your kids. H how was that for you? I imagine it, it was kind of hard with a brother, twin brother, also a founder, yeah. with that father, uh, growing up in that family. H how did you actually find your own way? Uh, yeah, I think our family is just a bunch of renegade entrepreneurs. I think there's some DNA wiring there. You know, my brother started his business um, and he's been at it for six, seven years. Really persistent. My father's built a business. My wife's building a business. My brother-in-law and sister in the hospitality business. We're just uh, a weird, eclectic combination of people that are trying to make their own mark. For me, honestly, I went through a process of elimination. I tried my hand at banking, didn't like it. I was in our telecom business, learned a lot from it brought companies out of bankruptcy, helped build OneWeb. And it's just a series of experiences that I realized that the view that I have of the world is to build my own organization. And my organization's job is to ensure that companies are being built at large scale. And it's, it's as simple as that. And I'm, I'm glad that I'm on this journey. And, and hopefully, Unbound can become as big uh, as other businesses we've created in the family. Thank you so much, Ravi. Thank you. Pleasure. Cheers. Ain't no sunshine when he's gone. It's not warm when he's away. Am I live? I think now. Yes. Good evening, everyone. I hope you've been enjoying yourself so far. We have two more panels coming up next, and I need your entire attention now. As you might know, we at Visionaries always strive to invest into solutions that have the potential to disrupt entire industries, and Getali is one of them. Getali directly connects individuals with qualified skincare experts, such as dermatologists and also plastic surgeons, providing a personalized skincare experience for everyone. I'm more than happy to welcome to Main Chow, the founder and CEO on stage tonight, who's been part of the Visionaries family since we led the sea drown in 2020. Fast forwarding to now, the team, Charmaine and her entire team, have garnered over 100,000 active users on the platform, have worked with 1,000 loyal clinicians, and have also raised more than 50 million in funding from Index Ventures, Village Global, as well as Headline and Visionaries Club. So I'm really happy to also have Georgia Stevenson from Index Ventures on stage tonight, who's also part of Getali's board, and who will talk with Jermaine about secrets on how she's been scaling and building Getali. So big welcome, applause to both of them. <laughs> okay. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. I think I think alcohol is now being served, so I hope people have got a drink in their hands for the final few sessions. Um, I'm so excited to have Charmaine here with me. I know you are 
a founder that doesn't typically gravitate towards the limelight or like PR very much. Uh, you raised three consecutive rounds before announcing anything, uh, which I think says a lot. So thank you for taking the time to be here. Uh, I also know you don't really like getting compliments and you're a little bit of a no bullshit kind of person. So I promise this will not be a sort of VC puff piece. The thing I will say, because it's a big deal for us, is that you know, very rarely do we invest or lead both the Series A and the Series B uh, in a company at Index. Uh, and I actually asked our team to run the numbers on, on that, because obviously we've both led the Series A and the Series B and get Harley. And over the last seven and a half years, 3% of companies we've done that in. So we're excited and uh, no pressure. Thrilled to be part of the 3%. Uh, so starting right at the beginning, I want to talk about kind of the formative experiences and insights you had uh, to build Get Harley. And the way that I like to bucket it is usually there's a sort of conscious, uh, recent insight, and you have that kind of you know light bulb moment. Um, and then also you have that kind of much uh, more sort of Im deeper embedded, longer standing, almost subconscious moments where you realize only on reflection made you into the entrepreneur you are today. So first, tell me about the conscious light bulb moment. And then second, tell me about that subconscious experiences. Yeah. Um, good evening, everyone. So I can't tell how the lighting's shining on my face, but um, I've always struggled with really terrible skin. And right around the time when I was in my late 20s, I um, really just wanted to know that I was future-proofing my aging process and I was looking at the right products and, and treatments for my skin. And this astounding statistic, which is that three skincare products are launched into the market every hour, really stuck with me. I'm the sort of person who just generally wanted the right results and the right products delivered to me without me having to really think. But I felt like the skincare and healthy aging market really wasn't um, delivering on that. It was a lot of confusion, a lot of marketing, a lot of celebrity, um, you know, branding, but not really tangible results. And so I thought, why isn't there a single source of truth or a platform where I could really digitally find what the right skincare products, treatments, practitioners would be for me? Um, and I thought it would be really interesting for consumers if that existed. And around the time when I had that insight, I was also, um, by that point, about eight years into my career in finance, I was investing mostly in healthcare and consumer businesses. I had worked on a deal rolling up dermatology clinics. And so I knew um, the economics of the dermatology space, but I also really internalized you know, the painful workflows that clinicians were going through. And I thought, you know, if I could build this platform that solved the problem for the consumer of finding the right treatments, products, practitioners on one platform, but equally also solve, you know, workflow problems for the practitioner, it would really be a winning proposition for both supply and demand. So that was, that was the genesis of Get Harley. Okay, nice. So that was the conscious light bulb moment. Now, on reflection, when you think about how you were kind of formed as an entrepreneur, are there pieces in your experience yeah. before that that has shaped how you approach the business? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the desire to invest in my own skin probably comes from this deeper um, desire to constantly improve. And I think, you know, this idea of being a better version of yourself every day. And I think that you can break down into, you know, building more meaningful relationships with people, um, you know, satisfying um, your intellectual curiosity, building a career. But equally, there's also something more aesthetic and superficial, such as looking and feeling the way that you want to. And I think one of the more subconscious moments actually goes back to when um, I was in my early teens. And um, my mother um, had this side hustle of selling clothing. So she would go to these markets and buy products wholesale and then resell these clothing retail and try to make a side income to support the family. And she would pick me up from school and then drive me to um, her friend's offices, and I, I followed her to my aunt's office. I remember distinctly that my aunt would like, kind of like community selling, you know? She got like her friends, all her secretary friends on the floor to kind of congregate in the ladies' washroom. 
And, um, and my mom would take all these clothes and start selling clothes to these women. And I distinctly remember, you know, in this very kind of humble, gritty, ugly bathroom setting, a group of women putting on clothes and then coming out of the stalls and sort of looking transformed. And I think that really stuck with me, the idea that what you wear and how you look goes beyond the superficial and it actually really, you know, impacts the way you feel and how you take on the world. And I think that really stuck and it gave me this sort of intangible insight when I, came, when, I, when I started designing the Get Harley experience. I wanted people to unbox and try these products and, and feel transformed and transported. Nice. I love that. Um, so aside from obviously that kind of, I guess, teenage operating experience, as you said, you're a banker for eight years. Um, I like to think we read LinkedIn uh, CVs for a living. We spend a lot of time trawling LinkedIn and trying to work people out from what they've done. And I remember looking at yours before we spoke and thinking, okay, Morgan Stanley, KKR, Goldman, you know, she's definitely gonna be able to crunch numbers, but can she actually roll up her sleeves and, and build a business? So what was that experience like going from finance to operating and what were some of the hardest kind of zero to one ground up things that you had to, had to do? Um, I think when I, when the idea struck me, I was so fixated on trying to validate whether or not the idea would work, um, and and I wanted to do that. I wanted to do that in the most capital efficient way. So I wanted to bootstrap it. I didn't want to kind of work on an idea that wouldn't go anywhere. Um, so what that meant was that I was a one man band. I was um, I wireframe the Get Harley sort of platform the way I thought it should look on PowerPoint because eight years in finance meant that I was just like incredibly good at PowerPoint. I couldn't work out Figma. Um, I, I text, like I, I went to conferences, I talked to doctors, I was a first salesperson, I was a first CX person, I was messaging patients. Um, I designed the box, I packed boxes, and I really tried to de-risk the idea a lot before I left my job. So, you know, one of the uh, favorite memories I had was that um, I had signed up these doctors, but I didn't really know if it was going to go anywhere. And then suddenly I get an email that's like, this doctor has made a skincare plan for that person and the person has bought. And then I'm like, oh my God, I actually need to go find these products and box them up. Um, and I would then, you know, do that and then head into a cab on the way to Fleet Street, drop off the products and then head to work. Um, so I would say that was like the level of hands-on-ness uh, that, that, that I had with Get Harley. Uh, another fun fact, I operated Get Harley out of my flat for a, a good year actually. Um, and my first, the Get Harley first office is actually just right next door to here. It's 15A North Audley Street. And if you walk past, you'll see a sign that says, CCTV, do not steal products or whatever. Basically, at some point, we were getting quite a big volume of boxes like in front of the lobby, and people would just come in and take products. And so our hacky way of trying to stop that was to, to put up this very um, non-credible sign, but it worked. And the sign's still there. The sign is still there. <laughs> nice, nice. And so I think, you know, you talked about it there, right? A practitioner kind of reaching out to you. You know, you, it feels like from the get-go, you felt this pull. Um, yeah. and I, I think that's something that we were and still continue to be struck by, but particularly when we first started talking, you know, two and a half, three years ago, that for actually a relatively early stage company, the level of product market fit was always very strong. That consistency, that predictability, um, and that's rare. And we often get asked, like, how do I know when I hit product market fit? Yeah. How, how did you know and why do you think you managed to get there so quickly? Yeah, I think you know, for me, um, I thought when I started the business that product market fit meant that doctors would use our platform to create skincare plans for patients and patients buying and, and spending a certain amount and then them coming back and showing some kind of like retention pattern. I mean, it's a very kind of finance um, yeah. basic concept, I guess. But the reason why we were able to prove that out, and I think it was so consistent, is because I think by the, by the time I started Get Harley, it was a problem that I was living with as a consumer for so long. You know, I've always had bad skin. I've always tried to find products. And so trying to distill that dissatisfaction into a solution that was simple enough wasn't too difficult for me, I would say. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is, 
I had looked into the space, um, but what I also did early on is I would um, volunteer free time to go help out in clinics. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I, um, I showed up to different clinics, and then I would just hang out in, at the reception. And then I would, I would like build a relationship, and then I'd be like, you know, do you need me to help you in the, in the room? I'll just come in. And I would observe these workflows, and I was just like part of the furniture. But I think that that, um, that level of understanding of the consumer problem, and then doubling that with you know, really trying to understand how the practitioner feels in their day-to-day, -day, and then creating a very, you know, like try not to test too many things, two to three features, make it super simple and put it out there and see. And I think that just kind of worked for us. Yeah. No, and the reason why I love that kind of people first approach in terms of understanding, you know, what the value proposition is to each of your stakeholders is I feel like quite typically we'll see early stage teams and early stage businesses that are, have a little bit of the mentality of like, we will build it and they will come, right? And it means that they build kind of within a within a bubble or within a uh, sort of garden shed, and you don't get those insights and, and empathy for the people that you're building for. So yeah. I think that that's really striking. The other thing, I mean, we, we talk about this a lot. My view is that sales is your superpower. I know you don't like me saying that <laughs> because sales still feels kind of like a dirty word yeah. or uh, sales Z, which is something different. I'm biased because my first job was sales, doing you know, cold, cold walk-ins for Deliveroo. Uh, but in, in general, I think you know, a lot of people are selling all the time. I know if, if a venture capitalist tells you that they're not selling to you, then they're just bad salespeople because <laughs> they're lying. But anyway, I think you're particularly good and particularly sophisticated at building sales playbooks within your business and making it so much part of the culture from day one. Like, how have you done that? And what are some of the, the learnings that you've had from, from that? Um, how have I done it? I think it's really going back to basics, trying to understand the person you're trying to solve a problem for, and then trying to work out based on how they're feeling and based on their day, how do you then try to translate that into a funnel? Mm -hmm. um, and then trying to, it's, it's basically a, a very distinct understanding of how they feel in their day, and then trying to work out, okay, given how they're feeling, what does the funnel look like? And then trying to measure that, looking at the drop-offs, and then going in a very methodical way, trying to come up with, okay, the reason why this funnel is dropping here is because they feel this way, and therefore, what are the one or two things we could do to counteract that feeling? Um, and then just testing in a very methodical way. Yeah. yeah, I think it's the combination of like not trying to do everything at once. Like you, you ruthlessly sequence. And yeah. you know, in so many sessions we've had, you're like, I'm going to just look at this bit of the funnel. Everything else can be burning, yeah. but I'm going to look at this, and I'm going to fix it. And I'm going to understand what, what levers work. Um, yeah. That's felt very intuitive. I'm sure other pieces of being a founder and building a business have felt less intuitive. What's been the hardest thing for you to learn to be good at? Um, so I am like a massive introvert, um, but Get Harley actually is powered by a community of like incredible practitioners. So it's actually a very extroverted role. So I think the less intuitive part for me is actually, you know, pushing against the, the desire to just be in my spreadsheet and, and getting out there and talking to people um, and, and sharing our story. Okay, nice. Okay, final question. Okay, so if you could kind of, you know, talk to the you four years ago next door, uh, packing boxes and then ferociously guarding them uh, before they get stolen. What's the one thing you would have done differently? You know, in the early days, um, you don't have very much data points. You don't have very much benchmarking. And because I'm such a data-centric person, I kind of almost fought against listening to my intuition because I didn't want my biases to, to kind of tip me one way or the other. But I think you know, especially when it comes to hiring and culture fit and people um, assessment, sometimes listening to your gut isn't, isn't all that bad. And I think, you know, some of the hires that I've made that were not quite right, oftentimes the gut was right. So I'd probably just tell myself to lean into that a little bit more, but also constantly be conscious that you're not, you know, being um, biased or, you yeah. know, unthoughtful about it. Yeah, being intentional about it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Charmaine, thank you so much for spending time with me here today. If anyone hasn't tried Get Harley as a product, you must. Uh, and thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure.
Cool. Okay, guys and friends, I can only invite everyone. Please have a seat here. We have one amazing highlight session tonight. So come on, everyone. Please, please have a seat. Then, then it's a little easier. I'm really, really excited about this last session. It's a very special one for me personally because it brings together so many of the things that we've discussed today, starting a company out of a personal pain point, obsession, turning adversity into an advantage, building something very enduring with a very, very long lifetime horizon. So I'm incredibly excited to welcome a person who's called Wildcard in his own company. We'll get to it in a minute. So a big welcome, Nate, co-founder and chief strategy officer of Airbnb. <laughs> Thanks so much for being with us. You get the large sofa, come on. <laughs> So, thank you so much for joining us, Nate. Oh, my pleasure. And it's great to be here tonight. Great to have you in Europe. Um, let's jump right in. We had a session this afternoon with Mike Moritz speaking about obsession and that the germ of breakthrough ideas doesn't come from university. It comes from an avocation and obsession that you have as a teenager. Take us back when you were a teenager. What, what drove you? What, what was your obsession? Well, uh, I always like to tinker with things. and. Um, at the age of 12, I was homesick from school one day, and I started looking through my dad's books that he had about computers and coding. And that began a hobby of coding uh, that I had. And I was posting my work on the internet, saying, if you like my work, please send me uh, $5. <laughs> uh, well, nobody ever sent me $5, but I got a phone call at the age of 14, and someone said, I want to pay you $1,000 to create something similar. And my dad laughed and said, son, no one from the internet is going to pay you $1,000. Uh, I said, whatever, dad, I'm going to do it anyways. And I did it. Sure enough, I did get paid. I also got introduced to other people who wanted similar work done. And I think, you know, I seen a trend, if I look back, which is that, you know, I always just had this passion to build. And sometimes it didn't really matter what my expectation was. I didn't expect to get paid even. I did the work and something good came of it. Yeah. Um, and so you never know when you're doing a project and you're building something, the interesting ways in which it might help you in the future. I think, you know, We'll talk a bit about Airbnb, obviously a big success, but you know, aside from Airbnb, there's plenty of things I've worked on that I've thrown away. But I look back to all those projects I threw away and I think to myself, I actually learned a lot yeah. in the process. And I don't think Airbnb would be successful without having learned uh, you know, uh, on the job, basically. The yeah. job being, the, being pursuing my passion. So you know, the, the act of tinkering, learning how things work, building, you know, set the foundation uh, for, for success with Airbnb. I love that story and how early it started. Let's maybe speak a little bit about choices because you had to make a really, really difficult one when you were at university. And since we have many students, next generation entrepreneurs here, so you got accepted into Harvard undergrad and you built a company actually many years before that was doing one million revenue. So quite something successful for someone who just goes to university and you decided to stop it and to finish university. How hard was that decision? And you know, there are some friends like Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, who decided to do it the other way. So how, how did it feel back then? Yeah, well, there, there's a couple of decisions I made. One was, you know, when I was applying to colleges, my dad was like, you know, you don't have to go to college. So, like, you have this business, you know, I'll set up a trailer in the backyard and you can <laughs> run your business out of there and have your own space. And I said, well, you know, dad, I, 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 I feel like this is a, a unique, experience I want to go through. So I applied, I got into Harvard, I went to Harvard, and I was trying to do both for the first year, and I did. But it got to be too much. And I, I made the choice to stick with Harvard and shut down my, my teenage year business. And I guess there's a couple parts to it. One, I mean, it, look, it, it wasn't like a $100 million company or something. <laughs> it, it really <laughs> it was, was just Maybe it me. would have been later on. So. Yeah, so maybe the answer would be different if it was something of that scale. It was more a lifestyle business. A good one, I had made a million dollars already in high school. Yeah. Um, but I guess I decided that there will always be another time. Yeah. I guess I had confidence in my skills. And I thought to myself, I can only do Harvard once. I can only you know, be 19, 20, 21 and do this Harvard thing once. And I was enjoying it. So I'm going to do this now. And I know I can always come back to entrepreneurship afterwards. I, I was confident in my skill set. I could start a new business. So. Uh, well, I guess it worked out. <laughs> so the good news is you started this other little company called Airbnb afterwards, which turned into 
quite a success as well. And speaking about it, you, you started in 2007, 2008 with your co-founders, which was in the middle of a recession. And I think you once said, an uncertain economy creates opportunities for entrepreneurs. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit. What, what do you mean by this? I mean, I think there's at least two things that we experienced that I think you know, would be true for others too, which is you know, one, so again, this is 2008, great financial uh, uh, recession. Um, and for us, our earliest users were bankers in New York who had just lost their jobs and you know, no longer could pay for their mortgages or their rents. And they were coming to Airbnb as a way to make the income to, to pay for their place. And I don't think they would have given it a shot had it not been for that situation. And so I, I do think um, a challenging economy pushes people to try new things. You know, it stresses the system. Uh, and so I think that's just generally something to keep in mind that, you know, adversity uh, can, can uh, encourage people to try new things. But the second bit is, and also very important, is, you know, that first year we weren't able to raise capital. We tried, but we couldn't. Uh, so we had to be very scrappy. Um, and I actually think there's something good about that. Because what I found was when we did have money in those early days, and even it's true today, yeah. but the minute you have money in your pocket, I mean, it's easy to spend it. And when you spend it, you're not always, um, if you have, it, it, it doesn't force you to make trade-offs necessarily. Um, and so I think in those early days when we got some small investments, we were quick to spend it. We probably spent it on the wrong things. But the fact that for so long we didn't have money forced us to be scrappy uh, and creative. And I think that's true even for you know, big companies and even for us today, you know, like the yeah. pandemic uh, you know, really forced us to, to, to be scrappy and, and reevaluate what people were working on and prioritize things better. Yeah. Great starting point because you know, we discussed a lot about today you know, that we don't want to talk about recession interest rates and all those things, but we want to talk about building companies independent of cycles because everyone who we had on stage today was starting a company actually in a time where it was not that easy. So great to see that sometimes maybe in the beginning you're more capital constrained, you're more kind of focused on really building a painkiller and not a vitamin for the market. Maybe given that was not the only crisis, so it feels like the journey of Airbnb had been so impressive by what you managed in 2011. The first home got ransacked. You had to fight a lot with regulation. And then if that wasn't enough, there was this little crisis called COVID, which basically shut business down 100%. Um, I think you once mentioned a quote by Andrew Grove, bad companies are destroyed by a crisis, good companies survive a crisis, but great companies are defined by a crisis. How have those crises impacted Airbnb as an organization? Yeah, I think our first real crisis was back in 2011. Um, yeah. It was this incident where, you know, for the first time, someone's apartment was really vandalized uh, by a guest, and it was a very high-profile situation written about widely. Um, and this was a big crisis because it went to the heart of what everyone fears, which is how can you trust someone with your, your asset of your home, you know, a very personal thing. Um, and these were early days, and so people were like, you know, I told you so. It wasn't a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, I guess a couple things. One, you know, we treated it like a crisis. Uh, you know, on the one hand, you just kind of were hoping it would blow over and it was tempting to just say, yeah. okay, just give it a couple days and, you know, the news media will move on and, you know, people forget about this. But we didn't do that. We didn't manage it away. We didn't wish it away. We actually leaned into it and we stopped everything we're doing. And this, at this point, we had like 200 employees. We said, everybody, stop what you're doing. Everybody needs to brainstorm. How can we make Airbnb um, more of a trustworthy platform? Yeah. And over the span of just two weeks, we actually launched 40 new features that were all- 40, 40, 40 features in, in two weeks. Wow. So you uh, were head of engineering back then, so it was, seemed to be quite busy days. <laughs> well, I mean, people worked a lot around yeah. the clock. It was a 24-7 for yeah. two weeks. Uh, everybody stopping what they're doing, contributing. Uh, and we, 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 we launched 40 features, and um, you know, many of them were features that still exist today, but I think nobody expected that kind of reaction. And that's the key with a crisis, or restoring trust, I should say. You need to go above and beyond what people expect. 
You know, people expected us to try to make the situation right. I don't think they expected us to go launch 40 new features two weeks later. Yeah. And so I think, you know, that's, that's kind of the bar. Um, and, you know, you, you got to internalize that a crisis, you need to go from what I call like a peacetime operating rhythm to a wartime rhythm <laughs> where, you know, you tell everyone to stop and it's very tops down and you say, hey, like, you know, we're going to do X, Y, and Z to get ahead of uh, this, this crisis. And so anyways, that's something we experienced early on, very painful, but we learned this lesson that you can come out stronger. And so now every time we, we think there's a crisis, we, we, we are quick to, to try to realize it and basically yeah. tell everyone, we got to stop what we're doing. We got to lean into this, yeah. we take it seriously. And we did the same thing with the pandemic. When yeah. we saw the pandemic happen, we didn't make incremental cuts and try to like wait out and see what happened. We instantly kind of leaned in and said, hey, we got to be bold and decisive yeah. um, and navigate this thing proactively. Yeah. Did this also shape you as a person? going through all those things? Uh, well, absolutely. Um, look, it's a scary time. Um, and you also have to realize that all your employees are scared, your people are scared, your community might be scared, they're reading things about you, you know? And so I think the key, another key lesson is um, communicating yeah. proactively. And it's hard because you don't have all the answers and there's probably things that your lawyers are telling you you can't say, um, but you still have to talk to people. You have to build the trust with your employees with your stakeholders through this. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there is a temptation in these situations to just kind of, yeah. you know, go off and hide or wait an extra few days before you say something. Um, but I, I think every day matters. I really admire with how much authenticity you guys have handled all those crises because I think there are many lawyers and consultants that maybe consult you how, to, how you would deal with such a thing and how the playbook would look like. And you did the opposite and maybe that's exactly why you sustained because you kept it as entrepreneurs and just kept being authentic. You know, the, the theme today is disrupting to endure, as you know, and maybe we can speak a few about a few crucible, crucible moments uh, in your journey. One was in 2011. It's actually, in retrospect, a little funny one, a very embarrassing one for Europe, but this company called Vimdu came up raising 100 million euros, copying your model one on one, and then I'm just giving a quote what Odi Zamba said to you. You are the Americans, you're the innovators, we're the executors, we're gonna copy you, we're gonna clone you, we're gonna out-execute you if you're not going to buy us. So what was your initial re reaction and why is Airbnb now worth 100 billion and Vimdo is worth zero? <laughs> This, this, was, this was kind of super scary at the time and like probably one of the biggest decisions we ever made. Absolutely the biggest decision. Um, at the start of 2011, we were just 40 people. You know, the year prior we had raised just $7 million, dollars, 70 million or so post money valuation. And then in May of 2011, <laughs> still, you know, let's say probably 50 people, we raised $100 million dollars at a $1.3 billion dollar valuation, huge jump. And part of that's also Pretty much the same raise, right? So could say equal amounts in the beginning? Uh. Well, we raised this money because we knew we had to scale internationally. We knew we suddenly had competition. And, you know, a week later, the Samware brothers announced that they're putting $100 million dollars into this venture too. And so, you know, this is very intense. And they approached us about cooperating, about doing a deal. And so we had to, you know, a fiduciary duty, we had to kind of take it seriously and consider it. So we came out to Berlin and checked out the operation and, you know, like I said, we were 40 or 50 people at the time and I go into an office with 200 people in front of me, like this room, <laughs> with their laptops out, you know, <laughs> with our website pulled up and they're, you know, copying <laughs> CSS and HTML and so messaging You can see hosts. them literally copying one on one. And it's just like, it's like, well, I have 40 people, you have 200 and like, it just, it just was such a mind, such a scary thing. <laughs> um, and then there was their reputation and their, re great reputation for executing, um, serial entrepreneurs. Um, and, you know, they have basically existing offices and teams. And we thought, wow, you know, if we work together, you know, we, we are the visionaries, we have the ideas, but you do have the manpower. We could do something together. And if we don't do something together, I mean, you're quite literally um, picking us apart. Uh, so we were entertaining it. I think the thing, the really important thing that we realized, though, was that we were dealing with mercenaries. You know, all these people had been taken off another company probably three weeks earlier, 
and repositioned into this new venture. Um, and you know, probably three months later, they'd be onto something else. Um, and you know, that might work for certain business models. And Groupon you know, had been the famous, fastest growing e-commerce company the year before. And they played a big role in that success story. And I think for the Groupon model, maybe it kind of worked for a while at least. Um, and I can see how a transactional kind of mercenary model might work. But for Airbnb, which is so trust-based, we didn't think it would work. And you know, one of the tactics was you know, basically you know, messaging hosts that were on the Airbnb platform and trying to convince them to come onto the Wimdu platform. Yeah. Um, and people would because they would be incentivized to. Uh, but those incentives don't buy loyalty. It doesn't really buy trust. And of course, the platform wasn't robust enough to really create the trust either. Yeah. And so we realized you know, these tactics, they're not going to work at buying trust. If we work together, I'm sure we can do it. But we also realize if we don't do it together, that their tactics might not be as big a threat as they seem. And so we, we said, look, if, if we work with them, we're not going to like who we become, right? We, we really believe in this for the long term. I think they believe in it for the short term. So uh, we care a lot about our culture and, and, and hiring missionaries. So we're going to do it our own way. But we did feel like we had to respond. And so we built our own team very yeah. quickly all across Europe, hired our own people. Um, and built with a little bit more of a long-term mindset in terms of the culture we wanted to create. Yeah. And, you know, ultimately over the span of a year or two, um, you know, achieved massive scale, whereas yeah. they struggled. And again, I think it came down to the fact that you can't buy trust in a transactional way, and yeah. our business is built on trust. I must say, I just love this story because it's almost like a university case study with a control group where you have product-driven founders who are obsessed and who are thinking in a 20, 30 year horizon to really build something long versus we're business school guys, we're quickly copying something, we want to quick flip it within five years and, and there you go, there's the result. So maybe good advice for you when you, when you start a company and, uh, and very impressive how you've dealt with the situation. So actually, again, adversity came for advantage because maybe they even pushed you to be faster in Europe, to be more aggressive. Oh, for sure, to, yeah, uh, we had to change the way yeah. we operate and be much more aggressive, yeah. 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 Another very crucible moment is not that long time ago when COVID hit in, maybe the biggest pandemic of our time. And I mean, what a story when a successful business that you've built over years, basically the core of your model goes to zero. So travel dropped by 80%. And what I don't get in my head is how the fucking hell can you IPO a travel company just after or within the crisis via Zoom with a 100 billion IPO. So how did you react to this crisis and how did that happen? I mean, I, I never would have <laughs> suspected that in, in March or April or May or even June of, of 2020. But a few things happened. Um, you know, most obviously when the pandemic was declared, borders closed, we lost 80% of our revenue in eight weeks. Yet, you know, we had 7,500 employees, global officer, we had huge burn and suddenly no revenue coming in. And so we just immediately knew that we had to make the hard financial decisions uh, to right size the business, which meant raising billions of dollars, it meant doing a big layoff, uh, which was you know, an exceptionally sad thing, um, but also very clear um, that it was, it was necessary. But also with fewer resources, we had to decide, you know, if we can basically only finance half the company or uh, afford half the company, you know, which half do we want to keep? You know, what's most important? There's an opportunity to do a very rigorous prioritization. Um, and we decided that, you know, we need to, the core, what's most special about Airbnb is our host hosting our core business. We need to double down on the core, you know, leading up to the pandemic. We had raised a lot of money. We were going in a lot of different directions. We were doing flights and luxury and hotels and all these different things that, you know, they're not bad ideas, but they, um, they weren't our core business. Um, and so we doubled down on the core. And that didn't just mean um, not doing the other stuff. It meant we reorged the company so that, you know, basically we're now a functional organization, not with like lots of BUs, but a functional organization. Like, you know, basically everybody worked on the same things all your best people worked on the core business. And you know, with that kind of collaboration and focus, uh, we were very productive. We started moving really fast. 
And that was important during the pandemic because you know, things were changing very fast. Con yeah. Consumer expectations about safety um, and where they wanted to travel, uh, rural areas, longer stays, this was happening and evolving month to month. And so we were actually able to sh respond to that very quickly. And I, so I think the important thing we demonstrated during the pandemic is adaptability. And yeah. there are two parts to that. One is that Airbnb is inherently adaptable because we have homes all around the world and, and cities and rural areas. And, you know, we can accommodate any kind of use case inherently. But also, I think from an execution standpoint, we adapted. We were able to adapt because we got really focused and really rigorous about prioritization and making trade-offs. Yeah. And that allowed us to execute and, and basically, um, you know, start to get some tailwinds in the second half of 2020. And not just tailwinds, but we are now a more lean and fit company too. And we had demonstrated that we could make hard decisions. And so it actually was a really exciting, you know, IP story for investors yeah. uh, when they saw that we could navigate adversity with so much success. Yeah. I think it's, for me personally, it's the most impressive IPO story I've ever seen because I think managing such an IPO in such a market time is uh, something almost unparalleled. Well, and like our valuation, it dropped down to like raising money that was effectively like $30 a share mm -hmm. in, let's say, May. You know, pricing an IPO, I think somewhere around 68, which was relatively high for what we had thought even a few weeks before. And then, you know, on opening day, the price going up into the like, I think, 130s or somewhere there, yeah. so, somewhere thereabouts. So, I mean, it was just such a roller coaster in a short period of time. Yeah. Um, better than could be expected. Speaking a bit about resilience, 15 years in, all the three of your co-founders are still with the company and it doesn't seem any one of you wants to retire soon. What still keeps you so hungry and what really motivates you, what pushes you to achieve? I still think it's a very special opportunity. I think that there's the mountaintop of where we could take this thing is, is so much higher. Um, and, and I think we have you know, more resources than ever in terms of talent, capital, uh, to go do things, to go build. Um, and I also think these challenges are more likely to be addressed and overcome and, and make this a reality you know, with the founders involved. Um, I think you know, as a founder, you inherently think longer term and you're inherently kind of excited by taking that big bet. Um, in a way that you know, someone hired with a shorter time frame just you know, might not be excited to bite off. Yeah. And so you know, I think that's what keeps me fired up is that there's still really, I think, impactful stuff to build where I can play a unique role yeah. um, and realizing that you know, it's, it's a special company in terms of how it intersects with people's lives all yeah. around the world um, makes it really interesting for me. And I love, again, speaking about obsession and, and passion in your told me just now that you're traveling Europe with your family, so you're basically going city by city. How much of your stays is Airbnb still? Because I love that your founders, you still rent your apartment, you you're just love being part of that journey all day. So speaking about Europe, London, Munich, all those uh, hubs you're traveling, are, are you staying like with the whole family a lot in, uh, in Airbnb places? Or well, well absolutely. I mean, if you have a family, like you know, <laughs> Airbnb makes a ton of sense. It makes a ton of sense no matter what, I would say. But, uh, if you have a family, you need extra bedrooms and space, and you want to be together as a family with a living room and a kitchen, I mean, that's, that's the value proposition of a home. Uh, and so, yeah, we're, we're staying uh, on Airbnb here in London and, and for, for uh, uh, most of the trip. And I'm, I'm keeping track of it, but so far we're at 100% Airbnb. Uh, <laughs> that's amazing. So maybe we can get some discount vouchers later today during the party and uh, <laughs> for, for all of us to travel. <laughs> Time is almost over, but I would still love to do two more questions. If you guys are up for it, I think we have enough uh, very, very well. <laughs> um, maybe a personal one, and I don't know if I've already asked it because you've spoke about so many of your experience, but is there any lesson that you really had to learn the hard way, either privately or while you were running Airbnb, which was really tough? Well, I, I think the prioritization one was, was tough. And I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about why. You know, I, I mentioned that during the pandemic, you know, because we had ourselves in a crisis and uh, less headcount and less resources, um, 
you know, we had to cut a lot of projects. And I mean, I, they were all good ideas and a lot of effort had gone into it. And, you know, we lost 1,800 teammates. And I mean, all that was yeah. incredibly you know, sad and disheartening. Um, but I look back and I realize that, you know, some of that was also the product of, you know, not making trade-offs earlier. I mean, we yeah. could have had a tighter process and, and never gotten into that situation. And I think many companies are in a situation where, you know, after a decade of, of um, I'll, I'll say easier money, fundraising-wise, um, and hyper-growth, you know, it's easy to become a company that's a bit bloated and doing too many things and not focused. Um, yeah. And I think now that the company is thriving, once again, we're being very careful not to um, hire too quickly. Instead, just ask ourselves, with the talent that we have, um, you know, what, what's most important? And, yeah. and why do we need to be doing more stuff? Let's just be more careful about the things we choose to do. And so I, I think that discipline is something that's going to stick with us, even though we're outside of the, the window of adversity. Yeah. Um, and I think it applies to most tech companies. Uh, that have gone through the last decade. And I think it's the silver lining on what we've just gone through in this environment that we're in that's a little tougher. I do think that going back to the founding of the company, like when you have access to money too easily, it doesn't force the hard choices. Yeah. Yeah. And hard choices, I do think, you know, make for better outcomes. Yeah. Thank you so much for this honest, honest answer. One last one. A few friends told me within your company you're called the wild card. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, well, I guess my, look, I've been at Airbnb for 15 years. And throughout that period, I've done a lot of different things. And my general philosophy has been like, we're lucky enough to be hi hire like amazingly talented people, people who know much more about any given subject than I do. And so whenever you can do that, you do that. You hire people better than yourself. You put yourself out of a job. Um, and, you know, one, you get great talent and, and someone better at running engineering or whatever than, than you could do. Um, but second, I found that there's always something that uh, loose ends, strategic projects, something new that needs founder attention. And so there's, even though I'm constantly putting myself out of a job, it makes myself available for the next challenge, which inevitably, if you're going through a lot of growth, there's always a challenge and something to jump into. And so that's meant over the last 15 years, I could jump into a lot of different things Uh, whether it was originally the engineering team and then I ran online marketing for a while and our analytics team and I've been running our payments team for the last six months. Uh, I, I did our China expansion, a lot of international growth. So I've touched a lot of different parts of the company. And I think, you know, one thing I also realize, a superpower that a founder has uh, is ability to create collaboration across the company. And this becomes really important the bigger you are. It's one thing if everyone knows each other and you're like 100 people or a few hundred people, but when you have thousands of people um, and a lot of new people, you know, they don't know the history of the organization, the context. They don't know who to talk to, to, to unlock a bigger idea that's outside of just, you know, their area of influence. And so, again, as a, as a founder, being available to work with teams um, and create that collaboration. And look, I'm not the CEO. There's three of us. Brian's the CEO. I'm chief strategy officer. Um, but it doesn't matter if people report to me or not. As co-founder, you have a certain kind of moral authority to lead um, and to explain, you know, the strategy of the company and, you know, share a vision for how a team can take something uh, and, and, and make it a reality. So um, going back to the question about the wild card, it's, it's, it's basically my philosophy of, 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 you know, always trying to make myself available for the next challenge and having jumped into a lot of different areas, um, which I think as a company at scale is, is, is really valuable. Jesus, I think we would love to have a wild card at Visionaries, but Nate, thank you so much for joining us, making it all the way to London. It was amazing speaking to you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks. That was great. Cheers. What? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that was actually 
seven hours, <laughs> 40 speakers, I just tried to come up with a summary and I miserably failed <laughs> because we had founders, unicorn founders who started their companies in defense, in climate, in travel. Uh, we had lots of our visionaries portfolio founders. We had nuclear fusion, uh, you name it, Chemin with beauty and skincare. So it's, we hope we gave you a, well, a, a, an approximation of what Visionaries is all about. And um, yeah, we actually, we, we've officially come to the end of those seven hours. Not yet. The next 10 hours are a very nice party that will now start soon. <laughs> actually, a very good that point. That was only the warm up I, now. Trust me, I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have uh, forgotten about it. <laughs> Before we do that, uh, I actually, uh, do we have a clicker here? Yes, we do. Um, I actually wanted to get two people here on stage, Lisa, Laura. Um, so I, I, I did say earlier uh, that we're not an event agency, and I, I stick to that. But I think if there are two people um, who could easily open up an event agency, then it's two wild the, cats. <laughs> it's these two, and uh, I hope all of you will join me in a huge round of applause for these two here. Thank you so much. This was massive. Yeah. So. Uh, the two of them leading the team, um, you know, everybody will also come on stage in a, in a minute. So working tirelessly over the last months and especially today, the past days, whenever, it was just incredible what the two of you have led here and what you have achieved. And we are super, super grateful for your lead in, in organizing this. So. Yeah, big, uh, uh, big, big thank you, which also goes to the entire team. So please, everybody <laughs> come on stage and big round of applause for the Visionaries team. <laughs> everybody helping. <laughs> you also didn't realize we also recorded podcasts at the same time on the rooftop in pouring rain. We had, well, we, we tried to stop you a little bit from networking over there because it was just very loud. At some point we said, screw it, it doesn't matter. Let them do what they want to do. So, guys, yeah, everybody, thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, now, next up, what uh, Rob said is actually the party. So we are, we have to completely re rebuild this place. So wherever you're sitting now, very comfortably, you can't continue sitting there. So what you can do instead is is grab more of those drinks, but you would have to. I d I go to the I back. Can every, and can you can hang out in the us? back no. or you can go into the crypt. Yeah. So we'll just need to rebuild this area and in 50 minutes we'll start rock and roll and have an amazing evening with you guys. Hopefully you will join us for many more great conversations and the one or the other drink. Thank you so much. Thank you.